Welcome to Track Blue. We're Blue Track. We're not Track 2. We're Blue Track today. Uh, pumped to have everybody here. I am super excited for round two of the Benzinga Cannabis Capital Conference of 2021. Uh, as you saw, round two out of three rounds this year is our last virtual round. So excited to get back to in-person, see our presenters, our panelists, our keynotes in person, uh, get this ball rolling again. Uh, first and foremost, I want to say thank you to the Benzinga team, uh, Nicole, Aaron, Chelsea, Kelsey, Sarah, uh, anybody else I'm missing. Uh, you, we always miss people, but this would not happen without them. So first and foremost, I need to start off with a thank you there. Uh, but we also want to thank you all. For tuning in, Jared, VJ, uh, Anna, James, Donkey Limit, uh, everybody uh, on our networking platform, thank you. Uh, I am here as a facilitator uh, to, to make help you have a conversation with these uh, executives today. So please, throughout the day, drop your questions. Help me out. Uh, I have questions prepared, but I want you all uh, to be the ones asking questions uh, for these companies. Uh, first up, we're starting off with a powerhouse. We'll get him up here shortly. But I do want to mention, uh, we wouldn't be Benzinga if we weren't uh, offering some giveaways, some prizes, uh, you know, to make sure that you guys are getting uh, tons of value out of this uh, in one way or another. So throughout the day, uh, we're going to be giving away lifetime subscriptions to uh, Benzinga's options newsletter, uh, Benzinga breakout newsletter, and a lifetime subscription to Benzinga Pro. Now, how do you do that? By participating in our Slido poll. Slido, fantastic name. Uh, but please, please uh, take your phones out. Take a picture, get that. If you guys don't know how to do QR codes by now, you just take your camera, you hover over it. Uh, there should be a little thing that pops up at the top. You push that link uh, and it should take you to Slido. We're gonna have questions and, and uh, throughout the day, uh, we're gonna be doing these so that you guys can participate in this event. Uh, it will be fun. And the person who participates most uh, will be getting uh, one of the prizes. So super excited about that. Uh, again, take a picture of this uh, QR code. Take a picture. Okay, perfect. All right, so I had to speed through that, y'all. Uh, but again, we have an incredible agenda. We're going to be talking about consolidation. Uh, we're going to be talking about international legalization and expansion. Capital is flowing into the space. We're going to have education from retail investor, uh, leading retail investors like John Ajarian and Tim Seymour. Uh, we're going to have Jason Wild and Chris Weber. Uh, we are going to have Sundial, Curaleaf, um, Charlotte's Web, Lowell Farms, 22nd Century. Uh, we're going to be talking about all of these companies that you all can get your value in. Uh, so this is a full day of education. Uh, full day of presentations. With that, I tried to get through everything. I probably missed something, but I'll be here throughout the day. Ask questions. Let me know what's up, uh, and we'll we will keep going here. Uh, perfect. <sighs> All right. First and foremost on the day, we are bringing on I think one of the more exciting companies, Lowell Farms, uh, Lowell Herb Company, formerly, um, but now chairman of the board of Lowell Farms, George Allen. You know him, you love him. He is an OG <laughs> in this industry. George, you've been around forever, man, longer than me. How are you doing? <laughs> hey, good morning. Thanks for having me out. I'm super grateful to be here. This is fantastic. And hey, uh, I, have to say, I can't wait to, to do this in person. I think the, I think we're all kind of done with virtual investor conferences and uh, it's, yeah. it's, always a, it's always great to be able to talk to our investors, but better yet, face to face. Absolutely. Very excited to facilitate that October 13th and 14th. We'll see you there, George. With that, my friend, I'm going to get out of the way and let you start us off. Great. Well, good morning. Uh, as Elliot told you, my name is uh, George Allen. I'm the chairman of Lowell Farms. And I'm grateful to spend time with you today. Benzinga has been a fantastic platform for quite some time. I really want uh, to do something different today. Uh, and I want to talk about something that it's unlikely you're going to hear uh, anywhere else at the conference today. Um, now, I think it's important to note that before I get into this, uh, in, our investor materials are located on our website, as well as links to both our financial disclosures on CDAR, as well as the SEC. So if you're interested in, in making an investment decision, please do so in the fulsome knowledge 
of our entire disclosure and consult all those materials. But what I wanted to do today was specifically talk um, a little bit about where I see the industry going, because I think that it's important to understand the context for where we believe as a team this industry is heading to understand the decisions that we're making, because you'll see that it's a little bit different than what I believe the vast majority of the industry is focused on right now. So before I get into it, there's a little bit of a company snapshot. Uh, we're, we're based in California, got about $300 million market cap, $275 million enterprise value focused explicitly in California. The company today, Indus, is, uh, is the result of a merger between Indus and Lowell Herb Co. We renamed the combined company Lowell Farms. So uh, let's do this. So this is where I want to spend most of the time today, uh, and then, I'll, and then I'll, I'll finish up by talking about a couple of the highlights of the business. But I think it's really important to understand contextually why we're building what we're building and why we're headed where we're headed. So let's start, um, let's, let's start with this. Now, I want to be clear. This is not an outcome that we are in any way advocating for. We're not spending a single dollar on the federal or state level for lobbying any of these outcomes that I'm talking about. This is simply the natural gravitational pull of where we see the industry headed. It's not for us to determine the future of this industry. It's for the it's for policymakers and for consumers to make that decision. But I do believe the table is set for some real secular changes in, in the industry. The second thing I wanna talk about before I jump right into this is a little bit about where I've come from. So I'm not from California. Uh, I, did, I wasn't a, an original grower in California, growing in my closet and decided to make a, a business out of it. As a matter of fact, my background was before this, I ran one of the largest MSOs in the country, Acreage Holdings. And the day that we signed up uh, the sale of that business to Canopy Growth, I left and I left with a small team really focused on uh, executing a plan that's consistent with the future that we saw in cannabis. And that's what I'm about to share with you. So I think we all know where we're starting from today. One third of the USA has recreational weed, two thirds has access to medical weed. And we hear estimates about the size of the black market. It still accounts for 80% plus of sales. Now that looks like big, giant blue sky for all of us to go and chase and grab, right? You have this massive amount of latent demand out there that we, along with everybody else presenting today, is talking about how they're going to go grab that, that demand. I think we're on the dawn of decriminalization in this country, right? We've seen the MORE Act get introduced for the second time in, in, into Congress, and I think we've got a decent shot here, right? So what does that mean? Well, it means that we remove, the way the MORE Act is written right now is that we're going to remove uh, cannabis from the Controlled Substances Act. That's going to take it off of the scheduling. Uh, it's also going to advocate for expungement, right? The elimination of any criminal background and history associated with cannabis crimes. It's also going to impose a federal taxation regime, which is critical. I think it starts out at, at 3% and goes to 5%. But that is just the beginning of what I believe is, a, is the tax narrative in this industry. What's a bit unknown right now is where the FDA comes out on cannabis, right? We saw what they did in hemp, and I think there's a fair amount of anxiety and anticipation around how does the FDA decide to get involved in cannabis. I think there's some thought that the, that the industry gets to a size where it is so large that the FDA has no choice but to, to, to let the industry go on its own course and speed. We'll find out. I honestly think uh, nobody really knows what the FDA's plans are with cannabis. But I think that enters us into a phase where cannabis is good, right? Cannabis, we're undoing 84 years of terrible policy in this industry, right? It's time to right the wrongs and to make some money in the interim. So cannabis is great. I think most of we're going to see a fair amount of marketing coming at us, talking about the medical benefits of cannabis. You can get a ton of sleep. Uh, it's, it's certainly uh, an alternative treatment. Uh, for mental health issues, which we're definitely going through a nationwide crisis right now. So there's a fair amount of good that's going to come from this. And, and we're embracing cannabis and undoing 
terrible, terrible policy that had really disproportionate harm on a lot of Americans. But I think there's a fly in the ointment here. I think that the black market evolves into what is actually going to become the gray market, right? And the gray market is going to thrive. Unfortunately, I think the expectation is the gray market is going to be all but eliminated by cannabis, right? But I think there's some reasons that the gray market is going to thrive. Now, most of that comes down to price and quality arbitrage. Now, economists will tell you that a price difference between two different markets uh, is really only sustainable to the extent that that price difference is equal to the cost of collapsing that arbitrage, of transporting the good from one market to another. Now, what you have in cannabis is a product that is very readily transportable. And in a matter of fact, the Moore Act specifically removes cannabis from the Controlled Substances Act, which means that unless that Moore Act gets altered, the way it's currently written, it appears as though there's no federal prohibition from using the U.S. mail service. Now, they may clean that up in code, and it very well may end up being illegal to use the federal mail service. But the reality is, I believe that there will be zero appetite anywhere in this country for enforcement. After all, how did we get here? We got here by unwinding years of terrible policy. So I think what you're going to see is a transition from the black market today, which is box trucks filled with cannabis moving from one market to another and using runners over Craigslist. It's going to migrate to a totally different model. It's going to migrate to uh, people shipping goods across the country in FedEx packages and boxes because it's there's no appetite and simply no regime for enforcement there. So the cost of collapsing that arbitrage goes down. So what happens there? The gray market thrives. Well, I think what's going to happen is the MSOs, rightly so, are going to beg for relief. They're going to say, we built all this infrastructure and yet you're allowing others to compete with us who aren't playing by the rules. That's not fair. The states are going to say, wait a minute, you want us to throw people in jail again? I thought we all decided that was not cool. So they're really going to be in a tough position in order, in, in order to make the MSOs happy. The states have no great outcome, no great options as to what to do next. But as far as I can tell, the only great outcome that they have is the uh, allowing the, the localized operators to source products from other markets, right? Because as long as that product is sold at retail, the states can collect revenues. So that's going to be their answer. Their answer is going to say, wait a minute, you, you in New Hampshire or Vermont, you can go source product from California or Colorado, however you want to go get it. But as long as it's sold at retail and we get the tax revenues, the problem is that's not going to work. The gray market is still going to thrive. And the reason it's going to thrive is because there's big tax arbitrages that still exist. Taxes are crazy high in cannabis and there's no political appetite for any type of enforcement. This is where I think things start to get really interesting because Amazon or anybody like Amazon is going to step into the rescue. The challenge with cannabis is the only way to compete with the black market eventually is to eliminate the friction costs in the last mile, right? The black market has an expensive friction cost in the last mile. And if you can step in and, and cut down the, the markup in cannabis products for consumers, consumers will migrate. And we've seen Amazon do this, right? They did this exact same thing when it came to, to e-commerce sales tax. They were one of the first companies out there that said to all the states, we will collect your sales tax for you. So embrace e-commerce. And that worked. And by the way, I don't think we're the only ones who are planning for this future. If you look at the news headlines over the last 24 hours, I think it's really telling, right? Amazon has stopped testing for most employees. And then even more recently, Amazon has said that they are advocating to, to, to throw their weight behind the Moore Act. I think we just got to understand where is that all headed? This is the end game in cannabis. Now, it's how are we planning for this? I went to California where we have large systematic scale in our cannabis agriculture, as well as uh, a responsible way to grow uh, cannabis in terms of the environmental impact and the cost that it has on, on society, uh, as well as investing in brands, right? Lowell Brands, Lowell Flower is one of the 
the best brands in all of cannabis, the highest, the second highest social rec, uh, social media footprint out there behind uh, behind cookies. So it's one of the top brands in the space. That's where I believe the value in nurse to over, over time. I firmly believe that the value for last mile distribution is going to end up in a, in a dog fight between uh, e-commerce and, and retail. And so that's really the future that we're planning for uh, at Lowell Farms. The reason why we've all moved out uh, in, into this market and have set down roots here into what is the largest place to, 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 to grow uh, cannabis most effectively, efficiently, and the highest quality product in the country. So with that, I'm going to uh, just talk a little bit about uh, the new Lowell Farms and then open it up for, uh, for any questions if we have a couple minutes. So Lowell Farms today, uh, 225,000 square foot greenhouse. We're, we're initiate, we have an, a number of expansion projects uh, that we've talked about historically to increase our footprint there. Uh, more news on, on that to come. We have diversified manufacturing, large scale manufacturing, uh, preparing for, uh, for, for a nationwide brand distribution. And we have a, an unparalleled brand. We talk a lot about brands in cannabis. In our opinion, most brands in cannabis have very little loyalty factor, right? Very little customers, very few customers actually walk into a dispensary knowing what they want to buy. Low uh, survey after survey shows that that's the case with that brand. We also have a distribution infrastructure that allows us to efficiently and effectively distribute our product across the entire state of California today and hopefully nationwide in the future. So with that, so I'd love to open it up, uh, open it up to any questions. Yes. George, what a great start to the day, man. Like you, you, you give us some very interesting topics to, to kind of mull over here. Uh, maybe starting backwards. Um, I'd love your thoughts on the new Amazon announcement. Uh, you know, I saw a, a tweet from uh, Poseidon the other day saying, uh, you can't say you're the Amazon of cannabis anymore because <laughs> Amazon is. Yeah, so. that's a good point. And I, I, you know, I was inspired by this. To be honest with you, uh, I heard one of the podcasts from one of the large MSOs, and uh, and frankly, one of the large MSO CEOs was on a podcast and talking about how he he felt that the dominant players in cannabis today were sort of already uh, you know sort of already entrenched in, in the industry. And I thought to myself, I wonder if that's how Borders felt, or I wonder if that how Blockbuster felt, you know, b b before uh, before they were completely upended. And the reality is, I I don't think you can look at that Amazon announcement uh, as simply being, you know, I think as some have interpreted it as, you know, we're doing right by our employees, or Washington is is legal, so we're going to go with Washington because that's our home state. I don't think Amazon does a lot. Uh, I don't think they they open their mouths. Uh, in, in, unless they have an end state that's uh, that's in their um, economic benefit. Yeah, I'm, I'm imagining the executive change there probably uh, was a bit of, of spurning there. Uh, it seems uh, the decriminalization uh, is take is what could be taken pretty li literally. Uh, I would say from from your presentation there, you know, with the gray market and not enforcing it. Um, uh, that's super interesting to me and something honestly that I don't see anybody talking about. So. Uh, how does a company like Lowell Farms, um, you know, I, I mean, are, are you amongst those MSOs that, that kind of beg for it? Or are you able to take a different approach there? You know, I, to be honest, with you, we're, we're, we're sort of a passenger on the bus in terms of public policy. Uh, and, and I don't think, you know, I don't think trying to sway public policy for, for cannabis is something that we could be terribly affected by or would be a great resource, uh, you know, use of resources for shareholder capital. I would generally say that we saw this obviously when I was at Acreage and we had John Boehner on the board, I was privileged to a fair amount of conversations that were going on in Washington, D.C. And I, I see that that it, it is not as if tobacco, pharma and e-commerce are completely oblivious to what's going on, 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 on in cannabis. They're very much focused on it and they're very much focused on making sure that their lobbying dollars in Washington create an outcome that allows them to enter the space and enter it in a material way. And I think that's something we all got to be really cognizant of. The idea, no state, no single state in this country when they when they uh, at first issued medical licenses and then issued recreational licenses, issued them with any sort of promise, any sort of promise that they won't change policy down the road. We've seen Florida expand the number of licenses in that marketplace and then more recently expand the number 
of, of retail outlets that you can have in that marketplace. We've seen policy change time and time again in this industry, and there are big dollars at work trying to influence that policy. So I think the, the answer to this industry is you better become really good at one thing. You better become really good at one corner of this market, because if you don't, you're going to get subsumed. The idea that this industry is going to be a standalone industry without third party participation, I think, is a little bit fictional. I love that. Uh, you know, it kind of leads into the conversation around vertical integration. Uh, and the future of that in this industry, uh, especially once cross board, cross state lines comes into play. Uh, I did have one question for you. Uh, and I love your thoughts on consolidation, you know, specifically uh, in the California market and what we're seeing in some of these larger state markets and, um, you know, what you think we're going to see the rest of the year and how that affects you all go moving forward. Yeah, California is an easy place for MSOs to go for a consolidation. We've seen a fair amount of interest in last mile or retail. Uh, and I think that's an easy place because there's a lot of revenues uh, in, in retail and, and you can uh, there's a big roll up strategy to be had there. Obviously, I think you can understand my reluctance to dive headfirst into retail, given what I told you. But I will generally say I think I think we've seen a fair amount of MSO participation in California. Now, I think what what is tricky about this industry is you can get so large as an MSO where uh, your outcomes don't involve M&A anymore. And I think with the Harvest uh, truly deal, I think we've probably seen the large of the, the end of large scale uh, M&A in this space because uh, there's simply too much uh, regulatory overlap between these MSOs such that they can't, they can't get deeper in their markets by buying more players. And so what they're focused on is let's go to the markets where we can go buy revenues at lower multiples, go buy earnings at lower multiples, and we can do it on a, in, a, in a way where we're uncapped by uh, regulatory code. And that's what's really brought uh, California into the, into the mix. We saw, um, uh, we, we saw Cal Colorado uh, get, get in the mix with Cureleaf buying, uh, buying that large outdoor farm. So I think you, you're starting to see uh, consolidation come into play because you got to feed the beast here in terms of earnings growth uh, and, and, and how to outline your sort of future for, for companies. And I think there are a lot of there are a lot of companies out there that are that are striving to sort of be the top of that, uh, the, the top of that um, comp sheet. And the way that they do that is by issuing more shares to buy more growth and more scale. Obviously, we saw TrueLeaf do that. We've seen CureLeaf do that in the past. I see no end to that in the near future. Oh, uh, good news, I guess, for the investor audience watching today, especially on the retail side. Uh, but George, uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, website where we can reach you. I believe it's lowfarms.com. Wolfarms.com. We're on Instagram. We're on Twitter. We're pretty much uh, digitally available. So come find us. We'd love to tell you our story. We're happy to talk to investors directly. Uh, we're super excited to, uh, to, 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 to outline our vision of the future for anybody who wants to hear. Thank you so much, George. As a side note, I love the, uh, the wooden box you guys have on your apparel accessory site. Uh, I was looking through your site. It was like a wooden pre-roll smoke box or whatnot. I, I was like, that's cool. You know, what, what I will say, I'll just, what makes a little different is they, um, what makes a little different is they were the first, I believe, to understand that it, in order for cannabis to come out of hiding, it has to be cool. And, mm -hmm. uh, and Lowell's one of those, it's, it's not about, uh, the, the medical aspects. A lot of people doing that, uh, Lowell's about making, uh, cannabis cool again. I love that, my friend. George, thank you again so much for being here. We'll talk to you again, October 13th and 14th live, uh, ideally, but until then, best of luck. Keep I can't updated. wait to be there. I can't wait to be there. Thanks so much Me for too, having me. Talk bye to bye. you soon, George. Awesome. That was Lowell Farms, O-T-C-L-O-W-L-F, starting off the day with an awesome uh, kind of dive into potential legalization and what that means. Uh, it's not all uh, candy and roses and flowers. and uh, There's a lot that goes into that conversation. So I appreciate George uh, diving into that for us. We are moving straight into another awesome stock. Another awesome company. You guys know them. 22nd Century. They are XXII. And we have Jim Mish, CEO of 22nd Century here with us. How are you? Good morning, Elliot. How are you doing? I'm fine. Fantastic. Fantastic. It's a fun day already. Uh, we're starting off with, honestly, a, a fun lineup. You are kind of a change of pace here, though. So I'm very excited to hear 
what is going on? I think this is your first time. So I think uh, at a Benzinga conference, at least in a while. So uh, I'm going to let you get to it and tell us our audience what's going on. Yeah, thank you very much. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, on the phone with me is uh, May Quo, our IR lead. So when I ask May to uh, change my slides moving forward, uh, you'll know who I'm uh, talking to. But I'm also glad I got a chance to uh, listen into George's uh, presentation as well. Really exciting stuff and tough, you know, tough act to follow. Uh, you know, we are not as well the Amazon of cannabis. Uh, we are the intel inside of cannabis is the best way to, to think of us. And uh, it's my real pleasure to kind of give the audience a sense of who we are, because uh, we do cut across multiple uh, markets, uh, certainly including hemp cannabis, which is one of our primary focuses. Uh, so if May, if you could just put up uh, our first slide, uh, I would appreciate it. So at our core, as I said, think of us as the intel inside of, of cannabis. Uh, we are a disruptive plant-based biotechnology company. Uh, that happens to focus across really three plant lines, all of which are in the alkaloid-based uh, family. They have high levels of efficacious activity uh, across the board. So our first plant franchise was tobacco, and we'll talk more about that, but we have a, uh, a low nicotine strain of tobacco that uh, has been coming through the um, works for years and is destined for the uh, uh, harm reduction cigarette market. That's really the foundation of the company. A few years back, however, the company expanded into the hemp cannabis uh, area, also a, an alkaloid based uh, plant. And everyone on the uh, call here uh, certainly knows the upside opportunities around uh, hemp cannabis. And also we're starting work and advancing both on a scientific basis an IP basis and strategic partnership basis on what we call it a third franchise. We haven't named it yet, but we have alluded to the fact that it is an alkaloid-based plant uh, within the cannabis family and uh, serving a high-end uh, use market. The size of the prize for us across these three franchises and being able to bring what we think are truly disruptive plant uh, to, uh, to bear is over $1.3 trillion across these three end-use markets. And we cut across things we can serve as pharmaceutical, consumer, even in the uh, cigarette market, I'll talk to you more about, but very high growth, very exciting opportunities across a uh, diverse, uh, diverse platform. Uh, we have very deep uh, moat around our IP, uh, certainly within the uh, tobacco franchise, we own the IP on this low nicotine uh, variant, and we've got additional strains that we're growing as we speak uh, for blending operations into what we call a second generation uh, low nicotine uh, cigarette. Uh, but also we have foundational IP in cannabis uh, that we uh, share with Aurora uh, on biosynthetics. We focus that biosynthetic IP primarily within the plant, but also on a pure uh, biosynthetic play, but very deep moat. And we believe that is the keystone of next generation uh, biosynthetic uh, cannabinoids. And we uh, enjoy that strong partnership uh, with Aurora. Our business model typically is to develop the uh, diverse plant strain, bring it to full commercialization and license that to uh, strategic partners who have the channel to market infrastructure to launch it. Uh, and then we are also always looking for the, the disruptive note in our strains is always based around the consumer experience. We wanna make the consumer experience, whether it's recreational, whether it's consumer uh, based across these franchises, uh, the ultimate experience. And we play from a, uh, a strong financial position, very strong balance sheet, uh, and uh, plenty of cash to move forward with our organic uh, plans across these three franchises. Next slide, May, please. So this is just a little bit more detail. I won't go into this in much. Uh, it will, uh, this will be on our website, uh, xxiicentury.com. But it just gives a bit more explanation around these three uh, franchises and most importantly, the three uh, end use markets that it serves. High growth, global scale, and really ripe for the ability to bring uh, higher quality, truly disruptive plants to bear. Next slide, please. So we have very uh, keen areas of focus. Uh, number one is to bring forward what we call a modified risk tobacco product authorization from the FDA and our tobacco franchise. 
Uh, for those of you who are not familiar uh, with XII, our primary mission is to bring a product forward that would reduce the harm caused by nicotine-based cigarettes. Our cigarette uh, brand in the well, in the wings at the moment, VLN, uh, is a low nicotine cigarette that is uh, categorized uh, within the FDA guidelines as minimal or non-addictive uh, in nature. Uh, so the, uh, the flavor profile is uh, very solid. The consumer information is very solid. We have the authorization from FDA by a PMTA to actually sell this product. What we're waiting for, and we believe we're in the final stage, and I'm highly confident of the, that nature, is the, the allowance of a marketing claim to say that it is 95% uh, less nicotine. That's the only authorization we're waiting for. As I said, uh, I'm absolutely confident we're in the final stage of that. And uh, once we get that, we're prepared to launch that product uh, within 90 days. And I'll talk a bit more about that uh, in a high level here in a few minutes. Secondarily to that, but as uh, very important for the long term of the, the company and the, uh, and the consumer health, uh, is around the possibility of a uh, nicotine mandate coming forward in the United States. Uh, that nicotine mandate would uh, force uh, ultimately the uh, levels of nicotine in all cigarettes to be minimally or non-addictive. And that is already achieved by our, uh, our product and by our uh, low nicotine uh, tobacco technology. So we're doing everything we can to support that, not only onshore, but in countries like New Zealand, uh, and a lot of the former British colonies typically follow suit, Australia, Canada, ultimately the U.S. And that is moving along on the Biden administration agenda uh, very quickly. So we have a very high confidence level that a, the progress towards a nicotine mandate is in place. These are very catalytic events for us. Certainly the MRTP authorization we view as a home run opportunity uh, to get our brand out there. And the nicotine mandate and even progress towards that over a period of years is really a grand slam for us. But in regards to uh, this conference and uh, more on the hemp cannabis side, uh, we really are progressing very nicely. We have assembled, and I will show you a, uh, a network of uh, strategic partnerships to be able to bring truly disruptive plant strains uh, from concept to true commercialization within a two year time period. And our first focus is to take the first generation of these plants, roughly uh, three or four of them, and begin <clears throat> monetizing them through licensing agreements and also through a grow that we're currently uh, participating in in our farm in uh, Colorado, uh, which we will be harvesting in the October, late October, early November timeframe. Again, I'll talk more about that uh, in, the, uh, in the near future. Um, but we also have a very rich portfolio and uh, development pipeline of additional strains coming through uh, with partnerships that I'll get into on the genetic side, on the plant profiling side, and also on the breeding and cultivation side. We stay on the more or less the ingredients side of the bright line and seek partnerships, strategic partnerships with those who are selling formulated products in a variety of industries, including recreational consumer products, et cetera. Uh, but that's one of our primary, third primary focus. Uh, the fourth is to further along this third franchise. As I alluded to, we have uh, uh, the IP buttoned up. We have strategic partnerships being lined up. The only thing we have not done is announce the, the exact franchise. We're reserving that until right after our MRPT, uh, MRTP authorization, and uh, we'll move on from there. And financially, we're very sound. Next slide, Mike. So in tobacco, uh, as I alluded to, uh, VLN is the uh, brand of cigarettes that we are prepared to launch within 90 days of this MRTP authorization. It's an exciting, disruptive product for the entire marketplace. It will be the first and likely only FDA authorized uh, cigarette that would have a harm reduction claim on it, namely that it is 95% less nicotine, that it allows uh, less exposure to nicotine. Uh, we have all of the clinical data that has been run by groups like FDA, like NIH, uh, point to the uh, success factors of uh, reduced harm via the reduced exposure to nicotine. Our own consumer studies show a very strong uptake uh, in this product line. And our entire supply chain, including the grow of the tobacco 
and manufacture of the cigarettes within our uh, North Carolina facility is all in place, ready to go. We're simply uh, waiting for the final FDA authorization, which I've said many times publicly, uh, I am absolutely confident in, and it's just a matter of the uh, FDA working through their, through their final stage of their uh, process. So we're very excited about this. This is a catalytic event for the, uh, for the company. Next slide, please. As I said, it's in the final stages of review. Uh, they have already authorized us to sell the product, but it would be like putting a product out there, a, a diet soda, without being able to say the word diet on the, uh, on the can. So it's very important to us, uh, and we have been working very collaboratively with FDA to get this uh, finalized. And as I said before, once this uh, authorization does occur, we will be on market, in market with uh, well-recognized uh, retail ch channel partners within 90 days. Next slide, Mike. And next slide, May. This is a little bit more about the manufacturing, but I'll, I'll pass through this. As I said, there's, uh, there's a lot of tailwinds for us uh, these days within the federal uh, policy positions. Uh, certainly, the FDA and the, uh, the, the new lead of the HHS and the entire Biden administration from a cancer perspective are tailwinds and reduced harm from cigarette smoking. That only drives our MRTP uh, faster uh, to, the, uh, to the marketplace but also then reinforces it via a broader uh, nicotine mandate, uh, just like they are moving, the FDA is moving forward on the menthol mandate. So we'll see, uh, we fully anticipate seeing that coming along uh, within the next few months with regards to a, a nicotine uh, mandate. And that takes steps. It's a, you know, it's a, a revised rulemaking approach that'll take uh, time to implement, but certainly we do expect it to go strongly in that direction. Next slide. So let's turn our attention to hemp cannabis. So as I said before, one of the solutions that we're trying to bring forward to what we believe is a, a problem within the entire industry as it expands and grows is the ability to optimize the plant at the genetic level, but through non-GMO based methodology in order to optimize it to grow uh, in many different ways and modulate in many different ways. Modulate the levels of cannabinoids in total, modulate certain cannabinoids, certain terpenes, certain flavonoids, and most importantly, optimize yield. Uh, as the current generation plants are grown and they get larger and larger in scale, the quality becomes an issue. They've never been optimized at the genetic uh, level. We believe with our uh, original IP, the biosynthetic IP, and how we uh, utilize it with our partnerships at uh, Key Gene in particular, uh, we have the ability to bring these disruptive plant strains that are highly advantageous to our strategic partners from a yield and, and cost basis, but even more so in, uh, critical to the consumer experience and an increase in the consumer experience from a quality basis as well. So imagine being able to produce artisanal type of uh, recreational uh, marijuana or hemp cannabis, but at the largest scale required as the markets expand in the US and Canada and certainly offshore. That's how we fit into the uh, mix. Next slide, please. So this is our development pipeline. We start with a concept and we really end in a two year cycle from concept to full commercialization. We start by working with our strategic partners or understanding the market to determine what a consumer perceived benefit looks like. Do we want higher levels of THC? Do we want the consumer to experience a more impactful recreational uh, experience? Or on the consumer product side as it expands in the food, beverage, and nutritional supplements, or on the medical OTC side, what is the, you know, what is the desired effect? With our exclusive relationship at Canometrics and a human cell assay array that we utilize, very scientific approach, we can profile what that plant should look like. And we can profile even to the point of uh, personalized um, uh, identification on an individual basis, what that individual may, may be more receptive to. That's the beauty of Canometrics. It basically gives us a roadmap as far as what the plant strain should look like on an optimum basis. We then work that with our strategic partnership at Key Gene to develop the plant strain at, uh, at a very small level, seed level and seedling level, clone level. Move that into our breeding partners that we'll be announcing uh, very shortly that are alkaloid based uh, specialists in the Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere. And then bring that through plant cultivation, not only on our own farm in Colorado, 
but through a, a network of farms. We're also partnered with a group in Colorado Panacea, have excellent finished product goods in their own right. Uh, we focus our partnership with, with them in the upstream uh, value chain. But as things are moving along here, we've got uh, the first generation of plants that are moving through this pipeline. In fact, we're growing, uh, amongst other things, a high CBG strain, very high CBG strain. In the Colorado farm, there was one of the first um, uh, proof of concept plants. And then we've got a wide variety, over 8,000 genomes of, of strains that we uh, own IP around and partnership with KeyGene to bring through in many different ways. Uh, and this is all based on the core biosynthetic IP uh, that uh, we utilize uh, in plant, in the plant itself with our partnership with KeyGene. It's unique to the approach versus standard plant breeding. It's unique to the biosynthetic, pure biosynthetic approach, or even the synthetic approach. And what it allows for is truly disruptive plants that could create an Intel inside approach within a two year period versus seven to perhaps longer than 10 years in most cases. May please. So this is uh, part of our monetization and we've been public with this. Within the, uh, the second half of this year, sometime in Q3 or Q4, we expect the first uh, revenue and profit streams coming in from licensing revenue on the original uh, IP and the first strains of uh, uh, plants coming out of that. And then on top of that, we have multiple other licensing opportunities that will build off of that as we get into Q4 and into Q1. And also we'll be harvesting our first uh, grow of both CBD and high CBG strain out of Colorado. We've already got uh, offtake commitments for that, um, for that biomass. We could also supply it then as a distillate or an isolate. That's at the end of our uh, value chain. Or at the, you know, the other component of our business model is to license out that technology uh, in a full dossier. Next about, slide. About two minutes left here, Jim, if you want to get to some questions or uh, just keep going, up to you. No, I, I'd rather turn, it was actually the last slide, so uh, perfect timing, uh, Elliot, and sorry to run a little bit over, but I uh, no want to give everyone a good sense. But yeah, let's take some questions. I always like that much better. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jim, I mean, <laughs> you are a complete change of pace, uh, and I, I love what you all are doing. So it seems to me with VLN, uh, might be good to, to maybe put you on your watch list now, uh, you know, as the FDA clears that up for approval. Uh, I do have something that's come up in the chat quite a bit if you could address, and I think I did see this uh, before this event as well, um, talking about the Monsanto, uh, are, are you similar to that, or how would you uh, respond to something like this? Yeah, we, we view ourselves as, uh, as the Monsanto uh, across these particular franchises, these three plants only. Monsanto has a very scientific and method methodical approach. They go broad, you know, broad across many plants, mostly in the commoditized, uh, you know, soy, corn, et cetera. Uh, but we focus on these three plants and these three plants only, and we apply their approach. But what's an important distinction, and, you know, and, and I hold Monsanto in high regard, but we are uh, driven by a non-GMO approach. Uh, we can do either. And in some cases, uh, you know, that technology still exists, but we focus on a non-GMO approach across these three plant lines, but, it, but come at it from a very scientific basis, just like Monsanto. Fantastic. I'd love your thoughts. We have about one minute left, uh, but something I'm curious, how does uh, the entrance of tobacco into cannabis, like we've seen over the past couple of years with uh, BAT, and uh, I think a couple others are making massive investments into leading companies like Organogram. Mm -hmm. Does that affect you all? Uh, is that positive for you all? I'm curious. Yeah, it's very synergistic. I mean, again, we the, the combination ultimately of the tobacco industry and the cannabis industry is, is, a, is natural, uh, mm -hmm. just a natural evolution. Uh, so it doesn't surprise us there. Also, the beverage industry, there's a lot of connecting to the, the beverage industry. But the, the synergies between tobacco and, and cannabis, both on the recreational side and on the consumer side, is it's very natural. It's very synergistic for us because obviously we cut across both uh, franchises and we can bring this disruptive technology across both. Uh, and in the case of VLN, uh, you know, putting out the, the brand, the, the brand itself. Perfect. Jim, it's been a pleasure having you here. Really appreciate you running through this. Looks like good news is on the horizon. Uh, yeah. So everybody, NICE, American listed XXII uh, website, XXIICentury.com. Uh, Jim, thank you so much again for being here today. Uh, and please uh, update us again soon. We look forward to hearing from you guys uh, very soon.
My pleasure. Thank you all. Awesome. Thanks again, Jim. All right, y'all. Uh, we are moving right along. We have a quick uh, commercial for you, and then we're off to Hemp Fusion. Very exciting. All right, Aaron, hit it. Welcome to the Benzinga Cannabis Hour. There are more people who are in favor of legalization. I saw the benefits of it for myself. have to ask was there pot pasta in the cannabis cookbook oh, it was gorgeous there was pot pasta they were we were talking about cannabis pasta that opened my eyes to the cannabis industry is this new industry where now billions of dollars are being made we're here to bring cannabis into culture It has already been a super exciting morning. We are just getting started though. Uh, this event is jam packed. So I wanna keep us moving along with probably one of the most globally recognized CBD brands out there. Uh, if you know cannabis, if you are in uh, the hemp space at all, you know Hemp Fusion. They are publicly listed, uh, CBDHF uh, on the OTC. So we'll get that ticker up there, but they are a leader in the space. So I'm super excited to welcome Dr. Jason Mitchell, the CEO of uh, Hemp Fusion. Jason, how are you, sir? A man with the best accent while in the industry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Elliot. I appreciate it. No, doing well. We've stayed busy to say the least. <laughs> oh, that I can tell. We got some news to cover. I'm sure you're going to touch on it, but I got some questions for you as well. With that being said, sir, I'd love to turn it over to you. Please take us away, my friend. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Elliot. So as Elliot mentioned, yeah, um, Hempfusion Wellness Inc. is our company, and we're a very unique company in that if this is the first time you're hearing anything about our company, we are very distinctly different in, the, in our product offerings. We don't just offer um, hemp-derived CBD products. We actually have an entire line of products called Probulin Probiotics for digestive health. And so very uniquely diversified. Um, Probulin was started in 2013, Hemp Fusion in 2015, and merged together in 2019. And we've been off to the races since. Um, so very excited to share some updates um, off of previous converse, or previous presentations that we've done here at Benzinga, just to kind of give you an understanding of where we've been, where we're heading, and what we've done to get there. And very excited to share. So this is just our highlights page. And you know, we've always been a company since the very beginning driven by compliance. And this has a lot to do with the fact that anytime you have something that was regulated or a, a product that was on a controlled substances act or had issues with a governmental regulation standpoint, you must first start with compliance because dealing with the, the FDA and governmental agencies is very, very important to me under through. And if you're not prepared for doing that or don't have the stomach for it, it can be very difficult later on in the game. And so we've always been driven from a, a very strong base of compliance. We've created an amazing proprietary um, product portfolio that includes not only products that contain CBD, but also our Probulin line of products for probiotics that actually have a unique and exclusive delivery system. We are intently focused on research and also the development in and around unique elements related to research. And I'll share a little bit more about that. Now, as a company, we set up very strategically multiple revenue drivers, some of which I'll give you some strong updates today that I think you'll be very um, impressed by, or at least the work that's gone into this has been very, very importantly orchestrated over the course of the last several years, some of which are just coming um, to fruition this past month. So excited to share more details. Now our C-suite continues to grow in the sense of the individuals, the talent that we've been able to pull together as a team. And so very excited with the team that we're carrying forward and the execution plan, or I should say the revenue funnel that we've been working on since the beginning of 2020 is starting to bear fruit in a major way this year. Our focus on international expansion um, should not catch anybody by surprise because CBD isn't just a US product or a North American product. It is one of a great interest uh, across the globe. And so very happy, happy to share some of the unique and exclusive ways we're expanding internationally. Now, as we've mentioned before, we did have a successful IPO um, on January 6th this year. And as of March 31st, 2021, our cash position was over 17 million. And we feel very, very optimistic about the actions we've taken over the last several months and the direction we're heading now. Now, just to give you an update on regulatory compliance, I know that many of you have heard our story and those of you that haven't, we have focused 
um, heavily on compliance, spending millions of dollars and years developing a second to no one regulatory portfolio. And this is important because it's not only North American governmental agency regulations to contend with, it's globally. And so one of the first things that we've done um, was making sure that all of the hemp that we use is USDA certified organic. We're also an active executive board member contributor to the U.S. Hemp Roundtable. In fact, our chief marketing officer, Ola Lassard, is, is, is the president of the U.S. Hemp Roundtable. Not only is she the first female president, she's also the first two-term president. And she's making such a great impact leading that organization along with Jonathan Miller and the rest of the executive board and team. Now, I've mentioned before that we were moving towards our self grass affirmation. I'm happy to report that we have already sent to publishing our Noel manuscript. That means no observed adverse effect level toxicology um, report and review. Now, this is the last step before announcing self grass So can't wait to share the details once finally published and peer reviewed and be able to announce officially that we are self grass We will officially be only one of three companies that have done everything, including their own toxicology studies, to verify self grass Exciting also, we announced in, in February that we had officially filed our novel food ingredient application with the FSA, the Food Standards Agency in the UK. Well, I'm also proud to mention that with EFSA, within the EU, we have also filed, filed our novel food application. Excited to once be able to report soon our application being validated in the UK, as well as our products being in, you know, importantly added to the public products list here in the near future. So we're very excited about the progress we're making in Europe because these regulations and being able to comply with these things require years of toxicology studies and data to be able to be what is considered a quality application for such a time. And even though you might submit an application it does not mean that it will actually be approved unless it is a very strong application that includes all of the data. And we're proud to say that we have a complete application that was submitted to the novel food, uh, our novel food application that was submitted to EFSA and also FSA in the UK. One thing that's also really important is that looking at industry standards, looking at Charlotte's Web, CV Science and CVDMD, three amazing companies in their own right that have done tremendous job on so many different fronts, and in fact are larger than us as an organization, being that we are still in what I would call an early stage revenue generation company. But if you were to compare our preparedness for the future, the things that are forthcoming with regards to the FDA and with Congress, you will find that we are the most prepared company, or at least in our opinion, we're the most prepared company for any regulations that are put on the industry as it relates to products that contain CBD. Now, what I'll also share is some of the two of the most important things to understand about what's happening in North America, specifically in the US, is that right now sitting in front of Congress, submitted in February of this year, was HR, which is a House of Representatives bill, HR 841, which under this bill, should it pass, will actually have CBD added to the definition, dietary supplements for the Food and Drug Cosmetic Act. Now, that's a really important piece of legislation that if it passes, it basically lays the regulatory framework and path forward for products that contain CBD in the U.S. And I would venture a guess just by history that a great deal, a, a great number of countries will follow suit with similar regulations of which we are already prepared for, which is awesome. The interesting thing about HR 841 is it has bipartisan support, meaning it has support both on the Democrat side by 16 co-sponsors and on the Republican side by 10 co-sponsors. Any bill put forward that has this much unified consensus of support has very little chance of not passing, at least in some form that would allow a regulatory path forward. And so we feel very, very encouraged. Now, recently, just in the last couple of weeks, Senator Wyden from Oregon introduced a bill called Senate Bill 1698. Now, this one also aims at adding CBD to the definition of dietary supplements, but he also wanted to include in his bill those things related to food and beverage. Now, while a tad more challenging for the FDA still has a tremendous amount of congressional support, I have every belief that one of these bills or potentially even both um, have a very great chance of pass passing. And many ask the question, I really truly believe it's just in the months ahead that we actually are going to see this. And I, I most certainly feel in my heart that it's gonna happen this year. Now, what is important to mention, if one of these bills passes and adds CBD to the definition of dietary supplement, it is not a framework that just simply allows any company to, um, to sell dietary supplements that contain CBD. There are requirements. You will have to have one of three things be true should this be the case, because it is the Food and Drug Cosmetic Act that will then fully be empowered to regulate CBD. One is you'll have to prove that it's been in the food supply in the exact form you use, which honestly is a bit of elusive unicorn. I don't think that's going to be very easily accepted by the FDA. However, there are two other opportunities. 
Number two, have the ability to complete your self-grass affirmation, which means generally recognized as safe, which includes all toxicology studies and supporting documentation with publishing. And that is more focused on adding hemp or CBD as a food additive to a dietary supplement or food or beverage. And that covers off the food side of things. Now, as it relates to dietary supplements, there is a third path, and that is the NDIN. That is the new dietary ingredient notification path. This is a bit more difficult and more stringent and requires that you also have all of these toxicology studies and things completed, which, as I mentioned before, we're one of only just a select few companies that have even done such work to be able to be ready for such a time as this. Now, I will tell you, we have already authored our NDIN and are ready to submit on a day's notice. We have already completed everything necessary. And as I mentioned, submitted to the publishers, our Noel manuscript that leads to self grass affirmation. To say we're prepared is an understatement, so we're very excited about the days to come. When it comes to research, all last year we were involved in the Valid Care research study. And this is us and 12 other companies where hemp fusion products were part of or were some of the products used in this study to validate safety for liver toxicology as well as male related testosterone effect and so forth. And so it's really important that this study aimed its focus on safety because the FDA wanted real hemp or real, excuse me, um, real human research using observational work related to daily use of CBD. Now, what's really spectacular about this is there was over 1,400 participants, 800, over 840 completed the study. And what's awesome about it is that we found virtually no toxicity whatsoever. And it's, it's pretty spectacular. In fact, of the, co- of the part of the cohort that was using hemp fusion products, there was a use level of roughly eight to 181 milligrams with an average of 39.3 milligrams of CBD used per day with zero toxicity. So we're extremely encouraged by the results and think, and this is also being thought of as the largest human observational um, toxicology study ever been done on CBD. So something like this is really important in the eyes of the FDA to show that CBD is safe. Now, because of such a strong safety profile and such a strong focus on regulatory compliance, we attracted the attention of Dr. David Harnick. He is an assistant professor of medicine and cardiology at Mount Sinai Hospital and is also his own practice going to be doing using hemp fusion products exclusively in a study to study the effects that CBD has on the body and more specifically targeted cardiologic markers. So we're very excited about this study reaching its end, hopefully before the end of the year to be able to report such results. Again, shows our commitment um, to research as a whole when it comes to CBD. Now, most recently, approximately about 14 days ago, we announced a signing of a definitive agreement to acquire 100% of the interest of Apothecana, which is right now solely focused on topicals. Their 2020 pro forma revenue, net revenue, was approximately $4 million with a gross profit of about 70%. And this was really excited because for us is because it was very strategic. A lot of times through the acquisition process, companies like ourselves would just focus on buying revenue. We've been working on this since the fall of last year, even before we were going public with Apothecana. And we chose them very specifically because of the strategic alignment that this offers. They are intently focused on topicals with distribution in CBS, as well as private label distribution into Canada, as well as a what we are liking to call a sixth revenue driver for us into a unique private label market that is very, very special. Now, what makes this also a unique and strategic acquisition for us is that we have an extremely focused and compliant ingestible program that it's our technology and our product know-how can actually build an entire ingestible program for Apothecana in a near immediate future. Now, this is important because more than half of their sales are direct to consumer, which if we were to look at Brightfield data, roughly 51% of purchases are occurring online. With Apothecana's focus, so, um, with roughly half of their business happening online, they are in direct alignment with what's happening and installing a, an ingestible program that is extremely compliant means that they will be able to plus out sales very excitingly um, in a very near term or very near immediate. Now, they have roughly 18 stores of distribution with some crossover, but I will tell you this already adds to our roughly 4,000 stores, bringing us to just under 6,000 points of distribution in North America. So we're extremely excited about this acquisition and what it actually means in the very, very near future for us. Plus, they're amazing products that I can't wait for more consumers to become exposed to. Now, if that wasn't enough, we just about a week ago announced 
the acquisition of Sagely Naturals. Sagely Naturals is the number one selling topical brand in the U.S., distributed nationwide in retailers like CVS, Nordstrom, Rite Aid, Sprouts, Albertsons, and so much more. And with their 2020 net revenue pro forma basis is at $4.19 million. Upon closing both Apothecana and Sagely, this more than triples our trailing 12-month revenues, which is an extremely important thing to focus on, is that we are not focused on just buying revenue. We are buying strategy. M&A has always been a part of our strategy, and the acquisition of both Apothecana and Sagely are certainly not going to be our last. And believe it or not, they're not our first. Probulin was acquired in 2019. We've already illustrated that this is a focus of ours because we believe that the CBD industry specifically, consolidation's got to happen. Now, with this acquisition, it puts us into, as, a, as an enterprise, puts us into more than 15,000 retail locations. Now, this is exceptional. Now, Sagely is also unique because they are primarily focused on topicals. Now, to the co-founder's exact words, Sagely is focused on revolutionizing the medicine cabinet and, and helping women feel their best. And you know what? Playing a role in this and being able to help grow this company and develop an award-winning ingestible program is also going to be one of the focuses and something that we can do just like with Apothecana, help them develop in a near immediate future. And so this third acquisition by Hemp Fusion Wellness is just an illustration of what our focus and goal is going to be along with our organic strategy. Now, we remain completely focused on developing and growing the natural products industry, food, drug, and mass, our practitioner division, convenience, and e-commerce. We even have a sixth channel that we're going to excitingly um, mention that we're um, expanding to along with our international. So can't wait to share more details about that coming soon. Now, this to give you a little bit of an update of where we are with distribution currently with Hemp Fusion Wellness, not including these two acquisitions, which obviously includes Publix, our expansion with Probulin Probiotics on Amazon and so many other retails um, outlets. Now, our FDA, FDA drug listed topicals still remain very exciting to the retailers. In fact, according to Nielsen IQ data with our expansion into Publix, in Publix, we were ranked number one in both dollars and units. And on the unit side, we're number one in units if you exclude a $2 lip balm. So very exciting that we have the right products, the right messaging at the right price that meets the consumer demand. Now, our e-commerce expansion has been very exciting this year. In quarter one of 2020, we were approximately only about 6% direct to consumer. Well, ending quarter one 2021, we were more than 24% of our sales coming from an online direct to consumer basis whether it be through Amazon, Tmall, or directly from our hosted websites. I will tell you that a 4X growth is impressive for us and we feel very encouraged by that. We only really executed the efforts starting at the end of November in 2020. And we can't wait to share more details about the growth we're having even here in quarter two. Now, we expanded as we announced onto Alibaba's Tmall. We already have live as of March 29th, Probulin Probiotics, and we have six SKUs live and selling and very, very excited about the progress. Looking forward to the 618 promo here in June. And on our hemp fusion side, we've already been given provisional approval, just waiting for the Chinese government to give official authorization for products that contain CBD. And we will be one of the select few companies that contain CBD sold and marketed on Alibaba's team. Now our international expansion into Ireland and the UK, we already have both Probulin and hemp fusion products on the shelf. And in fact, we're gonna be, um, be releasing some information soon um, about some of the expansion efforts. And so we can't wait to share more about that. Now, as we've mentioned before, our product portfolio continues to expand. We have, um, we're excited to be launching our gummies and other uni unique products um, to round out our product portfolio. And as we've already mentioned, our OTC drug products are doing incredibly well. And Probulin probiotics continue to grow and continue to expand. In fact, in recent news that we shared, it was very encouraging to know that we're coming out the other side of what is considered a very positive move forward and putting a bit of a the COVID-19 wake in our past, I hope, is that the opening or reopening of many of the international markets, one of our largest international customers submitted a, a an approaching quarter was about $220,000 PO that we hadn't seen in almost a year because of their close down. So very excited to see and encouraged by what this means to move forward here in 2021 and beyond. Hey, Jason, just about a minute or two left here, uh, just to let you know. No problem. My pleasure. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you for giving me the update. So we have a clean capital structure and no debt. And our team is awesome. As I've mentioned before, 
Besides myself, I have my chief revenue officer, John Visser and Ola Lassard, as well as an amazing unparalleled financial team and board of directors and management team. So very excited to share more details in the future. And for those that want to learn more and get more information from our investor relations team, they can go to IR at hemfusion.com. So Elliot, thank you. I'll turn it back over to you. Um, and thank you so much for the time. Uh, uh, much, much appreciated, appreciated my friend. friend. Just a bit, a bit of an echo, but I think you answered a good bit of my questions, to be honest. I was curious about uh, your focus on topicals. You answered that. Um, I was curious about how that determined how you you determine your M and A and what you look for, and you know you take great pride in combining strategy, need, and revenue. You know, not to answer the question for you, uh, but I was super interested in your recent acquisitions. Yeah, you know, the main thing, the main reason for those acquisitions, you know, and like I said in the presentation, a lot of times some companies in a public markets perspective are just buying revenue, so they're just trying to expand and consolidate and grow organically where possible and through M&A. Well, while this does contribute to our overall revenue at the enterprise, from my perspective, I think you need to be very strategic. You need to look at what can I do for the company that I'm acquiring and what can that company do for us so that we can grow exponentially, not just the revenue at hand, because you're still going to have the painful understanding of organic growth unless you have a plan to give them that or install it with little to no effort of something you've already done. And that is very much why Apothecana expanding into different, very little overlap there, and then Sagely Naturals being almost entirely topical with only small amounts of overlap gives us an ability to give them both both companies a larger program to contend with and grow exponentially while we are also growing hemp fusion and provulent. So just very exciting. Now I will say this, M&A is very much a part of our strategy. These two re recent acquisitions combined with Probulin are not our last. And mm -hmm. so we can't wait to share more information as to how that strategy emerges in the future. Mm, looking for that tease, my friend. Look, <laughs> looking for that live update here on Benzinga's Cannabis Capital Conference. Yeah. Jason, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you. You dropped a ton of information on us today. Uh, maybe we can get another update here shortly on Cannabis Hour. But my friend, you're doing major things. You're obviously probably one of the most organized people I've ever seen in my life with how much you have going on. So I uh, really appreciate you being here again. I think you said IR at himfusion.com was the correct email address. Absolutely. And you'll get the head of our IR department, which is Spencer McLean. And he's just an awesome individual, be able to provide any information that you need. And he's I mean, he's even gone so uh, robust as to share his cell phone number there. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't a great know guy. Idea, but he's done it. So Absolutely. Well, uh, I got your cell. I'll give you a text. I'm just kidding. I don't. Uh, but Jason, it's good to have you, man. Be well. We'll talk to you soon. Uh, and congrats on all of your recent updates. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks again to Jason there. Uh, we really are having a packed day here. Uh, we're moving right along. Uh, I'd love Luis uh, to go ahead and join us. If I'm not mistaken, the newest entrant to NASDAQ in the cannabis world, uh, Flora Growth. Uh, L Luis, am I saying that correctly? That is correct, Elliot. Pleasure Beautiful. to be here. Awesome. My, my uh, co-worker, Javier, uh, you know, he, he's helping me with pronunciations. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Luis, very thrilled to have you. Uh, you are the president and CEO of Flora Growth, NASDAQ listed FLGC. I'm going to let you take it right away. Thank you, Elliot. And good morning to everyone in the audience. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, first, let me introduce uh, myself and give you a bit of my background. My name is Luis Merchant. As Elliot mentioned, I'm the president and CEO of Flora Growth Corp. Uh, my background is, is non-traditional as it pertains to the cannabis industry mostly in retail and CPG. My entire career has been in the United States. However, I'm a dual citizen, which presented a great compliment to, to our company. I've worked for companies such as Target and Macy's, uh, the latest of, of which uh, was Macy's, and I'd like to highlight a couple of roles for the, for the audience. I was responsible for the sales organization in the beauty division, which was responsible for about $3.6 billion in revenue nationwide across 540 stores and 20,000 beauty advisors. And the latest role that I had with the company was uh, corporate strategy workforce management. Um, I was responsible for customer experience and the allocation of, of human capital across multiple functions in the organization, including call centers, logistics, supply chain, and of course the stores organization. And that was about a $2 billion PL responsibility for the company. Uh, Join joined Flora as president of consumer goods to support the company in the development of a brand portfolio, became CEO of the company in June. 
Uh, it's been an exciting two years for our company. Uh, of course, Elliot just mentioned that we uh, we launched an IPO successfully on, on the NASDAQ exchange under the ticker FLGC on May 11th. Uh, but let me just jump right in. Um, so let's give you a, a few highlights for the company. Uh, we own one of the world's largest outdoor cannabis cultivation farms with a demonstrated pr low production cost. Um, we have a very solid balance sheet. Um, last year, we completed a $30 million pre-IPO equity raise. Uh, this year, uh, when we completed that, 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 that raise, we were left with about 10,600 investors, 85% of which were located in the United States. And that signaled to us that the investor community as a whole was ready for projects such as for our growth. And it signaled to us that we wanted to go through a direct listing in a public exchange in the US. Uh, we selected NASDAQ, of course, because of the market cap and the accessibility to, to the investor community. And we were able to, to raise $16.6 .6 million uh, through our IPO. Um, obviously, we're in, in, a, in a great position by being listed in, in, in NASDAQ. And we have been able to accomplish uh, all, all of this with an exceptional leadership team that I'll highlight all, over the next couple of slides. But it's a team that, that top to bottom is top notch and has been able to do a tremendous job growing this company. And of course, uh, as everyone is well aware, there are strong, uh, strong tailwinds in the industry. The, the timing for us is very good as it pertains to regulations and laws, not only in the United States, but also in Colombia, where 95% of our operations are located. Uh, on the right side of this slide, I'd like to highlight what are, are considered our two major competitive advantages. Uh, the first one is Colombian cannabis cultivation. Our cultivation is an all outdoor cultivation uh, process and that have allowed us to demonstrate one of the lowest production costs in the world at six cents per gram of dry flour. This has happened for a number of reasons. A number, uh, 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 one, one that I'd like to highlight for you is our ideal geography. Uh, our farm is located on the outskirts of Bucaramanga, which is um, a, a land that is 1500 meters above sea level with ideal growing conditions. Uh, Colombia is the number one producer of flowers in the world and is the number two exporter of flowers second only to the Netherlands. In fact, 70% of all flowers that come into the U.S. come from Colombia. And of course, cannabis being a specialty cut flower presents a, a, a tremendous opportunity uh, for cultivation in Colombia. Uh, in our farm, we, have, uh, we, we, we follow organic practices and are pursuing a national organic certification. Uh, we also have constant winds of three miles per hour, which reduce the incidence of pathogen. And we have a very scalable land package. And of course, this all contributes to the production costs that I, that I shared with you in this slide. Uh, the second one is our premium product portfolio. We current ha currently have five divisions, or almost 300 products. The list continues to grow on a daily basis and 70 licenses to distribute both nationally and inter internationally. This is very important to us because we, we assess that it, is very, um, it, it was a, a, a critical priority for us to diversify our portfolio and develop brands that resonate with consumers. And that, of course, uh, and give functionality and, and, and give the benefits that consumers are looking today. So these five divisions um, have, uh, are across multiple industries in which we assess cannabis is going to present a disruption in the upcoming months and years. Uh, we currently have over 2,500 distribution points across Latin America and the U.S. and continue to expand our distribution of products and brands and, and, in, 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 in our geographies worldwide. So a little bit about our leadership, starting from left to right. Uh, Bernie Wilson is our chairman of the board. He's a former vice chairman of PricewaterhouseCoopers and has been instrumental in leading a strategy. Uh, I shared already, already a little bit of my background, so we'll go right into Juan Manuel Galán. Uh, Juan Manuel Galán is a strategic advisor in Colombia. He's a three-time senator and he's the author of the cannabis law. He actually wrote the law and passed it to Congress. He also is the person that has, has uh, put forward modifications to the law that will allow us to, one, export dry flour out of Colombia into countries that will allow us to do so. And number two, is start to manufacture um, and food and beverage and consumables with infused cannabinoids. Stan Barty is a founder and a member of the board. He's been incredibly successful in raising capital for over 50 plus companies, has raised over $3 billion in capital in capital thus far. And then Javier Franco is, her, is where the art meets the, meets the science. He's our chief agronomist and he's the person that is leading our, our, operation, our farm operations out of Colombia. He has over 30 years, growing, 30 years of experience growing flowers in South America and Central America. So our international strategy, I think it's, 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 this is where we create a big differentiator. So our, our two competitive advantages, of course, are our cultivation in Colombia and our robust brand portfolio. 
now that we have completed a significant milestone for our company, we have set on this strategic pathway that first allow us to complete some uh, some places in the supply chain where we need to uh, to complement geographical areas, expand our distribution, or expand our reach. Uh, so when when we're talking about M and A and 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 our, and our strategy, we're going to look for those companies that will allow us to complement our current geographical footprint, and that will also allow us to complement our current supply chain infrastructure. Uh, number two, we're only going to work in markets that where we assess we're going to be able to have robust margins and have barriers of entry that are that are not significantly high, so we can operate and generate re meaningful revenues and value for our, for our investors and our consumers, short term and long term. And number three, uh, we're going to partner with the strategic brand partners where that, that where we can provide some of the IP that we have developed, but that we also can leverage some of their know-how in terms of brand building. And, and amplification of the product portfolio that we have currently available uh, for our company. So on this slide, what you'll see is a, is a summary of our current brand and product portfolio. As I mentioned, our company has five divisions. Uh, we currently have seven brands and 300 products. And I'm gonna go for the, over the next couple of minutes, I'll highlight some of the great things that each one of our divisions are, are doing and the brands that we have currently launched to market. So starting with Flora Lab. Uh, Flora Lab is a manufacturing facility out of Bogota, Colombia. It's a 16,000 square foot facility, uh, state of the art, has two GMP certification and allow us to manufacture phytotherapeutics, dietary supplements, cosmetics, and skincare. This laboratory is currently in operation and it is generating significant revenues for the company. The laboratory, of course, has the capability to produce cannabinoid containing products and it's already doing so for some of our, of, of our internal brands. Um, the the Flora Lab uh, portfolio is comprised of a number of acquisitions that we that we completed early in the year, including Brace Laboratory, Chronomed, and Cube Pharma. Uh, alongside with those acquisitions, we're able to to acquire a number of over-the-counter products that are registered within Vima. We have over 1,500 distribution channels uh, when when you com when you com comprise these these three um, entities. And of course, we are also pursuing custom formulas, which is a very robust margin, high margin business in South America, where, where we manufacture custom formulas with cannabinoids for consumers. These are margin rich and, uh, and it's, it's a very, uh, very interesting, fast growing market in South America. Our next division is a topical division. It's called Flora Beauty. Um, it's, it's anchored by our founder, Paulina Vega. Paulina Vega is, re is renowned in the fashion industry. She's a former Miss Universe, a tremendous female entrepreneur who's the ambassador for brands such as Stack Oil and Adidas, as well as Falabella, which is considered the, the Macy's of South America, uh, a department store chain all over South America. She has over 5 million followers, close to 6 million followers on Instagram. And she has been the, the creative mind behind the, the, the brands that we have launched under the Flora Beauty Division. The first one of which was is, is highlighted here called My Naturals. Uh, My Naturals uh, was launched in Q4 of, of 2020, already being distributed in Palabella stores in several brick and mortar locations, as well as, well as e-commerce channels uh, all over in Central, North America and, and South America. The second brand from this portfolio is called All, which is a high-end prestige line um, and it utilizes a far larger concentration of active ingredients. Obviously, it presents better, uh, uh, better benefits for the more sophisticated and more involved uh, skincare consumer. Uh, sustainability is, is a factor and a value that we apply across the entire supply chain. And, and it's, it shows in the development of our products from our packaging being, being sustainable. We only utilize bioplastics or the, the fully degradable in, in products as well as ingredients that are cruelty-free, certified, dye-free. We do not utilize any parabens. As, as our cannabis, which is organic, we don't utilize anything that can be harmful for, for the environment, the communities that we work with, or the consumers, um, which, which is where they're leading us today. Our next division is our food and beverage division, which includes a wide portfolio of, of, of juices, chocolates, snacks, uh, butters, gummies, et cetera. Uh, they, this brand is also founded by a tremendous female entrepreneur in Laura Londoño. Uh, she's a very famous Latin American actress, and uh, her, along, alongside with her husband, founded this brand, which we, we, we love and, and admire. There's a significant distribution of these products in Colombia, over 1,200 uh, distribution points in, in Colombia. But we already are importing, exporting our products into, into Central America, Costa Rica, 
uh, the, the UK and some other some other countries. This line of product uh, has has both CBD and non-CBD versions in them. And our strategy here is to ensure that we develop the infrastructure, develop the distribution channels, depending on the on the barriers of entry for several geographies. And when the geography allows us to do so, we'll incorporate the CBD versions, the cannabinoid versions of these products into those geographies. And then, uh, and then Hemp Textiles is our next division. Uh, Hemp Textiles was founded under the idea of maximizing the yield of the entire plant. Um, as, as the audience probably knows, when you submit the cannabis plant to extraction, you only utilize 20 to 40% of the plant generating crude oils, distillates, and isolates. The balance of the plant goes to waste today. And there are many industrial uses for it, including textiles, bioplastics, paper, building material. Uh, the first um, project out, out of our this, this division is called Stardog Loungewear, which is a hemp textile loungewear line. This was launched in Q4 of, of 2020. Uh, as you probably know, hemp is a superior fiber. It's natural, antibacterial, and sustainable. It utilizes a fourth of the water than, say, cotton crops utilize. It's highly durable and can be utilized for multiple uses, including frontline industries like hospitality, tourism, and medical. Um, and then, of course, it's, it's highly antibacterial, which is a, a great textile fiber for, for the current times. Now, moving into, into our fifth division, which is our, the foundation of our company, and it's our farm and, and extraction laboratory. Cosichemos ya has achieved some in, in incredible uh, cost structures. And what you see on this slide, on this slide is our production cost, which is six cents per gram of dry flour. That would be 60% lower than the lowest, than the, than the closest competitor that we have. And that is for a number of reasons that I already mentioned, but I'd like to highlight once again, we, we have favorable growing conditions. Of course, Colombia is located alongside the equator, which means we do not have a seasons and there's almost 365 days of, of sunlight per year. Uh, there's a very low cost infrastructure. Our, our farm has natural water deposits, which means that once we set up the, 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 the pumps and the irrigation systems, our water, uh, water cost is near zero. Our electrical bills is, uh, are like lower than $300 a month for our entire 100 hectares of, of land that are available. Uh, we have been testing strains from day one and we have identified strains that, that have a tremendous yield and allow us for high density planting. And of course, I mentioned that Colombian is a, is a powerhouse when it comes to floriculture. And because of that reason, we have been able to utilize that know-how alongside with the team that we have built uh, to ensure that, that we have the, the best agricultural team uh, out there in the industry. Um, and also the, the affordability. When you compare agricultural skill labor in Colombia to say that of North America, the cost effectiveness is about nine times in that of North America. And, and for that reason, and the favorability of the dollar, we're in, a, in an exceptional position. And then, of course, our cultivation success. Uh, the, cultiva the Cosechemos Cultivation Farm, which is our, our cultivation facility, has over 100 hectares of cannabis. We have the, 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 the rights to expand that 21 times as demand increases. Uh, we have demonstrated the, the production cost already, and we're ready to sell high quality, high quality cannabis at competitive prices worldwide. Now I'm going to uh, finalize by, by just a couple minutes left. Here. Sorry, I just wanted to pop in and let you know we have a few minutes left, Luis. Yeah, this is the this is the last slide, Elio. I appreciate it. So we we of course went public on on Nasdaq on May 11th. Uh, we have a tremendous capital structure, uh, 40 42 million shares outstanding, and we have 12.4 million million options and warrants that will allow us to receive about 24 million dollars in cash coming from them. Uh, very minimal debt. We have points, 0.7 million dollars. Most of it is is operational debt from the company, and a cash balance of 25 million dollars. And of course, uh, with with this presentation and the, the 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 focus that the leadership team has put into making this company grow so so quickly, the future is exceptionally bright for our company. I'll stop there, Elliot, and allow you to ask any questions. I'm still I'm just in shock over the six cents per gram. I don't, I don't know if I'm going to get over that the rest of the day, Luis. That's incredible. Uh, <laughs> that's a value play right there, in my opinion. Uh, you know, I do want to point out one comment, not necessarily a question in the chat, uh, that the future of hemp textiles, super interesting to me, and, and something that's not talked about a lot, uh, or enough, I should say, um, at least in, in my network uh, and experience. So I'd love your thoughts 
on the future of hemp textiles, uh, maybe to Unique Mill's point, uh, po you know, to come out of the legalization movement. Absolutely. I mean, like the hemp textile industry was was frankly crippled by by it being it, it being put under the umbrella of a Schedule One drug, and for that reason, the industry did not develop as fast as the cotton industry did. Uh, but when you evaluate the supply and, de and demand gap of textile industry, there will be a, an eight-figure billion supply and demand gap over the next five years. And that gap is going to have to be filled by something. As of today, the world is, is, the world is manufacturing about 60% of all textile fiber is synthetic and is very damaging to the environment, of course, as you may, as you may appreciate. And of course, the cotton, which is the, the second best nat natural fiber and the, and the second biggest uh, contributor to that pie, requires a lot of water, requires a lot of pesticides. The soil gets damaged. Um, so from, from, a, from a sustainability standpoint, from the durability of the, of the fiber, uh, hemp presents a lot of opportunity. And I assess that as, as this industry continues to deregulate, the machinery, the technology, the cultivation processes are going to be able to uh, allow this to, to grow exponentially and fill a lot of the, that, de that demand gap that exists today. Super interesting, man. Uh, I appreciate you going into that. Uh, I, I do have to ask, do you feel different being a CEO of a company listed on the NASDAQ now? I mean, is it life changing? It, it, to it totally is. I mean, it's life changing for our investors. It's life changing for our teams. Uh, we ask, uh, assess that the, the day that our company truly started, like grew up and became became a big boy was the day we, we went public. The work for us is just beginning. Uh, we are focused on, on delivering value, of driving revenue growth, of making a creative acquisitions that will allow us to expand our infrastructure and growing our supply chain. But clearly, uh, all eyes are on us right now. We, we are one of the of the largest now companies in, in Colombia. We have the opportunity to show that the Col Colombian grow uh, in the Colombian cannabis industry can become uh, a leader of cannabis in the world. And of course, we're focusing on the development of our brand portfolio that, uh, that we feel strongly is a big differentiator for our company. Absolutely. I love your brand portfolio, just on a personal level. I speak for myself and not Benzinga. Um, but Luis, thank you so much for being here. Uh, you are here, uh, a recent entrant to NASDAQ. Uh, if you could, in 15, 20 seconds, leave our investors with a final thought uh, on why they should check you out. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the two reasons that I highlighted, uh, number one, and I, we have an, an incredible cultivation uh, facility, an economic moat with, with our growing conditions and the production cost that has, been, that has been proven. Number two, our focus on brand portfolio that will allow us to develop revenues. And all of these, these two advantages cannot be done without our focus on people. From top to bottom, we ensure that we are hiring the best talented uh, team, that we have the best members of the board that is ensure appropriate governance, that we're utilizing every dollar in a, in a, in a, financially, uh, in a financially responsible way and that we're driving long-term value for all of our investors and of course in tremendous benefits for our consumers. Fantastic. Luis, thank you so much again for being here. NASDAQ listed, Flora Growth, F-L-G-C, floragrowth.ca. Thank you again. Uh, we'll see you again later on, on a panel discussing going public in this industry. So looking, looking forward, forward to it, Elliot. Yep. I appreciate the time and you have a great day. You too. Talk to you soon. All right, y'all. So the time has come. Uh, that was an awesome presentation, by the way. Definitely check them out. But we are going to get into a little audience participation here uh, with our Slido poll. Uh, Chris, if you want to come on with me, man, I would love to have you. How are you, by the way? Very good. And yourself? Very well. Very well. Thank you, man. Uh, so we're going to do a little quiz uh, before we get into this. So everybody, please take a picture of that QR code uh, right there. Uh, you will be able to participate. Uh, what are cannabinoids? Chris, uh, I don't know like how entrenched you are in this space, uh, but out of these, the psychoactive chemicals found on marijuana that get you high, the medicinal properties found in cannabis and hemp or any of various naturally occurring biologically active chemical cons constituents of hemp or cannabis. Wow, that is a mouthful. <laughs> what do you think, my friend? I'm going with number one. The the top one there that just that just popped up, right? Oh no 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 no! Hold on a second. That's the any of various natural Yeah yeah. 
Uh, I'm gonna say I'm gonna actually say the medicinal property found in cannabis. Cannabis. You know, and that, that I think that's my like initial thought as well. But I my then my mind goes to well, not all cannabinoids are. You know, some are recreational. So then I start to doubt myself. Um, but I gotta admit, I'm no scientist in this space. So I mean, I think your guess is as good as mine uh, on this one. I didn't even give an answer because uh, I. Uh, I may or may not know the answer. Uh, Chris, man, what are we going to hear in your presentation here in a couple minutes? Sure. So um, you all have asked me to come on as a trader and talk about uh, the cannabis market, cannabis stocks. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about. And so um, I just started sharing. Are you guys seeing the screen now? Uh, we will. Once we start, once we pull down the Slido poll, for, once everybody cool. has had a chance to participate, we'll, we'll throw your screen up. Cool. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not a cannabis expert in the industry or anything like that. That is not my expertise. I am a trader. I've been doing this for 21 years and I'm going to be talking specifically from the perspective of a trader. So the, this is kind of a disclaimer in the sense of, Hey, I'm going to be looking at the tools and skills that I have as a trader to these cannabis stocks and talk about potential locations that I may want to buy these stocks. What I see happening in the charts, in the order flows, and I'm going to be talking specifically just from the perspective of a trader. I'm not talking as a long-term investor. I am not talking as someone who is evaluating these companies in terms of their technologies. I'm simply talking as a trader. So if my uh, opinions or advice or just, you know, potential buy and sell locations um, don't necessarily, are, you know, aren't congruent with your perspective on the company, totally cool. I'm just here to present as that. And not as a, a cannabis expert, so no, it's I love uh, it, man. Important we understand that perspective. Well, and I think you're not alone, right? I, I think you're going to see uh, a lot of our audiences in the same boat. So I think they'll be excited to hear from you. Can we actually, Nicole, show the correct answer real quick to the Slido poll, and then we'll jump right back into Chris's uh, presentation? All right, I will showing the correct answer. It is any ever. We have most of the people who answered are correct. Uh, Chris and I may or may not have been wrong. We won't tell you unless you rewind the video. Uh, but Chris, with that, my friend, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you take us away. Okay, great. So I should be seeing the slide here. Okay, great. So just a super brief for those of you that are new to me or don't know about me. I've been trading 21 years professionally. I was a broker on Wall Street, FXCM. I've also traded for a hedge fund, JNF hedge fund, and I've been trading privately for the last 21 years. So I'm a verified profitable trader. We post our track record for last year, the entire year. You can see all our stats and performance. And we now update that quarterly. So you can see, hey, we're not just someone who gives advice and talks a really good game. We actually show that we make money trading and we do a good job controlling risk. So with that being said, flows in my, as a trader, I look at what is the most proximate driver of a stock's price. And the bottom line is, is that flows are king, order flows king. It doesn't matter whether you are a fundamental trader, a long-term investor and making your decisions based on potential growth aspects of a company. It doesn't matter whether you're a technical trader or a sentiment or flow trader. Every one of us, if we want to buy or sell a stock, we have to push a button and that trade becomes actualized. And when it does, it becomes actualized order flow. And that collection, that kind of congregation of all these orders coming in from various sources of information and decisions and reasons why to buy or sell a particular stock, that collection of orders becomes order flow. And order flow is the most proximate driver of price action. It doesn't matter whether a company has invented some groundbreaking technology. If nobody's buying that stock, the stock's not going to move. If nobody, if no institutions are getting involved in that, if we don't see dark pool volume, if we don't see options flows on that, that stock is not going to move. What moves a stock's price is order flow. And as a trader, that's what I'm most concerned with. And so when I'm speaking about, you know, some of the data and some of the information, the flows that I'm seeing in these stocks, then that is what is informing my decisions and how I'm making these decisions. So you understand. So we're going to be talking about you know, uh, option flows, which is key for me, option flows is super important option dealers and market makers. Some of the most active players in the markets, some of the things that happen with the crazy squeezes and AMC and all these other stocks, a lot of that has to do with options activity. And so options activity has exploded. That's a very strong flow in the market from the trader side. 
But then on top of it, the dealers and market makers, they are constantly hedging and adjusting positions based upon how we trade that. If I buy a thousand calls on Tilray stock, that dealer or market maker is now short a thousand calls. They don't want to have directional exposure. That's not their business. Their business is to make markets. So what do they have to do the moment I buy a thousand calls and they are now short a thousand calls? They have to hedge that exposure and they can do that by getting along the stock or getting along futures if it's an index, but they will have to hedge that exposure. And that's all done mechanically, automatically for each and every option kind of flows that are going through. If it's a small flow, one option contract, probably just going to be absorbed by the pool. But if somebody comes in with a serious amount of flows or they see 20 or 50 or 100,000 calls on a particular price, they have to hedge that. And that's going to influence the flows of the stock for that day, for that week, for that month, for that year. So it's super important that when we analyze potential trade ideas on these cannabis stocks and plays, that we're looking at the option flows in the market where they are available. Another thing that's important to understand is dark pool activity. So about 40% of all those flows going into the market in the US are done via dark pools. These are hedge funds that can purchase shares of a stock or make trades on a stock without those numbers going through exchanges, without those flows and volumes going through. So they can be anonymous. They don't alert people to their positions. There are ways to track dark pool activity, and we're going to be sharing what we're seeing in the dark pool flows for these particular stocks. The last thing I want to talk about is just structure recovery. <clears throat> if you have been following the cannabis space since 2020 and 2021, you'll all be very aware that a lot of them had, you know, massive rips higher in the first two months of 2021, but then they just fell off a cliff and they all got sold into oblivion. What we're now seeing in the charts and a lot of these is they are starting to recover. So this is really my last slide. After this, I'm just going to go straight to charts. So let's get into charts and kind of show you what I'm seeing in those charts. So this is one of the ETFs in the cannabis space. You can see this is that rip that we we're talking about end of last year and then beginning of this year, and then just got sold into oblivion, you know, from 31 down to 18. It's a massive drop. That is a massive drop. And it's selling off two out of every three weeks. So what are we starting to see? We're starting to see that these stocks, the cannabis space is starting to recover a little bit. And it's not just across, you know, a couple of the main ETFs, which you can see here as well. Same thing, rip, sell off, and now starting to base. You look at ACB. ACB is one of the few that's not quite basing as well. But a lot of the others, CGC, you can see it again. You see this massive sell off and then starting to base and recover. And what I suspect when I look at that from a flow based perspective is that I'm seeing that the cannabis space sold off massively. A lot of the flows had unwound on these positions here, but now people are starting to feel like, hey, the cannabis space, those values are starting to get to places where we feel like, hey, we want to start absorbing this selling flow and we're going to start pushing the prices higher. It's not just one stock. I'm seeing it across multiple players in the cannabis space. And that tells me that from a value perspective, that a lot of people are feeling like this is a good time or this is a decent location to be buying. And that to me is an exciting time. You know, during this, not an exciting time to buy. Now we're getting to those price levels. And so as a trader, what kind of flows am I seeing that are changing? If we think about it from a flow perspective, if you sell off from 32 down to 18, sellers are in control during that time period. We haven't had a two week bullish close since this sell-off in February 8th. We have not had back-to-back -back bullish closes on a weekly basis. If we start to see that across multiple cannabis stocks across the sector, then that tells me that there's broad-based buying. And so we are going to talk about that. So with that being said, um, let's go off a list of here of stocks that I have. We're going to go through this list of seven or eight or nine stocks. I'm going to talk about the dark pool volume that I'm seeing in these particular stocks. I'm going to talk about some of the potential options activity that may or may not have an impact upon that. And then I'm going to talk about potential locations that I would want to buy or sell this. Just to let you know, I am watching the live stream on this right now. So if you have questions about some of these trades or stocks that we're looking in, feel free to ask in the chat in real time. I'm happy to answer them in real time. 
So the first one we're going to talk about is the Advisor Shares Pure Cannabis ETF, YOLO. We are seeing this little bit of a base, potential two-week base on this. So <clears throat> as an ETF, it has low volume, as you can see. Its average volume for the 10-day average is 184,000 shares. That means for us as day traders, this is not really a day trading type stock. It's not the stock that's going to have enough volume or liquidity for us to have massive rippers on the day. But as a potential medium long-term play, we do have some potentiality in this. When I look at the dark pool volume, I'm seeing that there's about 223,000 shares of dark pool volume going on this. And this is only averaging 180,000, 184,000 shares over an average 10 day period per day. So there's a decent amount of dark pool volume in this that's starting to build and it's been building over the last several days. When I look at this and I look at some of the options activity on YOLO, there's not a whole lot of options activity. But what we do know is that there's about 13,000 calls in the market and there's only 887 puts. That's massive call heavy, you know, NIST and the option side there. I don't see a lot of options expiring in June or July. So if the market is long calls and none of those options are expiring short term, there's not a lot of short term plays in this. People are playing for the medium and long term. That means that those long calls, that massive amount of calls in the markets, that fuel isn't coming out anytime soon because most of the expiry is not till August. So I think on a short and medium term basis through August, this could have some bullish tailwinds to it. Where would I like to buy on this? I like the 20 strike. I like the 20 strike as a nice strike there. So if we can get a pullback to 20 or maybe high 19s, that to me becomes a decent play to get long for June, July, and August, and then potentially pull out of the market as we start getting towards that August expiry. So couple ways you could play this, potentially long underlying, or you can look for uh, options on this. You can do long calls, maybe cheap at that point. If they're a little bit more expensive, then you can look at a potentially a bull call spread. That's where you would buy the 20 calls and then you would sell further up, you know, maybe 23, 24, 25. I think there's definitely scope for this to make its way back up towards, I think 25, maybe even 30. When I look at options flows, I feel like dealers aren't going to have to do a whole lot of hedging until we start to get to around 23. And then as we start getting, you know, around 28, 29, I think they'll have to do a lot more hedging at that point. And that could kind of cap the upside on this. But I feel like it's not quite shown me enough that it's fully based yet. And so what I'd like to see on this is a pullback or a push up to here and then a pullback. So move up, then a pullback, find a higher base around 20 and then push higher. So that's what I'd like to see in yellow. MSOS, another cannabis ETF, very similar, low volume, not gangster volume, a little bit more. Average or The volume today is 81,000. It's average 10 day is 331,000. That's about double the volume that you get in the yellow one there. When I look at the dark pool volume, I'm seeing about 202,000 shares on this right now. And I'm seeing a lot of options that are rolling off this June OPEX, June 18th. About 55% of the options are rolling off June 18th. So as we get closer to June 18th, the market right now has about 116,000 calls and only 37,000 puts, call heavy. So as we get towards June 18th, Anybody who's in profit in those calls is going to monetize them. That means that there's going to be a little bit of a pullback in this. But when I look at where the flows are and the strikes are, I'm thinking we're going to get a pullback maybe to 40. 40 looks like a great price. If we happen to get 38, 39, to me, that seems like a pretty good value play on this. The chart also looks a little bit similar to YOLO. It's trying to build a higher base. You have lower low, lower low, higher low, or and higher low here, but you kind of have this cap right here and this push needs to kind of make it up there to 44. So if we get a weak pullback to 40, I'm interested in getting long for a potential push to 43, 44. And then if we can break that, then that opens up a lot more upside, potentially mid 48s on this one here. So that's kind of why I'm thinking on MSOS. Um, just looking at questions real quick. Um, 
Okay, we'll get into your comments soon, Jorge. It's not quite specific. Uh, Jorge Garcia says, would you please review XXI and let us know your thoughts? Yes, it's on the list. Um, we will definitely look at that one. So the last one we're going to be looking at, we're doing them uh, after the ETFs, we're doing them in alphabetical order. Okay, ACB. ACB, dark pool volume is 2.9 million. Its average volume to, or its volume today is 7.5 million and its average 10 day volume is 7.8 million. So today's volume is right in line with its average 10 day. Nothing huge and nothing, you know, um, kind of underperforming, so to say. We're seeing again, a very similar structure, lower, low, lower, low, higher, low with a consistent resistance right around 18. So when I look at ACB and I look at the options flows, about 25% of the options are rolling off on June 18th. And there's about 470,000 calls and there's about 170,000 puts again, call heavy. So there's a quarter of the options rolling off. There are going to be more calls than puts that are rolling off come June 18th. But when I look at, you know, what's kind of going on the flows, I feel like ACB has got some support on it. So when I look at where I'd like to potentially get long on ACB, I like this location right around here, which is just under 950. It was the base of this breakout pullback push higher. And it's also this kind of base right here. So I kind of like around sub 950. And if we happen to get down to eight, I think that's a really good value buy on ACB for a potential medium long-term play. When I look at option flows, I really don't see a whole lot of resistance until we start getting to around 15. And then I think around 20 will cap any sort of, you know, massive upside move. Short term, though, this has rallied pretty strong in the last few days. This is the strongest rally of the three that we've looked so far. So I feel like with the dark pool volume being strong, about one third of a day's volume, and then I look at you know the call heaviness on this and a fair amount of options activity, I feel like we'll probably hit a little bit of a resistance, get a pullback, and then an opportunity to get long. And when I look at potential upside targets, I feel like you're going to have to respect 12, but then after that, you can start looking at more like a 15. And then after that, it starts to get a little thin. We'll have to build a little bit more flows and price action and get up there. So medium term targets around 12 and 15, and then eventually a potential move back up to 20. After that, things will start getting a little thin in terms of volume and liquidity. Okay, next on the list, um, CGC. So dark pool volume is around 1.1 million. The interesting thing about CGC canopy growth is the option activity. 55% of the options are rolling off this Friday. And the market is about two to one calls to puts, about 200,000 calls, about 110,000 puts. So you're talking half of all those options are going to roll off this Friday. That's a lot of short-term weekly options on this. I think that's going to cap some of the upside. Anybody who's long puts this week, if they're in the money, they're going to start monetizing them either end of day today or tomorrow because theta decay is going to start to eat into those profits massively. So I think short term, we get maybe a little bit more lift going into Friday. I think after Friday and Monday, we get a little bit of a pullback. When we start to get that pullback, where would I like to get long? Let's take a look at our four hour. I feel like this base right around here, which is where this most recent push up was, which is just above 24. I think that's a really good location. I think if we happen to get into the 23s, that's a super good value buy on CGC. Um, after that, I think we'll probably run into this resistance 27, 28, but I think it's going to continue to build a higher base. I'm really encouraged by this kind of aggressive takeover of this selling pressure. If you look at this selling pressure, transition sideways, that's a transition in order flow. Sellers are in control during this entire time period. The, what do they do? They run into a wall around 22 and a half. It starts going sideways. That's a transition in the order flow. The sellers can no longer push lower prices. That means bulls are absorbing it there. And then what do we get? An impulsive lift off, off that. That tells me that there's a strong amount of buying interest here. Bulls absorbing the offers and then making higher prices on that. And they're doing so fast. The rise up is faster than the sell off. So that means bulls are taking over, slip more and more of the order flow. So that those are my two price locations around this base here, just above 24 and then 23 flat. 
Okay, we'll take a look at a few more here. So the next one is Floral Growth, the prior presenter. I really like this presentation. Um, recent IBO listing on the NASDAQ. Because of that, no options activity. Options will probably start to come maybe in the next few weeks, depending upon how much volume goes through. You know, like Coinbase, the options were available like within a week. But because this isn't quite the same volume and in institutional interest, it's going to take a little bit more for that. So I have no options data on this as we speak. In terms of dark pool activity, what was really interesting is that there is this fair amount of dark pool activity, not just today, but also over the last several days on floor growth. So right now, there's about 675,000 shares on floor growth. Why is that interesting? The volume today is 117K and its average 10-day volume is 400K. So we're talking about six days, roughly six days worth of an average daily volume has been bought up by institutional insiders. That tells me that there's some medium and long-term interest in this. And that may be why after two weeks of IPO selling, it bottomed and is finding a little bit of a bounce. So I have no flow activity on this in terms of options, but the dark pool activity suggests there are people slowly accumulating shares on this one here. And so that means if you're looking for a cheap stock and you like the long-term prospects of this, there's some pretty good prices on four growth. And so for me, in terms of buying locations, I'm going to look at the four hour, you know, we have selling right here. Sellers are in control from the IPO as a short little bounce, but then buyers start to take control of this. And they formed a little bit of a base around here, which is 375. So I think anywhere between $3.75 and $3 becomes a pretty good value location on this one here. Um, again, there's not enough history. Or there's not enough flows for me to say, hey, long term where I think this can go. But its first target would naturally be, you know, your IPO highs between 5 and 550 Okay. Um, we got a few more and then we can go to open Q&A on this one here. GRWG. Dark pool volumes coming in at 457000 this one is a little interesting because very much like CGC, it has a lot of options rolling off this Friday, around 40% of the options. It's not a heavy option stock. You have about 68,000 calls and 38,000 puts. And so with that being said, um, it's not huge amounts of options that are rolling off, but it is call heavy. So I think we're going to see a little bit of a pullback. But again, this has found kind of a decent base around 36. So when I look at this, I look at potential buying locations and I look at lower low, higher low, and now another base. False break here. I think we're going to get a little bit of a pullback once these options roll off. Natural strike would be 40. That's potential support. I like a little bit lower than that if I want to be value hunting. Just sub 38 is a decent price for me. So that is where I'm kind of seeing on that. When I look at flows and activity, I don't see a whole lot of hedging needing to be done until we get to about 50. So a lot more upside on this. Obviously, any bounces, you're going to have to deal with these peaks over here and that peak over here. But if you clear that, then I think it's got smooth sailing up to 50. So that's kind of what I'm seeing on GRWG. But I'm constructive on this one. Okay, three more. IPR. And then we're going to go to, I got 15 minutes. Thanks for the warning. I appreciate that. Actually, I got less than that. So let me kind of more shoot through this rapid fire. IRPR, low uh, dark pool volume, and I got no options flow on this one here. Um, dark pool volume is about 115K, which is decent compared to today's. Um, but this one, I think you need to value hunt a little bit. I think we need to look for a deeper pullback on this one here. I wouldn't personally touch this until about 172. I think that's where you start to see some buyers start to step in. And then these little spike lows here, 165, 166, I think becomes a good value play on this one here. Options on this one, not a whole lot. Um, very few options on this one, so very little data on this one here to really roll with. But I think this is going to pull back a little bit, and then I think it offers some potential long-term plays. Tilray, one of my more profitable stocks this year and last year. Um, Tilray has about 12.3 million dark pool volumes. Strong, very strong. Its average 10 day is 28 million. So you're talking about half to a third of its average 10 day volume. 
When I look at Tilray, I see that not a whole lot of, about 35% of the options rolling off. Very call heavy, 800,000 calls, 340,000 puts. So I think we're going to see, um, and it's not rolling off till January or till June 18th. Short term, I think we're going to get a pullback in Tilray. Where do I want to get long in Tilray? I'd like 17. This is, you know, the base. You had a breakout and then it formed a base here and then ripped higher. I think it overshot. I think this base is going to find buyers again. So just above 17 becomes a pretty good buy location. If it happens to get 15, I'm a long-term buyer on that one there. I will buy that and hold that probably for the rest of the year if we happen to get 15. I think the chances of Tilray closing above 17, $20 by the end of this year, very, very strong. So that's what I'm looking at on Tilray. And then the last, XXI 22nd Century Group. Okay. I did not have any options date on this, um, but dark pool volume is solid at 1.7 million. That's a little over today's volume right now as we speak. With that being said, when I look at potential locations on this one here, and when I look at volume, what I see is that we see a big pickup in the volume profile. You see how this volume is really picking up? These volume levels are way above this kind of no volume environment for all of 2020 and 2019. So this stock has generated more institutional interest, more retail interest as a whole. That generally is favorable when you see that that generally is favorable for a stock to continue to increase in price. So I look for a pullback on this one here. I think around $3 becomes an interesting location. This becomes a little bit more clear when I look at it on the four hour. You can see kind of this, this is my first location right around here. So I think somewhere between 280 and 320, maybe 375 on this one here, but I would probably wait for a little bit lower dip more towards 320, 310, $3 to potentially get long in this one here. But this is generating more and more interest as the months and months go on. And as long as that volume profile continues to pick up, that means there's more people looking at the stock. So those are my stock plays on the cannabis stocks this year. Again, this is just from the perspective of a trader who looks at flows, who looks at options, who looks at dark put volume is all being key. And so that's how I base my trading decisions. And that's how I'm basing these recommendations. With that being said, let's look at um, some of the questions here. Diamond hands. I appreciate Stanley. Um, where do you get dark pool volume? You can get that from FINRA, but they don't really give you a way to analyze it. So you have to build your own algorithms and statistical things to kind of analyze that in a little bit more in depth. Um, okay. Jorge, I answer your question about XXIA. Born to be free. Good name. Is that the case in the dark pools when you see that is an accumulation of shares? Doesn't necessarily have to be dark pools. It could be also the open market is buying as well. So it could be the lit pools, the lit exchanges or not. So yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, anytime you see an accumulation, you don't. it doesn't necessarily have to be the lit exchanges or the, the unlit exchanges like the dark pools. It can be the lit exchanges. Philip Fillmore, I'm a little new to stocks. Not sure what options and calls are. Anyone know where I, Yes, we have on our YouTube channel, Second Skies Trading, we just did three free intro to options videos. So Second Skies Trading, I'll get you the link for that. And you can go straight to our videos on that. Our most three most recent videos are all intro to options. They're all free on that there. Okay, so hopefully I answered your question there, Philip. Um, next one, Chris, how long before an expiry with heavy call and volume will stock start a major pullback? Um, well, if you think about theta decay, theta decay, the largest portions of theta decay will happen just before the expiry. If it's a short term option like June 18th, which is the June monthly option expiry, then you'll probably see two to three days before the theta decay will start getting massive. The, you know, if you got some deep you know, two month, three month, four month, six month, nine month, theta decay is going to be minimal until that last week. And then it's going to accelerate. So yeah, it just depends upon um, how far the expiry is, but most theta decay usually happens in the last few days. Um, so hopefully I answer your question. 
Sean Wilton, where is he getting dark pool information? You can get it from FINRA, but again, they don't really give you ways to aggregate it or digest it. It helps to build algorithms and Excel sheets to analyze that data. Uh, where on this site do they explain call and put strikes? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by that, but um, yeah, we've covered, we have some intro to options videos that can help you with that. Chris is the goat. I appreciate it. Uh, I got a little Tilray, but bought most at a bad time, but I'm in a positive, but I'm positive wondering if, if to cash out when it's even, or, it depends on your investing and risk parameters. You know, you, anytime you enter a trade, you should have to find risk values right off the bat. It should be like, Hey, if my trade theory is correct, the stock should not go below this price. If it goes below this price, my trade theory is incorrect. I need to exit out of the market and then reassess potential locations on that. So that should be done with every single trade. If you haven't violated that or it hasn't invalidated your thesis, then you should stay in the trade. If it's invalidated your thesis, you should be out of the trade, reassess and recalibrate. Risk is the most important thing that you should be doing. Beginning traders focus on profit first, risk seconds. Professional traders reverse that equation. We focus on risk first and then profit second. If you can't control risk, it only takes one risk event to blow up your account. But if you're controlling risk, you're not gonna blow up your account. And blowing up your account is the, it ends the game. You have to start over, build new capital, reload, and you're not making money during that time period. Control risk first, very, very important. Um, is Sundial a good buy? Let's take a look at that. Let me just make sure I got everything right here. Okay, let's take a look at Sundial. And let me look at, see what's going on with uh, options activity and a little dark pool activity. And how are we doing on time? Okay. All right, so seeing a decent amount of activity on Sundial. Wow, 183 million shares on Sundial. Very strong. That's a lot. That is a lot. That's a lot. That's about one third of today's volume. And its average 10 day volume is 331. That's over 50% of its average 10 day volume per day. That is strong. That is a lot. Okay. So let's take a look at some options activity. Wow. 3.7 million calls, 366,000 puts, 10 to 1 calls to puts. It does have a lot of options rolling off this Friday, around 30%. So that is going to get monetized. And so probably by Friday, if not today, then probably by Friday, you're going to see a pullback on that. Where would I want to get long on this? I generally don't trade stocks sub $3, but I think 78 cents isn't bad and $1 is a decent location as well. Okay. So I think I've uh, answered all that and I see Man. Elliot coming on, which means yeah, he's dude. probably going to pull me out stage left. <laughs> you, uh, that was fun, Chris. I'm not going to lie. As a person who studies the cannabis industry and talks to these executives daily, it was cool to kind of look at an investor's perspective. So Appreciate you being here as always. Um, Y'all, if you missed any of this, just rewind. <laughs> Chris is awesome uh, at the end of the day, of course. But Chris, thanks again so much. CEO and head trader of SecondSkiesForex.com. I can't imagine we won't see you again very soon. Good being you. Take care. Thanks so much, Chris. Uh, that was awesome, y'all. Uh, a lot of education there, a lot of information, some chart studying. Uh, I learned a ton. Uh, that being said, we are moving on to what some consider one of the stronger plays uh, in this industry. So I'm super excited to bring over the CEO uh, of Fire and Flower, Trevor Fincott. How are you, sir? Well, thanks for having me, Elliot. Of course, Trevor. Absolutely thrilled to have you guys here. Uh, as I said, incredibly strong company. FFLWF, if you don't know their ticker, it's right at the bottom of the screen. Trevor, with that, my friend, I'm going to turn it over to you. Perfect. Okay. Well, here, here on, uh, I'll do a little quick walkthrough of our deck. I really want to open it up for questions if that's possible, because that's really, uh, I think, important to understand our story. Um, so uh, just a very quick uh, bio about myself. I was an early uh, cannabis pioneer in the Canadian market, 2012, formed, uh, uh, co-founded Metrum Health Corps. We were taken out by Canopy in 2017 for $430 million, um, then pivoted started a new company, Fire Flower, realizing that retail is the biggest part of the value chain. 
Uh, ultimately, when there are not brands and there are not arguably brands yet, there will be. Being in retail is uh, is you know is the place to be. But being a tech forward retailer was key. So I'll talk a bit about our story. It really has sort of three elements. We are a tech forward retailer of cannabis. We started with the end goal in mind, knowing it's going to be very competitive. We started with how to build a, a, a best of breed competitive retailer and then put it in the cannabis space, not the opposite. Uh, we've executed on our plan, very good traction to date. We have 86 uh, corporate owned stores uh, in the Canadian market. We are uh, with two quarters of positive operating EBITDA. So we've turned the corner on that, which is great. And we have a very strong strategic partner in Circle K. So without further ado, we'll go through the disclaimer and forward looking statements on our deck. You can download this from our, our website. But really, if you think about um, us, our value proposition are three things. So we started with this tech forward position. We knew that uh, in retail was going to be competitive. When there's money on the table, competition is going to be fierce. So we looked at you know, Amazon as the big gorilla in the retail space that was massacring Main Street retail. Look, who is competing with them? Is anyone competing with them? And we found a few groups, things like Beta out of California, where we park for glasses. There's there a number of groups that were not only competing with Amazon, but were thriving in that environment. And so we decided, because again, we started the company from scratch to take those lessons learned and build the company in that way, build with the end in mind. So those companies all had a few things in common. They all viewed themselves as tech native. They were not bricks and mortar stores that then kind of bolted on a digital strategy or then tried to figure out e-commerce. They started native to the digital space. And so that's that's what we did. Um, the first acquisition we made actually was a tech company called HiFire, which has become an important part of our platform. Uh, we believe it's a clear differentiator uh, no other group started with a group of 20, uh, 25 data scientists and uh, computer engineers. It's uh, it was an anomaly at the time, but we think it's it's paying dividends for us. So these these best of breed companies that we tried to model, they use their tech to to drive very deep engagement with their customers, and in turn that engagement led to bigger lifetime value, which is bigger basket sizes, more frequent visits, all these kind of normal metrics of a retailer but we look at it as lifetime value of a customer. And that comes from my, my tech uh, background. But that's how we look at our customers. And then these companies that are, are super competitive, they take this information and this relationship and they view their vendors as partners and customers. And that's different than Amazon, where Amazon vendors don't love Amazon, it's a necessary evil. We thought, well, look, if you look at the best of breed in retail, they're actually partnering with their vendors and they're helping them with this data and, and analytics and helping them make better products for their customers, helping them uh, make better pricing decisions, better product offerings, helping that retailer, you know, being us in this case, to drive greater loyalty, greater service offerings, more product uh, diversity, all those things that drive a great retailer. Having these two revenue streams is really important to winning in retail when it gets very competitive. And right now, arguably, it's not that competitive. A lot of the states uh, in the US are still sort of limited license states, things like Illinois, but where things are really competitive, they will all end up as competitive markets. And we've seen that in Canada. Uh, one of the things I like to talk about is, uh, you know, Canada is the red ocean of retail in the sense that we are the most competitive market on the planet. Uh, in Alberta, where we have a lot of our stores, it is one dispensary per 8,000 people. Uh, that, is, that is similar to Colorado and Oregon in the US. But in addition, we have to compete with our own regulator. So that is, if we can do that and post two quarters of positive operating EBITDA, we're doing something right. And that is all to do with our tech platform. So we have this proprietary tech platform. It's not just one thing. And I'll talk about that a little bit later in, in the deck. It's not simply e-commerce or simply a loyalty program or simply digital uh, engagement in store. It's a lot of these different things. But what we know is it drives transact uh, typically they're worth about 45% more than a non-engaged customer. If we can keep them in our ecosystem, in our store and do things like recommendation engine, uh, sort of iPad detailing, understanding you know who that customer is, we can get it up to about you know 65% more lifetime value on average. And if we can complete that journey with something like a, a delivery option, it goes up to 85, 90%, 5% higher lifetime value. And this is what 
next gen retailers already knew. So we didn't invent this, but we looked at best of breed and we built it for cannabis and that it's proprietary to us. So for us, uh, that also obviously helps our stores perform better, but it also helps us when we acquire things. And so we view ourselves as an aggregator in the space. As I said, we have 86 stores in our Canadian uh, corporate owned portfolio. Uh, we are you know, aggressively expanding. We are aggressively expanding into US markets now through our strategic relationship with American Acres and our first store there um, that they've acquired. We've empowered them with all of our tech, all of our digital platform, that store will be a Fireflower brand store, and it's currently uh, the first one is in Palm Springs. We're very excited about that transitioning into the Fireflower banner network as our kind of uh, flagship uh, beachhead in the U.S. market. Uh, and we look forward to using our tech platform, our competitive advantage, to go and aggregate and roll up mom and pops and add them to our portfolio. Because we know that if we take our proven demonstrably proven model and our tech platform operating systems and apply them to mom and pops, we can make those mom and pops more valuable and we're going to roll them up. So, you know, that's a little bit about our, our, our platform. I'll return to that a little bit uh, as well. In terms of execution, again, 86 stores, we are the largest uh, retailer up in Canada. Uh, but along the way, as we built the company, we were also very fortunate to attract the attention of Alimentation Couchetard, which is the parent company of Circle K, and that is a $48 billion market cap of retailers. One of the largest retailers in the world with 16,000 uh, stores in 25 countries, uh, and we are their growth uh, engine in the cannabis space. So for them, uh, we are the, the cannabis growth engine, but we're also the tech and innovation engine because again, with our early acquisition of High Fire, we have had dedicated R&D resources that continue to sort of innovate our, our service offerings and additional revenue stream. So uh, they're excited by that and we're excited to have them as a strategic investor. We also operationalize our relationship uh, and there's some, some things I'll touch on when we get to that part of the deck. So um, we've got a strong balance sheet. We're you know fully cashed up. We have a lot of uh, growth capital to execute on our plan. And as I said, we have a strong strategic partner. So we feel that where we're at at the moment is uh, is is, we are part of, of, I would say, a lot of different stories in Canada at the moment. Uh, not all of them are good stories. And so we're very uh, we're delighted to be able to have this opportunity to talk about it ourselves because at I think the consensus estimates we're trading at you know, roughly 1.4 times this year's sales and consensus. So you can see that we're, uh, you know, we believe that we're significantly undervalued in, in that sense. So a good opportunity uh, you know, for investors to take a look. Well, aggressive growth plan, we've already talked about this. We have a couple of operating units so that it is important to understand. So we not only do uh, retail, we also have a wholesale business unit and that uh, that drives a lot of our growth as well. So for example, in smaller markets like Saskatchewan, which is a 1.3 million person uh, market in Canada, uh, we also are able to do wholesaling and that also adds to our bottom line, but it also allows us to do things like, you know, have uh, exclusive product offerings, white label and control brand programs, uh, we can do e-commerce to consumer there. So really um, this, this somewhat smaller market in Canada really was our template for how we will expand to the rest of the world. So we, in that market, again, we do full retail, we do delivery, we do control brands, we buy directly from licensed producers so we can control those costs and take advantage of uh, asymmetrical price compression on the production side. And if you look at where we find attractive in the US, we like, uh, we like Oregon, we like Colorado. Uh, those are places that are already competitive and we know that we can compete and make those businesses better if we can bring them into our system. Uh, California we like as well, which is why our, our um, beachhead is going to be in Palm Springs there. But uh, California arguably though, isn't competitive yet. It's got 700 licenses. It can grow to much larger volumes there. But I, I think for us looking at mature markets with uh, revenue generating cash flowing businesses that we take our system in and make them better is, is gonna be important. Another important thing about our operations is that we are multi-banner. And I think that this is an important part of our strategy because what we realized being data-driven, we started with Fire and Flower, we, um, we launched a lot of different stores and realized that our data tells us there's about 50 types of cannabis consumers and about eight to 10 of them are the ones that everyone is, uh, is going after. In this sense, uh, we realized that our brand only resonated with four of them. And with marketing, we could probably get to a fifth uh, demographic, but 
cannabis is really a very democratic substance. It is consumed by all walks of life, every part of the socioeconomic spectrum. So it was sort of unrealistic to expect any one brand to appeal to everyone. There is no one size fits all for cannabis. And so we branched out and expanded us, ourselves to multiple banners. So we have Friendly Stranger, we have uh, Fire and Flower, which is our mass premium brand. We have Happy Days, which is our value conscious brand. Uh, and we're going to continue in this multi-banner operational system because again, there are no one size fits all answers in cannabis in our view. Talked about open fields. Again, US market entry through American Acres. This is all on our deck and, and I encourage people to download it. We update it periodically. Uh, but this is really us uh, providing a strategic advantage to a US sort of satellite of ours so they could start operating. We are not plant touching. Uh, congruent with our Toronto Stock Exchange main board listing and our aspirations to, uh, we're on the NASDAQ track. We're not plant touching, but what we have is a proxy, American Acres, who we provided our IP in return for the right to purchase at a deep discount when, uh, when we are allowed to. And in that interim, they're going to go out and, uh, and acquire mom and pops, and we're going to make them into Fireflower branded stores and both our digital platform on top of it where we can extract uh, regulatorily compliant revenue. All right, so we talked. I talked about High Fire. I think it is worth understanding that High Fire again is not a third-party uh, piece of software. We believe that that is uh, is not the correct strategy. We invested early in technology because in Canada it was federally legal. That was the right move there. In the U.S. and the MSOs, uh, the business model really was get a license, preferably get a license in a, a protected market like an oligopoly and then extract value from that. But there really hasn't been a significant amount of infrastructure building because that wasn't the business model. But we knew that the end state of, of all retail is tech enabled. If you look at even like Walmart, you know, Kroger's, uh, things like Target, they all have huge digital platforms driving them. They view themselves as, as ad networks. All of those things here, if you look at sort of our tech stack here, it's not one product, it's four products. We have our High Fire IQ, which provides us independent uh, data revenue, data analytics revenue, 100% gross margin. We did 6.3 million of that revenue uh, in 2020, uh, and that is uh, continuing to be a source of growth for us. That's data and analytics. That's what people think about there. But what's interesting there is our insights are not simply point of sale insights. We are twinned with Cova point of sale system. We have a, a data agreement with BDSA in the US. It actually maps to our Spark Perks loyalty program. If you look at that, the second part of our stack there, that's our customer engagement program. So it's not knowing just what's sold. That's not useful business intelligence. We know who it was sold to, what type of consumer it was sold to, so we can actually get more meaningful insights there. Things like our retail and wholesale oper operations as well with Hi Fire One. This is things like e-commerce, delivery, in-store uh, you know, signage um, uh, and advertising. And high fire reach is our ability to get outside the consumer cannabis consumer sphere and, and aggregate more consumers into it. So high fire reach, our internal sort of ad uh, network is very similar to what Kroger's Walmart and Target have all built. Uh, and if you go to their website, you can see they view stores, media. This was always our goal and that's what we've executed on. So again, we're very far, far ahead of the curve in terms of the infrastructure required to win and we're starting to see that play out now. As I said, second quarter of positive operating EBITDA under our belt and, uh, and more to come. So we've talked about High Fire Platform, um, again, our database uh, and analytics package and the various products that we have here. I think an important kind of maybe final note on that is to think about High Fire is again, dedicated computer scientists and, data, you know, and computer engineers and data scientists that are constantly innovating, constantly. So we get comments sometimes, uh, people ask me about our SGNA, and my point is, what other company do you know that has a dedicated subsidiary to technical R&D? You know, and listen, if people don't believe that that's a competitive advantage, that tech somehow doesn't matter, that's you know, one way to look at it. Our view is strongly that innovation is going to be the key to retail success. And having that constant, you know, we're creating these products constantly to find new revenue streams. High Fire IQ, we launched uh, you know, more than a year ago. Things like our High Fire Reach uh, you know, advertising platform, we only launched two quarters ago. So expect more innovation, more you know, uh, dedicated digital product research and commercialization from that on, uh, from us, because that's our DNA. 
Our Spark Perk members program, I think we're approaching 300,000 now. I think we, we publicly talked about a quarter of a million, but that continues to grow. Again, they're very, very, uh, very, very valuable customers to us. And the last sort of piece here, I know we're running out of time, and I do want to answer questions, is talking about our strategic relationship with uh, Circle K and their parent company. Currently, they have 19.9% equity stake in the company, and they have uh, an ability to increase their ownership through warrant structure, which brings in new uh, growth capital for us. So, so far, I believe it's about 75 million they've invested in the company. Uh, if you look at the other tranches of warrants, it brings in about 300 million of growth capital over the next sort of 30 months to help us get there uh, and expand. And that's sort of the financial side of it. I think more importantly is looking at how our operational relationship continues to evolve. So just quickly then, uh, oh, okay, so uh, just quickly then, um, if you look at our operational uh, intertwinement, we've started a pilot program uh, in two of our two Circle K stores. We actually have co-located smaller footprint, five, 600 square foot uh, fire and flowers sort of express and select stores in there. So that's an example of our strategic partner using their existing real estate footprint to monetize it in more effect, effect, effective ways. And if you look at how we can expand that to other markets, it's, it's, it's kind of a no brainer, but it requires some, uh, some thought. The other thing is, you know, for example, even outside the cannabis sphere, Circle K uh, currently carries fire and flower gift cards in 300 locations outside of the cannabis uh, industry. So it's an example of how we're working together already. We have a shared services real estate agreement with, uh, with Circle K where we utilize their real estate infrastructure to find good locations. Uh, you know, you can't, you can't sort of beat, uh, you, should, you should align yourself with partners who really know what they're doing in terms of real estate and, and undeniably they do. And I'd say look for more of these kinds of catalysts in our relationship going forward. So I think that's all the time I have for the, the deck flip. I'll leave it uh, at that and uh, and I believe open it up for some questions. Awesome, Trevor. Appreciate that, man. Super, super interesting insights there. Uh, I do have a couple of questions that have come into the chat. I have one or two as well. You mentioned you're not plant touching, um, but you are in a way, uh, you have a, a satellite company, I believe was the word you used, a satellite subsidiary. Uh, that that is, uh, and then he. All, oh, sorry. Do you want to say something to that? Well, yeah, it's not a subsidiary, right? It's so it's a, it's okay. a third party company. We have a strategic relationship with them, and that we've licensed them all of our IP, our high fire platform. In a sense, in a sense, we weaponize them with the best of breed. <laughs> uh, in return, we have the right to acquire them at FMV at a deep discount when legal. So we we are we are working with them, but we don't own them yet. And that's, that's important for the non I like that. Weaponize them. That's a good one. Uh, that's a good one, Trevor. All right. Do you have a slide on your income statement? Uh, is that in your deck? Uh, it should be, I think we have, if not, it's on the website. So yeah, we've got kind of financial uh, information should be available. Cool. Yeah. You can reach it fireandflower.com. Uh, awesome. I, I have a question, uh, if you don't mind, uh, on your recent earnings, you mentioned, uh, you were working, uh, on a potential NASDAQ uplisting. Uh, I'm curious if you're able to give us any insights, timeline uh, into that. Yeah, no, absolutely. So we have, uh, uh, we continue to make progress on that. Uh, we obviously want it to happen as fast as, as, as possible. Uh, we're in our sort of, uh, we're in the rounds of answering questions. So really it is in NASDAQ's court. Um, you know, I think it's measured in months, not quarters. That's probably the only guidance <laughs> I can provide on that one. Uh, and I would say the most important indicator is next week we have our annual general meeting in which the key resolution being voted on is the ability to uh, to do the share consolidation that would be required for a NASDAQ listing. So that's the kind of a measurable uh, next week. We will have all the structural things we need to complete that. And then it's over to NASDAQ and just making sure we answer the questions on things like American Acres and making sure we're not plant touching. So. Fantastic. Trevor, I've always loved Fire and Flower. I know I read an article earlier this year saying you uh, were one of the five stocks to buy in a crash uh, in the cannabis industry. And I think we all just heard why. Um, so with that, Trevor, uh, if you have any last thoughts you can put into like 10 seconds, uh, I'll let you go. Other than that, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you. Listen, I think we're, uh, again, I would, I would look at people to, to keep watching our story. Stay tuned to the news that's coming out. We're going to continue to execute in our plan. And uh, I think we're probably the most attractive we valued of all of our competitors in the space. So I'll leave you with that thought. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, Trevor. Thanks again, my friend. I appreciate you being here with us. Be well.
Thanks, Elliot. Bye-bye. All right. Awesome. That was Fire and Flower FFLWF on the OTC. We did uh, get a little bit of insight into a potential NASDAQ uplisting in months, uh, not quarters. Uh, love that company. They are making huge moves and they are backing it up uh, with a solid grounding of technology. Uh, and, and they're weaponizing. <laughs> I love that. Weaponizing. Uh, we're moving right along, though. So that was an awesome presentation from Trevor. Uh, we have one of the newer companies. We did have Flora Growth are on earlier, and I think they're the newest. However, Lynn Tannenbaum is here with me now. Welcome, Lynn, to talk about one of the newer entrants to the NASDAQ cannabis space. Uh, with that, how are you, sir? All good. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Uh, you've been a great friend and a loyal attendee to Benzinga conferences. It's always good to have you up here with us. Uh, with that, sir, I'm just going to let you take it away and tell us what AFC is up to. Awesome. Well, thank you. And good morning. Uh, Advanced Flower Capital is a nationally recognized lender strategically positioned at the center of the cannabis ecosystem. Since gaining our public listing this year, symbol AFCG, we're the leading lender in the cannabis industry and the only legally listed lender on NASDAQ with 13 active loans across 14 states and regulatory approval, which is not so easy to get, in a number of key states. Next page, let's go. So we have a great team and the team really is with our three partners, myself, John Calico, who I knew in high school and college, who is a fourth generation real estate family and manages several billion dollars of real estate loans and Robin Tannenbaum, my excellent partner and wife who runs Origination. So when you think about the market itself, it, and, and I know you've seen this throughout the Benzinga conference, it's really amazing how fast it's growing, but this doesn't even include, you know, it will include, but doesn't even include the great states of New York, which we'll get into and other states which are, are coming online. And I actually think that the growth is really understated. I think it's gonna be even better than this. And where, where has the market share been, right? It's been in states like California, Oregon, Washington, and then started leaking into what we call the limited license states. We do not currently lend to California, Oregon, Washington, and Colorado. Now, I don't mind Colorado. Colorado's okay. But those are unlimited licenses and a very deep black market, actually. And so what we really focus on are those states with limited licenses that we can quantify the supply and demand equation, we can give value to the licenses themselves and secure secure by them. And we'd spend a lot of time understanding how each state is moving. And we're gonna go into that a little bit later, giving you some insight to some of our state-by-state -state research, which we really uh, dive into seriously. And on the next slide there is. So, so two of the states we do lend to, uh, Ohio and New Jersey, we can talk a little about them. So Ohio is interesting. I think Ohio ultimately goes wreck. Uh, Ohio has, a little over 60 dispensaries. You can't own more than five. So it's a true limited license state. And there's two different types of cultivation licenses, a C1 license and a C2 license. So a C1 license, the big one, obviously, C1 is greater than two, and, and C2 license being the smaller one. Um, in a state that's starving for flour, you're talking about average wholesale flour, probably around $3,200, which is great. So this state, we are invested both in the dispensary side with one company, cultivation side with another company. But the state's constantly changing um, and just additionally added 71 licenses. So we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, how that how that dynamic changes um, and how that regulatory changes. So maybe that maybe it's better to be in cultivation right now and a little bit less in dispensaries. There's more competitions coming, but it doesn't really matter because in, in Ohio, cannabis continues to be growing rapidly and uh, recreational will take that much bigger. Now, New Jersey, of course, just goes rack. We think it's a billion dollar build out in New Jersey, and we're pleased to announce a $22 million loan to, to a New Jersey company to build that out, supported by a really, a really great company. Now to lend in New Jersey wasn't so easy. <laughs> to lend in New Jersey, we literally had to go through the entire licensing process. Uh, think about it almost like a casino license. So in order to lend, you have to go through a, the licensing process yourself as a lender, and then get certified by the state to be a lender in that state. So Ohio Board of Pharmacy was one, New Jersey was, was another. These are some of the real barriers to entry for other people trying to make loans in these states. Now, Michigan and New York, the reason these are on, these are on the chart is because I believe New York has an almost unlimited license state, but with, with limitations to the real estate and locale 
approving that cultivation facility or approving that dispensary is going to be a lot like the curve we saw in Michigan. And Michigan's a great state, but we do lend to Michigan. Um, it is unlimited licenses. In other words, you could stack up the cultivation licenses to make a bigger cultivation, but the growth has been really great. Um, and, pop, and as it went rack, I mean, the, pop, the, the demand has been also very strong. New York is just beginning. As soon as they get the regulatory environment set, as soon as they issue their licenses, we think it's a $5 billion build out over a couple of years. So we're gonna see a massive demand of capital. When I talk about AFCG's actionable pipeline uh, and how big that is, it right now doesn't include New York, but we expect New York to be a big piece of that business. So how, what's going on with the federal overlay? I mean, this is probably the number one question asked by our shareholders and potential shareholders of our public company. And look, we do see Safe Banking Act passing in the next year or two, um, probably next year, since Schumer decided to take federal, federal legalization first, and we think that fails. Um, I'm not quite sure why Schumer's doing that, because what's very important to all of these states, especially his state of New York, is taxes, right? This is why the states really want to keep it to themselves. They want their own regulatory authorities. They want their own testing. They want their own cultivation and they want their own sales. But safe banking is really great for our customers uh, because we need more places to deposit. We need more places to pick up cash. We need more places to stop charging ridiculous fees for, for, for uh, debit cards. And really Visa and MasterCard is not available. And so I hope Safe Banking Act passes. I think states will ultimately pass more in a three to five year time frame uh, as, as uh, the regulatory unfolds. And so we really have that timeline to uh, help these companies grow and position for this rapidly growing industry. So what is our market opportunity and how, what's it, what, what does it create? As, as you well know, right? This, it's very difficult to invest in cannabis, but getting easier and easier as more and more companies can do it and are comfortable with it. Part of that was the Biden administration, the attorney general signing a piece of paper saying that the federal government will respect states' rights. So that limited supply of capital, there is more capital coming in, which is really great for the cannabis operators, but it's not anywhere close to the amount of capital necessary. Up until we came along, uh, there were some loans, but IIPR and others dominated sale leaseback. So sale leaseback was the top form of financing. And now it can it's going to continue to be some sale leasebacks, but it's also going to be uh, loans. And you'll probably hear about that later on our Benzinga panel. Uh, we have two sale leaseback firms and two uh, loan, loan uh, originators. And we're going to talk a little bit about the differences. But what are the market challenges? The state-by-state -state regulations, uh, the very a very complicated market to really understand the changes in supply and demand dynamics in the state. Who's going to win? Who's not going to win? Ultimately, the smaller companies are going to be at a disadvantage because of cost of goods sold and because of scale itself. Uh, so you really have to understand vertical operators versus non-vertical operators. I know I'm going into the details, but this is a cannabis conference, so I'm going quickly. And what we want to do as AMC is provide those opportunistic solutions. We want to think about what is the indifference curve to our customer base and how do we satisfy them? Do they need more equity? Do they need more, uh, you know, revolver capital? Do they need build out help? Uh, we've built a lot of that. We've helped finance a lot of the cultivation facilities around these states. So we know how they're built. We know, we know how the size, we know the scale, we know the cost, we know the efficiencies, the light density, the fertigation systems and everything. We have on-site construction managers and real estate uh, locators that can help our customers with their builds and to say, well, you know, maybe you need two dry rooms thinking about that philosophy, not one. So I think going into the, to the details and helping partner with our borrowers is really essential part of AFC's business. So let's talk about what everyone wants to talk about is, how, you know, how many deals do you actually look at and, and what happens to them, right? So we've looked at over $5 billion of deals. We've thrown out about a third of those deals in California, Oregon, Washington. And so you have two thirds left. And then you know, you're looking for companies with strong operators in limited license states that understand their business and knows how to grow it, knows how to execute on that plan. So experience is really important. Um, and business plan is really important, right? Are you just one or two dispensaries? We're probably not going to lend to you. We really do want that cultivation or cultivation dispensary mix. Of course, a few dispensaries in Pennsylvania, that'll be amazing. And because they're all amazing in Pennsylvania, it's pretty much hard to miss in that state. 
Uh, and then so you funnel all those great deals down. They go to our investment committee. We have 19 people going up to, I think, 25 by the end of the year, maybe 30. And so we're set up in origination, origination support, investment committee, uh, underwriting teams, portfolio monitoring, portfolio management, every team different, every team in the handoff. And so far, we've, we've invested about $200 million and uh, we have a full pipeline that we're converting. So who are we lending to and what are we lending? So we lend first lien debt. I don't know why second lien debt. We haven't done any second lien debt, but we're, we're open to it. But we're really good at construction loans. We're good at uh, the construction financing. We give a revolver. We draw it over time. We help with that construction. We understand how the state-by-state -state dynamics work. We understand your phase one, phase two, phase zero build outs. And we, and we partner with you in, in growing the company. And we can, we, the nice thing is we don't do small loans. We're not doing loans under 10 million. We'll leave that to other people because it doesn't make sense for us. Remember, we're a NASDAQ listed lender. So we have to do our anti-money laundering. We have to do background checks on principles. We have to do all of these important things when you loan money and that costs money too. And so we help institutionalize our partners. Uh, and, and we also, de we deal with everyone from the great, the big ones, the big multi-state operators, the one or two state vertical operators, or the ones with a track record uh, that are building in a new state that's a limited license state and that we can get behind that management team. So why us? We're a leading lender. We partner with our customers. We leverage our relationships. We have a repeatable institutional process. It's not just about lending money. It's about helping build businesses. We love the industry and we love participating in that ecosystem. Uh, as I said, I built my other company, which is a $5 billion lender in the middle market. And we're using all of that knowledge base when I built the first company where we did almost a billion dollars a year in the middle market at, in cannabis, where we're really providing that institutional approach. And for that, that's, that's, that, that's my presentation. Thank you so much, Len. Super information, a lot of information about the markets in general that you lend to in there. So uh, I learned a lot. I'm not going to lie. I have some questions for you. I think we have one in the chat here from Jim. Uh, but what is your thought on M&A in the industry? Uh, how do you view what's going on in, in consolidation right now? Well, I think the, I think we're in an M&A cycle here. I think it's going to be two years. You're seeing everything being bought. Uh, every month, rather, every month, a bit different MSO buys something in the state where they're <laughs> filling in their, their overall infrastructure. And you saw a lot bought in Pennsylvania. You're seeing flurries of activity in different states too, right? You saw uh, Florida, the number of purchases, Pennsylvania, number of purchases, all in a flurry. And so I think that will continue. Uh, but there will be 15 top MSOs because a lot of the states have structural parts to it, like Ohio that we talked about, where no one can own over five dispensaries, right? That allows for multiple competitors. And mo many states do want that competition. And so I, I really do think there's gonna be 15 big ones. And then the small ones either are gonna have to try to be one of the big ones or sell to one of them. Well, we'll see who those big ones are once uh, once it all settles down. But uh, I guess in parallel discussion to those potential 15 large MSOs, where does AFCG end up in five years' time? Well, uh, five years in cannabis is like thirty-five years. So I, 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 I think every year in cannabis is like a dog year. Um, so I look, I, I'm, I have my two and three-year view, and what we look forward to is loaning money to half of the top MSOs, hundred to two hundred million dollar checks, and capturing the arbitrage. Like, unfortunately for them, they're listed in Canada, and so their cost of capital is somewhere between eleven and thirteen percent. Uh, up for them, and we get where our cost of capital should be around six or seven percent, uh, given our debt cost of capital. So, if I can give them 200 million, borrow in the US at, at six, seven percent, and, and lend them and capture that spread, drop it down to my shareholders, I think that's a really good business model. At the same time, over the next two years, you'll see us continue to invest in, in where I think are there are targets. So, we talk to you know the heads of acquisitions at, at many of the top MSOs in terms of what they want to buy. And they often want to buy our customers. And the reason they want to buy our customers is because after we diligence them, do quality of earnings and help them professionalize their infrastructure, they make very easy acquisition targets. And so that's really great for, I don't know, Verano, Cresco, Terrasend, as they, as they go hunting. If they know AFC is a lender, they know the company's clean. They know the company has some infrastructure to deal with an institutional borrower. 
and they can jump in there and pay the price that they want to pay. I really like that, Lynn. That's that's a super interesting point. Um, so, and it sounds to me like with that six seven percent, you are looking ahead to a federal legalization model. Uh, you know, and you know those rates aren't just absurd. Um, so, you know, talk about a risk. You know, what does AFC? Uh, I guess what what do you worry about? What what's a risk to your business? So actually the six, 7%, I think is my cost of capital today. I think it goes down to 4% with a legalization model, but nice. uh, remember we, we're legal. We're like, we're NASDAQ listed. You can buy our stock and um, we, NASDAQ wouldn't have listed us had we not done it legally. So if you're thinking about that, whether I did a baby bond offering or I did a, a 144A debt offering, the first one of the space was just done by IPR and they raised 300 million of unsecured five-year money at five and a half percent, and that's trading at 4.8%. So look, that's they're much larger than us. Um, they probably will have a slightly higher credit rating than us, but that's a, that's an idea of a cost of capital that we can you know, think about achieving. Uh, as for, what was your other question? Oh, the that. risk to your business. Sorry, oh, the no, yeah. The biggest risk is easy. The biggest risk is easy. It's states changing their mind, right? But, and, um, when, when Illinois, we're not big in Illinois, but Illinois decides, you know, another 110 dispensaries to social equity or uh, somebody changes in Florida, we're going to see 50, looks like we're going to see 15 more cultivation licenses. So a cultivation license in Florida, which is an amazing license in a terrific state, we do live here, uh, 550,000 medical patients could have traded for $40 million recently. My guess is that's going to drop back to the 25, $30 million range because now you're getting 15 more competitive, potential competitors. Now, yeah, they won't get online till 2023, but they'll come and in, in one of the best states in the country. So those changes, like nobody knows how many licenses, whether it's, whether a state's gonna, like Texas is gonna increase the, the THC content. Looks like they're stuck at 1% from half a percent, which makes no sense, but it could have been te that Texas was about to open. Now it looks like it's not, but you just never know. And so that's the biggest, not risk to the business, but something we have to keep on top of is those state by state regulatory dynamics. Fantastic, Lynn. Uh, really interesting presentation. You are obviously, and, and it seems like, you know, there's obviously the IIPRs of the space, but uh, not a whole lot of companies doing it as successfully as you. Uh, so you. yeah, I, I love the story. I love what you all are offering. Again, the NASDAQ AFCG. Lynn, would you like to leave our audience with any final thoughts here? No, but please, please you listen and, and uh, I hope you continue listening, watching our quarterly earnings reports and, and listening to our story. But thanks for having us on Benzinga. Of course, Len. Thanks again for being here, my friend. We'll see you soon. All yeah. right. Awesome. So that was AFC Gamma, Advanced Flower Capital. Uh, they are newer to the NASDAQ. Uh, awesome company. I believe we have a couple minutes here. Uh, so I want to get a little bit more audience participation if we can. So I'm going to open up our second poll Y'all, which company are you most excited to hear from today? If you want to be involved in these slides and these polls, I should say, hit that QR code, answer the most answers, get prizes. Y'all, lifetime subscription to BZ Pro, options newsletter, uh, a couple, another newsletter that we're offering. Um, please participate. We want you all uh, to have fun with us. So grab an answer uh, here, Canopy Growth, Charlotte's Web. I'm pretty excited to hear from my guy, Brian McLaren, right after this, Zone Properties. Uh, you know, we have a ton, or just a packed agenda. So I'm not really sure how you can even come up with one answer. Uh, but take a picture with that QR code there. Give us uh, answers on these Slido polls as they come up. Participation is key to winning the prizes at the end of each day. So with that, uh, I will leave that up for a couple minutes longer here. Um, I'm excited about the next one. Let's go ahead and bring Javier on. What is up, my friend? I, I threw what? you on there without any uh, without a uh, uh, advanced warning. No worries. We're always ready to go. That's a Benzinga way. <laughs> I love it. You are always ready to go. Everybody, if you don't know Javier Hase, I don't know where you've been, uh, but he is the managing director of our editorial staff here at Benzinga for the cannabis industry. Uh, his, you, ha you just have an immense amount of knowledge, connections, and a network in this space. Uh, so I'm super thrilled uh, to turn it over to you Thanks. for this next piece of content. With that, I'll leave this poll going for the next few minutes, y'all. Uh, but with that, Javier, uh, I will throw it to you, my friend. 
Definitely. Thank you very much, Elliot. Uh, next up, we have uh, Zone Properties. Uh, their CEO, Brian McLaren, is joining us. Zone Properties trades on the OTC under the ticker ZDPY or ZDPY. Brian, how are you? Good, good, Javier. And good shout out to our, our Canadian brethren with the Z. Love it. <laughs> it I find it, it's, it's easier, right? It's confusing when you say Z, you don't know if it's C, like a C or a That's Z. Right. Z. That's right. That's Clearly, you know, so that no one has trouble finding your ticker. Z-D-P-Y. Brian, tell us a little bit about you and a lot about Zone Properties. What do you do? Yeah, thanks, Javier. Great to be here. And man, I've been coming to the Benzingas for many years now. Always great con. I think he froze on us. Uh, you're muted, Javi. As a good moderator, he'll be back. He'll be back. Yeah, so I'm sure he'll be back shortly. And if um, not, Brian, maybe with no video, Brian, or some video. Yeah. Hey guys, can can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, That's so pause now. Now you get to just hear the beauty of my voice <laughs> instead of stare at me for the next 15 minutes, right? Um, so yeah, great to be here guys was just saying phenomenal to see the, the audience at, at Benzinga just exploding, especially in the cannabis space. Uh, Brian McLaren here, uh, chairman and CEO with zoned properties. We're a Scottsdale, Arizona based real estate company, core focus on regulated markets, regulated cannabis. Uh, and in a nutshell, what we do is, is provide solutions for developing real estate in these highly regulated, highly complex markets. So zoned properties at a 10,000 foot view really have, have two main purposes of the business. Mm -hmm. um, we, we own a portfolio of real estate that's been invested and developed. Um, primarily our, our portfolio is out here in the Arizona market and it's leased out to vertical licensed cannabis companies. Um, and on that side of our business, uh, the portfolio acquisitions ownership, um, we're just wrapping up a pretty exciting expansion with our primary tenant out here. It's going to be a, a little over an $8 million expansion at one of the large scale cultivation sites. So um, I'm sure we'll circle back to that, Javier, but that'll have a, a meaningful and material impact on our business. So, I mean, one of the questions that, that a lot of people have, and I know why I had in the past, is um, how are you not a REIT? <laughs> yep, probably. And, the I mean, most... I don't know how else to phrase it. Like, how are you different from a REIT? Because it, it's complex. Your, your business model has many uh, different parts and always moving parts, right? So, please explain. Yeah, great. That's probably one of the most important distinguishing factors of zone properties. So... When it comes to large scale real estate companies, there's really two forks in the road. You can either go the kind of capital financing route, which is what your real estate trusts are, providing really important, meaningful financing and capital to, to industries. And for mm -hmm. cannabis, tremendously important, right? In an industry that's tough to get capital access. Um, and then you can, there's the other fork in the road. So that's the real estate development and services side. So zone properties is very intentionally down that second route. We're very intentionally not a REIT. So impacts there on taxes and financial distributions. But on the services side, what we're trying to do at zoned properties is provide all of these solutions to operators. And when it, when it comes to a really complex industry like cannabis, every single operational piece of this industry requires real estate. And what we've found within the legalization movement is one of the biggest barriers for these operators and their real estate is developing these sites, everything from finding them in the first place, navigating zoning and permitting at the local level. This stuff is changing all the time. As Len was just saying, AFC Gamma, you know, these, the changes in regulations happen on a, sometimes on a whim at the state level and the local level, yeah. and that trickles down and ripples to impact the real estate. So at Zone Properties for the better part of the past decade, 
We've been through this process ourselves as we've grown our own portfolio, which is a great foundation of tangible assets and cash flow for the company. But we've been able to build upon that with the services and development side for lots of clients and third party operators across the country. We've been in almost 15 states and have been very active all the way from state level legalization and how it impacts what real estate can do. So for example, New York, New Jersey, opt in, opt out structures, and then all the way down to the local level. So really trying to be an ambassador for a lot of these local planners. How do you actually develop community changes like this in a good way that benefits everyone? Um, and then probably just last, last point, I know we'll dive into each of these areas, Javier, but in the way we've approached building out those services, we've built these subdivisions as part of zoned properties. And we see these subdivisions as the most important services for real estate development. And these have been voids in the marketplace. We built them because we couldn't find them anywhere ourselves. And now yeah. we're, it's an exciting time to be able to provide all of these services to lots of groups across the country. Indeed. Now, um, how has your model evolved, right? I, I know you're, you're in a stage that you like to call your, your 2.0, right? So what was the, the initial goal for, for zone properties and how did it evolve? And, and this happened on its own? Was it intentional? Yeah, yeah. So, so somewhat unintentional, Javier. So if we're looking at maybe kind of the original zone properties, um, 1.0, this was mm -hmm. back in 2014. The company was just starting, really focused on kind of what you might call bird dogging real estate properties. So looking at where the hockey puck is moving, right? Old Wayne Gretzky, you know, famous quote, rather than where the puck yeah. is. The challenge with that model is the industry is so volatile. And at the time, we were probably a little early to go out and be acquiring things at risk. And we've built a really strong portfolio from a bunch of our original targets, but we mm -hmm. had to pivot. So really in 2015, 2016, we started seeing all these voids in the marketplace. Brokerages weren't working with cannabis. It was really tough to figure out how to interface with the local communities. There was no good data related to real estate. You know, the really big data companies weren't touching cannabis at all. They weren't providing information that helped you navigate commercial real estate. So we made this pivot when we saw those gaps in the marketplace because so many of, of the people in our network, whether they were founders and CEOs of plant touching operators or ancillary kind of distribution companies, everyone was stumbling upon the real estate. They always, yeah. they always asked for two things, financing and help us get past the barriers to getting our site zoned, permitted, and up and running. Mm -hmm. um, so we basically started yeah. filling these voids. <laughs> not, not, yeah, not easy, by the way. It's not like it's yeah. not a challenge, right? Like they just asked for two things. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So the, I think the great thing on the first one is we've built relationships with enough enough financers. We, we know all the REITs and very happily connect clients and operators to those financing sources. And for zone properties, as we start to really succeed at scaling our growth with our subdivisions, our services, we will very much intend to return to investing and growing our portfolio. But for now, I think the real opportunities for zone properties for our investors is these sub growth divisions like our franchise project, our commercial brokerage, which is now fully licensed in-house and owned by zone properties. And, and specifically the scalability opportunity for some of our, our software and data property technology, our prop tech projects. Mm -hmm. Those are things that can really scale both for diversified revenue streams and cash flow, but also just servicing this industry. You actually mentioned um, a little bit about, uh, you know, property technology. I know you had a, a, an interesting uh, deal. I don't know if you, it's something you can mention or not yet, if it's public or not, if I'm just yeah. maybe throwing you under the bus here. <laughs> no, I mean, and, uh, Javier, you know, I love you guys and I always like to bring some exclusive, exclusive news and updates through Benzinga. So we've only put some very, very uh, vague breadcrumbs out there. Um, and excited to kind of share some more detail with you today here. So 
Pay attention, investors. Z G P Y. <laughs> you're about to hear an exclusive. Yeah. So, um, and this was this is all part of kind of multi-year pivot we just talked about, Javier, on on growing these services at scale. So, the property technology platforms are really exciting. Um, one of the most important voids in the marketplace is what we call green zone properties. So green zones are these, these available parcels and buildings within each state and city and town that really strict zoning and permitting regulations, all these little discussions, debates and battles happening in city councils and townships across the country, they make it really difficult to find property to begin with. And your options as an operator to accomplish that, that challenge are basically to do it by hand. You find hopefully a good land use attorney or a good commercial broker. Um, there's really no, there, has, there have been groups that have tried to solve this problem with no real viable solution we've ever been able to use. So we do it by hand, we charge hourly, we charge commission based, but mm -hmm. over the past few years, I've been searching everywhere for an opportunity to build out a efficient, effective and scalable platform to solve this problem. And finally, about a year ago, we started having meaningful conversations with a company called Zonomics. And Matthew Player, who is the founder and CEO of Zonomics, and you can check them out, great platform, zonomics.com. And what a great synergy there between the names of the companies, yeah. right? Zone Properties yeah. and Zonomics. Was it on purpose or, I mean, is it just because you do similar stuff? Total coincidence. Um, cool. Yeah, and, like and just, probably serendipity, right? I mean, we're both, both mm -hmm. Matthew and I are kind of urban planning, zoning nerds. We like to solve these problems. And for a long time, he's been building this kind of data as a service, software as a service, so DAS SaaS platform, but his platform never touched cannabis. So it was something that he had a bit of a blind spot. After many conversations, we decided this is a huge opportunity zoned properties has some investment capital to put into the deal so we're gonna we're gonna provide the partnership with just under a hundred thousand dollars of investment capital and matthew and his team at zonomics are going to take everything in their platform all their proprietary software and data and skin that for a cannabis solution and our our hope here is that we're going to be able to provide a nationwide platform for brokers, land use attorneys, appraisers, developers, cannabis companies to be able to plug in an address or plug in a municipality or state and start to access these green zones. Um, and so that that opportunity, just as an operator directly, probably the most one of the most exciting things we have going on at Zone Properties that can really diversify and scale our, our services and our revenue in a, in a pretty meaningful way. Definitely, that's very exciting. Um, I was thinking one of my favorite uh, things about your story is, is how you went from, from investor to CEO at, at Zone Properties. And, and the reason why this excites me especially is because I think you're the right person to break down the investment case a little bit. You know, I like to ask this to every one of our, our guests on every show on Cannabis Hour, on Cannabis Insider, on our conferences. You know, what's the investment case if, if, if you had a, a minute to present it, right? And, and from that, maybe share a little bit about your story of why you went from investor to CEO here. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Javier, great. It's, it's something I haven't talked about too widely, not because it's not important, just because I'm so focused and passionate about the business. Mm -hmm. um, but how, how I entered the cannabis industry kind of formally, not kind of previous legacy experience, but was really as a real estate investor. So have been doing real estate development investing for most of my academic and professional career and spent most of my grad school career exploring how to develop value-driven real estate in, in local communities um, and at scale. So um, saw the cannabis industry th through a few um, individuals in my network as an opportunity to invest in and was one of the original investors in zoned properties. So the company itself has a really core tight investor base. There are about 30 individuals or individual offices that kind of funded um, the original investment round that we used to uh, acquire and develop the original portfolio of properties. 
Um, and then just really saw the opportunity, he was so passionate about what we could do with the zone properties model. I stepped in as interim CEO back in 2014 and started talking with the investors in our, in our network, in our company about what zone properties could become mid and long term as a real value play. Um, how to really unlock this incredibly challenging formula of developing and investing in real estate and in regulated industries. Um, and now that's what we've built now nearly, a, you know, almost eight years later, um, an opportunity for investors to access one of the adjacent sides of this market, certainly real opportunity. And I as well, individually, I'm an investor in some of these um, direct operating cannabis companies but I love the real estate side. Um, and it's, in, it's really just incredibly challenging to go do a direct real estate investment. It's, it's mm -hmm. something that has a lot of risk. You got to make sure a, a team like Zone Properties is there mitigating the risk and enhancing the value. Um, and then we started exploring all these other ancillary services like the property technology stuff, like our franchise investment um, and partner open door dispensaries that we've talked about before. Um, mm -hmm. And I just, I think we position zone properties as a, a very exciting and diversified opportunity for investors to deploy capital. Uh, mm -hmm. And when we're ready, which I think will probably be in the quite near future, I'll be back to discuss this with you. Um, maybe drop some more exclusive news in the upcoming months and quarters, but I think we've really positioned Zone to do a large-scale healthy capital raise um, that'll protect our. I, I am, by the way, you know, just fixed on on getting some more exclusives out of you. I know um, <laughs> you're also raising some money uh, for the open door. <laughs> yep, <we're... laughs> I'm just doubting you here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I like to I like to build quietly and then come out with real concrete disclosure and updates, but. Yeah, I mean, we're so our, our subdivisions really between the advisory, the brokerage, our franchise project, our data prop tech projects. Um, you know, we're helping positioning these partners to do really well. Um, and Zoned is in an opportunity to take equity stakes in these subdivisions. So it makes a lot of sense for our team to be involved. But Open Door uh, is a national retail dispensary brand and franchise concept led by a powerhouse international franchiser, Catherine Blackwell, and her partner, Chelsea Mulligan, just an amazing team, have made a lot of progress since they launched at the start of this year. And, and I think we're going to be in a position where we're going to help them do some kind of an initial private capital raise. And the whole concept there for anyone who hasn't heard us talk about this before is that Zone Properties... Um, not just as an investor in that franchise company and can convert its investment into potentially a 33% equity stake in the future, which we at this point, given the progress, very have a strong likelihood of looking at converting that equity. Um, but also we get to be the real estate arm. So we have a, a, a very direct risk mitigated uh, opportunity to deploy capital into the real estate that's connected to each franchise location. Um, either through acquisitions and leasing or tenant improvement investments. Uh, and we get to see under the hood, right? It's not a, yeah. a paper due diligence. We know exactly what's going on with those pieces of real estate. Definitely. And, you know, I know we had some more news to discuss, but we have two minutes and I want to address yeah. something else. So make sure, you know, what, people watching, make sure to go to Benzinga.com slash cannabis later today to learn about one more exclusive out of uh, Zone Properties. Uh, it's a project, an $8 million project. That's all I'm gonna say for now. Uh, but looking at your assets, and this is something that I was asking you um, earlier this week, right? And, and I was just looking at your, your market cap, at your valuation, and, and just looking at your assets and, and your filings, and, and you have real estate for say 15 million bucks. Um, you own and lease property for, I don't know, like 8 million. You make uh, top line revenue of over half a million. So like, why the valuation? Why does it not, like, what am I missing there? What, why is it not really reflecting your, your hard assets at least and, and fundamentals? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think Javier, a big part of it is we're really that zone 2.0 kind of evolution of our company you mentioned earlier. We're really just starting to tell that story. 
I mean, in this session and, and the previous Benzinga event earlier this year, we've just started to talk about what we've spent now almost eight years building. So um, we like to be very conservative and concrete with our, with our disclosure, with our press releases, so investors see real news, real promises kind of delivered upon, not just blue sky. But frankly, we have to do a better job telling our story. And, and that's why we're, we're here today and going to be participating in, in more events moving forward. We've been really under the radar for the past few years. You know, we 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 bought back in 32% of our outstanding shares in 2019. We yeah. repivoted that tangible portfolio in 2020, finishing up that eight million dollar project. You know, by the end of Q2, which is going to almost add, I think it's just just below five cents per share to our top line. Um, so we're really building that tangible base along with these big services and excited to share updates and yeah, definitely check Benzinga.com uh, slash cannabis as, as we move forward here. And sorry right. everyone for the, for the lack of video, but uh, glad uh, you could hear yeah, me. Okay. We, we miss your face. We will see you next time. I'm sure. By the way, zone property up 36% today. Yeah. I Champion, think we're starting Ryan. to see. Damn. Starting to see some <laughs> reflection there, guys, for sure, and telling the story. So thanks to you guys for help giving us the platform. Thank you both for this wonderful conversation. Brian, thanks for uh, unveiling some news here. Javier, thanks for digging it out of him. Uh, <laughs> it was a great discussion. Brian, oh, thank you so much. Punching. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> you always you know Javi's going for the exclusive. Uh, we, we always know that. Uh, Brian. Cool. Yeah thanks. yeah, thanks again for being here, Brian. Appreciate it. ZDPY, zoneproperties.com, the open door. Uh, really cool stories uh, and obviously on an uptick. Uh, so thanks again, my friend. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you. Be well. Javier, we'll see you soon, my friend. Yeah. Excited about the yeah. next presentation. Um, me too. Me too. I do want to say people are very excited about Canopy Growth. Uh, yep. I want to give a, one more poll before we bring our next presenter on. Cannabis is known to help treat which of the following? Epilepsy, chronic pain, multiple sclerosis, chemotherapy side effects, that's, or that's all of the one. above? <laughs> Y'all, uh. don't, get, don't get this wrong. <laughs> don't get this wrong. You know what, Sean? Let's bring you up. Sean, which is it? What does, what does cannabis treat? <laughs> I'm going to go with all the above and, and some that are not listed. Some that are not even listed. That's you know? fair, man. That's fair. The a stressful heart. day. How about that? You know, Stre the heart and day. mind. That's what it treats. I love it. I love it. All right, y'all. This So take QR code. If you don't know how to QR code by now, I haven't done my job. Uh, hover your phone over the screen. Should cover a, a link. Once you open the camera, hit that. Participate with us. The person who participates the most will win prizes at the end of the day. Um, awesome. So... I am thrilled. Uh, Javier, I'm going to kick you off, dude, but we will get you back soon. Uh, <laughs> Sean, thrilled to have you, man. You are uh, a wonderful supporter of our events, and we've seen some, some, a lot of news come out of you recently, and I think a lot more to come. Uh, I'm really excited about your presentation, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to you to let us know what's going on. Oh, thanks, man. It's always good to see you guys. Um, so I apologize for the a little background here. I'm actually in Puerto Rico right now. Um, I'm working on uh, our furthering our expansion, which uh, which you know about, and I'm going to get into that in a little bit. So, um, and they're working on my house actually. So I have to take those um, I have to take those uh, appointments as I can because that's how it is on the island here. So you got to take it when you can get it. So I'll go ahead and jump right in. Um, so I'm the I'm Sean Cradle. I'm the president and CEO of Pineapple Inc. Um, <clears throat> we're also uh, affiliated with Pineapple Ventures, which is our private company, and Pineapple Inc. is our public uh, company. I'm the CEO of both. Um, you'll see at the bottom of the screen, our asset portfolio under that Pineapple Inc. umbrella is Pineapple Express, and we are a uh, California statewide uh, mobile dispensary, if you will. Uh, so we are seed to sale. We're totally vertically integrated with over 14 vertical licenses. Uh, so we, we get to folks, especially in LA, in under two hours in most cases, and as, as low as 15 minutes. Uh, we take credit and debit and it's free delivery. Um, on the, uh, on the, in the middle there, THC is our in-house brand for our, um, we carry all the you know, major brands in terms of our delivery service. You could think of us as your mobile dispensary. However, we also have a in-house brand of our own cannabis flower and accessories and such like that and our merchandise, and that is THC, uh, to which we own the trademark. 
as well. And Pineapple Wellness is a nationwide uh, distribution, uh, home delivery of uh, a CBD only health and beauty products, ranging from anything from cat and dog treats to beard oils, bath bombs, et cetera. Uh, so our mission here at Pineapple is to deliver fast, uh, deliver quality canvas products and that's excellent service at a competitive price to our consumers. Uh, with sustainability at our core, we'll continue to grow our organization with the same integrity and transparency that we use to cultivate our products. Our core values, near and dear to my heart, um, especially as a Marine Corps veteran, these are things that I constantly disseminate throughout our organization. Uh, compassion for our consumers, commitment to produce quality products with integrity and care, uh, consistency to deliver fast and dependable service, and courage to be an industry leader. We like to uh, push the status quo and I'd like to, my, I envision uh, our conglomerate to be, you know, uh, the, the, the anheuser Bushes, the Philip Morrises of this particular industry. So for cannabis companies that are on the rise or cannabis companies that want to look uh, to, uh, you know, uh, a, a company in terms of uh, leadership and everything all around to follow. We want to set the benchmark for what this uh, industry should be. Uh, so in terms of the market uh, opportunity, California is expected to grow and reach about seven and a half billion by 2024. Delivery is expected to make up 37% of retail transactions. I would say that has ballooned um, from the low 20s as of last year because of COVID. So we were actually able to, um, you know, from a pandemic, we actually grew uh, substantially. Um, during the months of March, April, May, we were tripling sales, daily sales, and our convergence, uh, our conversion rate was, uh, it has remained, it has remained uh, consistent and is still climbing because people were sort of forced to take delivery, but once they understood that delivery was so easy with us, we were doing this, um, we were primed before the pandemic to deliver to homes uh, easily because we had been doing this for a year already prior to uh, COVID. So actually I think we started up delivering uh, April of 19. Uh, so with uh, licenses limited, startups cost a lot, you know, uh, I'm sure everyone on this call or uh, viewing this is understanding that it sometimes isn't even about the money. It's about uh, the licenses that are being issued. So um, licenses are a uh, are, are, are few and far in between uh, nowadays, at least in California. Um, so again, we are vertically integrated, as I stated before. Uh, we have experienced operators in the field. Uh, we have a centralized uh, customer service center that is offsite um, and is in its own zone. Uh, we have uh, over 30 vehicles that are, uh, are hybrid, hybrids, Priuses, that are outfitted um, with uh, safes that are embolted to the, uh, all, the all the, we actually exceed the, uh, the Bureau of Cannabis Control's um, protocols for, for vehicle safety. And that's just personally for me, um, leading troops in the Marine Corps, I want all my troops in the field uh, safe. So we have uh, multiple cameras that are, um, that are ongoing all the time. And, uh, and again, the power of our brands, Pineapple Express is obviously a well-known uh, brand, and uh, as well as THC, obviously, is recognizable. And Pineapple Wellness, again, is our nationwide uh, home delivery of health and beauty products. As seen on, uh, you know, we, we have had uh, mentions in TMZ twice last year, uh, Fortune twice in 2019. Actually, Fortune Magazine, the December issue of um, 2019, we were the only cannabis company in the investment guide to 2020. Obviously, our good folks at Benzinga, um, the, the, you know, obviously, with all you guys, the, uh, the support is mutual and mutual. Uh, it's mutually, uh, you know, um, uh, feel good, you know, and also mutually beneficial as well. Mark, watch LA Weekly, Forbes and the, and, and the, and the like. Um, so I, I'd like to, you know, really showcase and, and this is very exciting for us. We are nearing the finish line of opening our flagship dispensary. Our, our main model is delivery. However, we wanted to have a, a physical brick and mortar presence, um, you know, throughout California and actually across the country as states open up. We are uh, we are talking about um, franchising the Pineapple Express brand and also licensing THC to other, uh, you know, to other states and dispensaries who may want a brand that, that, that doesn't have a name for their brand of cannabis and or their brand of dispensaries. So we actually are opening our flagship dispensary in the corner of the famous Hollywood and Vine right next to Capitol Records. Um, this is going to be, I'm creating this to be the Planet Hollywood um, uh, of dispensaries. We wanted a full experience and that starts with this uh, this location. It is, um, and one, one big thing for us optically, ethically and morally, this was uh, actually obtained through a social equity applicant. 
So we, would have, we wouldn't have had this location uh, if it wasn't for this person. And at the same time, we, are, we have an incubator, so folks don't have to, you know, for lack of better words, get, get you know, screwed around when they're trying to actually do what, this, what these uh, programs are intended to do. We've actually uh, have, uh, have done that um, more, more than once, but with this location is super special. Um, as there's no dispensary within about two and a half, three square miles of this location, right on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Uh, we have a bunch of investors, um, celebrity investors that are, in, are, that are in this house, um, in this location specifically. Uh, Two Change is one of them. Um, he is the uh, behind the social equity applicant. He's the highest investor, single investor in this project. But we also have others of the like, like Ray J's and um, of the world. And there's a few other um, currently playing athletes that wish to be uh, remain nameless. Uh, but we have a powerhouse under here. And also I'm bringing in all these celebrities that have their own brands um, to bring into this house. So every week there's going to be, um, you know, signings and uh, of their brands and things like that. And they're also using their, you know, uh, their platforms to promote this location as it's mutually beneficial to them as well. And they have, uh, you know, some of these folks have big, big marketing budgets. So we're, we're looking, uh, that was the plan, not just to bring a celebrity name in, but uh, to, to, in hopes that they would also cross promote and market in which case they're doing as well. Uh, so this is um, right on the corner, like I said, right on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, right across the street from uh, the highest grossing Starbucks uh, per square foot in all of California, right across the street from the W. Uh, there's a train station, there's a bus stop that has about at least 10 routes a day that stops directly in front of this location. So we are actually moving and gro grooving with this and we are actually, um, we're taking some uh, last minute investments. This is set to open the end of June. So we actually just got our last plan check. So now it's off to the races uh, for three weeks to open the door. Um, I actually, uh, this is, I told Benzinga, I'm always going to ha have these, these fresh drops for you guys. And I just got that notification just before I jumped on the call. So that's a um, very good day at Pineapple for us right now. Um, and also we're, we're offering uh, our statewide distribution, uh, our, our statewide, um, uh, you know, uh, our delivery service. Actually, we're doing quasi type of investments to where you can directly invest into Hollywood and Vine project or you can directly invest into um, into our cannabis delivery service, which has already been up and running. Or we have a quasi deal where you can actually have a bit of both because this location actually feeds Hollywood and Vine. So you can essentially double dip the chip, if you will, if you're investing in both operations. Uh, again, um, you know, our brands, um, I don't have to go into any more detail here. You know, again, Pineapple Express, THC, both powerful brands, both have uh, a bunch of celebrity backings. But these, these kind of brands uh, more or less speak for themselves. And as I mentioned before, uh, we do have these two offerings. One offering that I did not include is we actually do have a fully vertical um, facility in Palm Springs that we're actually finishing up right now as well. That is also set to open uh, at the end of June. So this has everything um, uh, in terms of like manufacturing, uh, retail delivery, retail dispensary, um, and, and, and everything else in this location. I apologize for the alarm going off. <clears throat> I, that's outside, I can't do anything about that. Um, so, uh, so we're moving full-fledged there. We're actually selling that project outright for, uh, for 2.5 million, which is way below market value, but what we're trying to do is fuel our other expansions in terms of um, uh, Hollywood and Vine, making sure that's pristine and, and, uh, and, and ready to go. And also, um, I'm, I'm located in Puerto Rico right now, working on our ever-growing expansions here. We're trying to stand up about two dispensaries here and poised to be the first delivery service on the island of Puerto Rico. Um, and uh, they just opened up, uh, they call it transportation uh, license instead of delivery, but um, it's all the same. That just opened up right before COVID hit. So we were stalled there, but we're actually, uh, you know, starting to go ahead and uh, progress uh, even more now. So um, here's our, uh, our management team. So again, I wanted to surround myself not only with people that are um, experienced cannabis operators, but also folks that have good pedigrees in terms of um, education and actual corporate experience, which is something that I've seen as lacked in the cannabis industry. Uh, myself, I'm a Marine Corps veteran, as I stated before. Uh, I have four master's degrees myself. Uh, I was a college professor teaching leadership and organizational leadership out of Miami for five years. 
Uh, Marco Rulo is our president. Uh, he has over a dozen years of, of senior and, and uh, management experience in the cannabis industry. Also holds an MBA and is um, and and as well as Josh Eisenberg. He's a Wharton grad, uh, very experienced operator in the uh, in the delivery service uh, area. He was the reason why we were able to hit the ground running. Um, uh, pretty uh, pretty hot. I wouldn't say totally hot, but definitely between warm and hot. Definitely not cold. And uh, Stephen Schur is our is our uh, CRO. And he has uh, a wealth of experience in uh, making us lean in terms of uh, not spending too much overhead. And uh, he also comes from a wide background of, of medical experience. So, um, so I'm going to go ahead and take that off so I can see you. Sean, that was awesome, man. Okay. Uh, so, just to sum it up here, you know, we have. Uh, we're flying on multiple levels here. As you as you already know, Elliot, I've shared a lot of things with you. Um, one thing is one one big big great thing to have as a cannabis company is having good representation of of key celebrities. Um, and as you know, Elliot, I just went ahead and we're actually um, we partnered with Snoop Dogg. Uh, that that article has come out, I believe, a couple of months ago, and uh, it was just a basic friendship uh, for for a little while, and then um, I. I don't know how this happened, but we were able to build a lounge, a Pineapple Express lounge inside of his compound, which is like an adult playground uh, for any actor, celebrity, any, anyone in entertainment to come through and have a good time. Uh, we're the actually only cannabis company to do that. And we're the actual, uh, we are the official delivery service for Snoop and his compound. Um, we've also uh, brought on, we just fi we're filing an 8K, so I can't really say who the person is, but we are bringing a former congresswoman on to our board to be the first female on our board. Very, very excited about that. And um, this person also has a lot of connections uh, still to Capitol Hill that can give us some good insight on, you know, the state of affairs with in terms of federally uh, decriminalization or legalization, whichever whichever route they go. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and, and what, what other things are happening in other states that, as they open up and people want us to come aboard. I'll also Sean, uh, get to mention that we actually are bringing on a chief medical officer as well. Fantastic, man. You guys have a ton of stuff going on. Uh, I know you've announced some of it. I know some of it's still yet to be announced, but uh, it, it really truly is uh, exciting uh, to see the growth that Pineapple has had specifically under you and your management team's leadership uh, over the past you know, year. I think we met at the start of COVID. If I'm not mistaken, yeah. or maybe right. We met before. Miami at uh, about March. Yeah, yep. yeah. So uh, I, a lot has happened for Pineapple. So PNPL uh, is the ticker there. You know, Sean, I'd love for you to kind of dive in really quick. We have about two to three minutes left. Uh, if you could dive in a little further into the importance of a location of the, your flagship dispensary. Um, you know, and what this means specifically, if you can, I'm not asking for guidance, but what this could mean for the numbers overall of your company. I mean, this is going to, this location um, is also sitting on the bottom of 200, over 200 um, residential units as well. So again, there's no other, there's no other cannabis uh, dispensary within uh, four square, uh, three square miles of this location with all the foot traffic being on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Um, it's just, uh, you know, the organic traffic alone, especially as COVID opens back up and people start traveling again, uh, we expect these numbers to balloon. I'm still being very conservative because it's hard to gauge, you know, with COVID numbers and um, how much people are going to come out. So for investors, I say it is, you know, stay on the on the uh, on the, the conservative side. I like to under promise and not over deliver. So, um, you know, and, and they're actually tearing down um, this little uh, establishment next door to us and they're going to build another two uh, another mid-rise uh, residential uh, residential uh, residencies within the next couple of years so we actually uh, we have billboards we have LED trucks we have LED bikes um, in Vegas oh, I'm sorry Vegas <laughs> and uh, in Venice Beach um, promoting this location again the W across the street they've already greenlit us to not only do our launch party on their rooftop um, pool deck but also to have any events that we would have the whole shareholders and investors and of the like that will come visit us right across the street. Or me, host it, or me. You know. Or you, I mean, <laughs> you're, 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 you're welcome. Man. Especially you and Patrick at the Hardy Boys is what I call you guys. Yes, Jason, I love it. Bobby, all, all you guys are phenomenal folks just in general, and I'm, I'm happy to roll with you guys as well. 
Sean, you know, I got to say, man, if if I'm looking for a value play in cannabis, I'm looking no further. Uh, you've got a lot going on. You have a steady uh, business and your distribution. You're adding in uh, an important retail front. You are expanding to Puerto Rico. Um, it, it seems to me you have a lot going on and I'm really excited for you. Uh, and we'll get an update a little bit later this year in person, October 13th yes, or 14th in New York City. Uh, super pumped about that. Uh, but Sean, I'm heading there actually right after this. I'm heading. Um, nice. I, I'm heading to. Yeah, we we've had a few people that were knocking on our door about seven calls when New York opened. So I'm gonna go ahead and go straight there from here um, to work on some things upstate New York. I have a meeting with one of the mayors. Can't say who it is yet. But um, but yeah, folks Ooh. like our you know transparency. They like uh, you know the the public side. We're looking to get uplisted to the OTCQB within the next thirty days as well. So we're working on all fronts here. I mean, you know, I don't sleep. Um, I, I live <laughs> and breathe pineapple. And um, it's, it's, it's primarily for, you know, everyone under my umbrella who looks to me to. You know, if we had to freeze any time, I'm glad it was at the end. <laughs> Sean, uh, I think you're frozen, my friend. Uh, oh, there you go. You're back. But anyways, we are at time anyway. Back, but Sean, uh, you may have just dropped a little tease for us uh, about New York. I love that. Um, with, with, you know, but my friend, I'm, I'm it's always it a pleasure you, to I'm see gonna, you. I'm going to always give it to you. <laughs> I love it. I love you it, too, man. Buddy. Sean, thanks for being here, dude. Be well. Thank you. Awesome. So, y'all, you just heard it from Sean Cradle himself. He has worked night and day. Uh, to just make pineapple what it has become, P and PL. Uh, I think it's 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 undervalued. It's it's under talked about. Uh, interesting play for sure. Uh, we are pretty much right on time. Maybe a minute behind here, but I'm super excited to introduce a good uh, a, a really good friend of Benzinga and myself. But I think one of the more interesting stories into cannabis personally uh, is Diane Downey. Uh, she's gonna jump on here shortly, uh, but. There we go. Add her up to the stream if I can get my computer to work. Perfect. Diane, how Hi. are you today? Fine, thank you. Good, good. Glad to have you. Uh, you're one of the leaders in Oregon. Uh, you have a ton that you are working on. I'm super excited to have you. I'm going to let you go right to it. All right. Thank you. Well, uh, we have a little uh, video that Aaron's going to play for us to start. It's about two minutes long and it just gives a really good background about our company and how we got our start. So go ahead, Aaron. I've also been asked to tell you to share your screen if that's okay. Oh, Thanks. I shall. I've always been an advocate for um, the legalization of cannabis. The emphasis is on quality, and we are all about growing the best cannabis possible. We were lucky to get our marketing firm from Seattle, and it was back and forth and back and forth to get our concept just right. I know that our dispensaries appreciate that marketing because they need brands that are willing to tell the story behind it. We are currently in about 140 dispensaries. You can find us in Eugene, the coast, in Bend. You can find us in Portland. Our customers, they ask for our product. And one reason that we've tripled our production this year is because we've been unable to keep product on the shelves. Everybody knows that we're organic and they appreciate it. Currently, right now, Rebel Spirit is stepping into more of a role of taking on its own wholesale distribution of its own product. We are open to sell as a producer. We also have our wholesale distribution license. So we have the ability to offer our product to any OLCC approved dispensary as recreational. We're really working to stay ahead of the curve. So that's why we were one of the first ones in Oregon to get our license. We knew we wanted to be first to the punch on everything. We at Rebel Spirit are really dedicated to following all the guidelines and we work really hard to do that. The industry is growing so fast. We are thinking about moving into other markets, uh, say California, Washington, or any market actually in the United States, and make edibles, salves, and tinctures, and whatnot that people in the U.S. now really want for health reasons. A lot of what we're having to do is figure out, well, what is the newest thing, and how do we get there first? 
Rebel Spirit has really had the chance to get in on that ground level, and vast growth it is. Thank you. So, here we go. Um, can you hear me now, Elliot? Yes, ma'am. Go for it. All right. Great. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. I really appreciate it. So why are we Rebel Spirit? Um, our company is named for our family friend, Uncle Mark, whom you can see in the background. Um, and uh, Mark was a victim of the war on drugs, a victim. In 1997, he died in prison where he was serving time for growing cannabis in Northeast Washington. That was a sad time for us. Now Uncle Mark is our rebel spirit. We have a sizable vertically integrated operation through which we grow, manufacture, and sell our products. We have three OLCC licenses. We harvest over 4,000 pounds of craft cannabis each year. Our pre-rolls dominate the Oregon market. We have our own sales team and we're beginning pre-roll production in California. And this is where it all happens in Oregon on Uncle Mark's farm. We mix our own soil from our farm's rich earth and organic matter. Our private wells and collected rainwater hydrate our crops. And our crops are greenhouse and sun grown, which saves energy and is environmentally sustainable. We have many proprietary strains, which are the product of our sophisticated breeding program, organically cultivated with care from development to harvest. We win awards and our strains are listed on Leafly. We offer a variety of SKUs, which gives us shelf space and increases your, our brand recognition. You can see our edibles here. We also sell concentrates and we have a healing salve ready to bring to market. Now for the big market opportunity. We have the number one pre-roll brand in Oregon and we control 7.5% of the Oregon pre-roll market. We sell 350,000 pre-rolls per month in packs of 10. To put it mildly, the pre-roll market is hot. When a state legalizes, consumers are taken with novel consumption methods such as dabbing and vaping, and then they come back to pre-rolls. As we've seen in Colorado, Washington, Oregon, and California, the pre-roll market matures about two years post legalization and establishes a 10% market share. Pre-rolls are not going away. They present a familiar low-tech form. There's no special equipment, so they're easy to use and share. There's no hardware to dispose of, so they have a low environmental impact. What's led to our success? We have an unfair advantage in this market. First, we win awards. Recently, we beat 150 competitors to be winners of the Oregon Growers' Cup. Our brand imagery and story are meaningful, memorable, and iconic. We've created beautiful low-tech biodegradable packaging, and our proprietary strains are unavailable elsewhere. Our variety packs provide for choice, and most importantly, our proprietary SOPs create consistently smooth smoking joints. This is not a startup. We've got traction. Our pre-roll revenue doubled every quarter in 2019, as you can see here on this chart. And our pre-roll sales have grown by over 50% in the last year. As fast as we're growing, we still can't satisfy demand for our pre-rolls. We're here, we're here to raise money to scale to this need. We're currently selling 35,000 packs per month and anticipate growing to 60,000 packs per month in Oregon by the end of 2022. There's our revenue, it's growing and growing and growing. 
Our brand is incredibly valuable. Rebel Spirit's brand imagery and story are memorable, meaningful, and iconic. In addition, we have an authentic heart and soul that appeal to Americans of all stripes. In sum, Rebel Spirit speaks to Americans' values for individuality and independence. The bud tenders at our dispensaries literally clamor for our pre-rolls. They tell us that many customers will leave the store without buying anything if our pre-rolls are out of stock. This is a good problem to have, and it puts lots of pressure on us to keep our customers happy. In fact, many dispensaries carry only Rebel Spirit. Bud tenders have told us that we are so popular that other brands beside us fail to sell. And our company is growing, not just cannabis. The company itself is exploding. We are going to take that fantastic growth that we've enjoyed in Oregon and blow it up nationwide in three phases, considering market size, barriers to entry, and evolving legality. The blue states represent markets that are of primary interest to us. Those pre-legal brown states offer opportunities to build brand recognition with hemp and CBD products. We're starting our expansion with a move to California. We're now beginning pre-roll sales in California. We're contracting with partner farmers to grow our patented proprietary strains with all natural methods. We're manufacturing using our proprietary SOPs. We're working with statewide distributors and we're projecting sales of $350,000 a month by this time next year. How will we use your investment? We plan to use our proceeds to get the biggest bang for our buck. We're looking forward to hiring the talent we need to scale. We're going to protect our brand and strains to de-risk our IP revenue potential. Our dedication to marketing drives our strategy to expand state by state, focusing on relationship-based growth to duplicate the model that has worked so well for us in Oregon. The bulk of our funds will be used to maximize our return on investment, that is to scale to demand and hone efficiency. Just regarding a little note, um, when it comes to IP protection, we already hold trademarks for our brand in Oregon and California, and we have our application in for the United States. We can't do this alone, so we built an excellent team. I myself grew up on a 3,000-acre cattle and hay ranch, and I have 30 years of administrative and man managerial experience. My partner, Chris, is an expert in organic agriculture, construction, contracting, and management. And we direct a solid team of leaders for our staff of 45 who get the job done. In addition, we have dedicated advisors who are with us every step of the way. Lori Ferrara provides us with quality connections to grow our business Doug Lambert helps us to manage that growth. Larry Solinger keeps the finances of our complex business structure organized. And Mark Garberg provides counsel from our corporate base in Nevada. Rebel Spirit is not just here for business. We're here to make things right. Many of you from, are familiar with The Last Prisoner Project, a nonprofit organization that works to aid those incarcerated for cannabis offenses. Because of Mark's history, Last Prisoner Project's mission resonates with us. We are mindful of the suffering of those not benefiting from cannabis legalization. Rebel Spirit is committed to community and inclusion. Our profit sharing and partnership and activism with Last Prisoner Project give us a way to act on that commitment meaningfully. Now for our offering. Alvador Holdings is the parent company for five subsidiaries that provide for real estate holdings and the production, manufacture, and sale of our products. This structure and our Nevada incorporation indemnify our brand and provide us with flexibility in minimizing our tax burdens. We are offering a $2 million raise for a minority position, converting to Series A, 
at a 15% discount with 5% interest and a 10 million valuation cap. We expect to exit by a trade sale or other corporate transaction. Thanks for being here today. And Chris and I hope to hear from you. Thanks so much, Diane. Uh, truly an interesting story behind your brand. Um, you know, I, I know you presented with us before, probably about a year ago, but it seems like yes. some very exciting updates for yeah. you all, uh, which means a lot of hard work uh, in between last time and this time. So let's start off with, uh, you know, really, I think the most exciting aspect of the immediate part of your business, which is your pre-rolls. Uh, how, how do you explain or how can you uh, kind of touch on how they got to be uh, the leading pre-roll brand in the whole state of Oregon? Uh, well, I think that it's relevant that we didn't uh, jump right into the Oregon market with our pre-rolls. We uh, started our business in 2015 with medical so that we'd be, we'd be ready to go into the Oregon recreational market when it became legal January 1st, 2016. And uh, we, we always had pre-rolls, but we made a reputation in the market of having top quality flour, of being honest and law abiding and wanting to do business right. Uh, and then, um, and we actually, before our pre-rolls blew up, we were in more dispensaries than we are now because we can only handle so much business. But in any case, in uh, the uh, February of 2019, we brought out our new packaging and that's when our sales just took off. Hmm. Just, we, we have not been able to keep up. Um, ever since. And so we already had that reputation built. We already had a name for ourselves in the state. We've got this amazing product and packaging and story and getting those packages then um, out into the world has really been the best marketing uh, to bring people back to the stores. I love that. Uh, what's your view on the national pre-roll market? I can imagine you are uh, making plans for taking this proven brand across state lines. So, you know, I, I would love to kind of understand your due diligence on what the national landscape looks like for that. Yeah, I am super excited about this, uh, especially given the market share that we've been able to capture in Oregon. So when we first started up with our pre-rolls in Oregon, when it was looking like a couple of years ago, when it was looking like this was going to be the thing, um, we... Uh, I was hoping to capture 5% of the market in Oregon on pre-rolls and we're up to seven and a half percent now. So I'm taking that 5% goal being modest and say taking that to taking that to other states. Um, I realize that uh, we don't have the same backstory in other states that we have in Oregon. And so as we go into other states, we're going to have to hit our marketing really hard. Mm -hmm. Marketing is going to be number one for us as we go to other states and maintaining uh, our same quality uh, as we go. But if you look at, I was just looking at some of Benzinga's numbers and they, Benzinga says that uh, in 2020, the nationwide uh, cannabis market was 17.5 billion. So 10% uh, of the, historically speaking, 10% of the cannabis market is in pre-rolls. Okay. So then if we take 5% of that on a wholesale basis, if we had 5% of that, that nationwide basket, we'd be at $87 million in sales tomorrow. All right. <laughs> and so, you know, then um, if you look at Benzinga's predicting uh, 41 billion by 2026, right? So then we've got that much more. Even if we only had 1% of the pre-roll sales uh, nationwide, that would give us 17 million in revenue. And given that we're operating at about a 20% profit margin, that give us a tidy little profit of three to $4 million a year. So, you know, even if we were to really scale back our, our ambitions or for some reason not blow up in the rest of the um, country as we have in Oregon, we're, we're sitting pretty to do well nationwide. Fantastic. Diane, we are just about out of time, but if you could leave our investors with a final thought here, uh, you know, why should they be excited about Rebel Spirit? 
I think they should be excited about Rebel Spirit because honestly, we have the whole package. <laughs> we've got the brand, we've got the quality, we've got the reputation, we've got the team mm -hmm. and we're making it happen. Uh, in addition, we're really mindful about bringing other partners along with us as we go. So that our, as our ambition is to go uh, nationwide, uh, we're looking to bring uh, business partners along with us uh, to help us do that so that we're not planning to do this all on our very own. Smart. Thank you so much, Diane. It's a pleasure having you here. Uh, and I look forward to watching your success uh, over the next few months because I'm sure that's what it's going to be. Uh, thanks again, Diane. We will see you soon. Rebelspirit.com or rebelspiritcannabis.com? Rebelspiritcannabis.com. Perfect. Thanks again, Diane. We will see you soon. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Awesome. So y'all, you know, we've talked about this before, but uh, the next wave of entrepreneurs are very important to this industry. And Diane is a part of that. Uh, so very excited to have her here uh, and telling her story with us. Now we have a quick, uh, we announced this earlier again, but we are going to make sure everybody sees this. Aaron, uh, can we roll with this video, sir? All right. Fantastic, y'all. I'm so excited for that. I'm so excited to get back in person. I think everybody here is. I love seeing you all over YouTube. It's a joke because I don't see anybody. I just see my face. Uh, thanks again, y'all, for staying with us this far. Uh, we're going to be doing more Slido polls. If you don't participate, you can't win a lifetime subscription to BZ Pro. I use Benzinga Pro every single day. My portfolio is awesome right now. I will say it includes a few stocks in this event. Um, but with that, I'm super, super excited to introduce um, somebody who's not graced our stage yet, but uh, I, she has amazing expertise. I'll let her introduce the panel. Uh, but Claudia Della Mora, uh, she is the managing director and co-founder of Black Legend Capital. How are you, Claudia? Thank you, Elliot. I'm doing great. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Um, yeah, so as you said, uh, I'm based in Los Angeles. I am a co-founder of uh, Black Legend Capital. We're a boutique investment bank, advisory services. We cover a few industries and uh, cannabis is one of them. Fantastic. We're going to bring the panel up and I'm going to let you introduce them and get the conversation started. Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you. Hello, Antonio. Bye. Hello, Claudia. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Great, R and J, perfect. So we have a very interesting, a very interesting panel today. Uh, four companies. Each one of these four companies has international uh, businesses, and they're very much inclined into the medicinal side. So we will introduce one by one. Jay Frankovich, chairman of the board of ST Brands, also sister company to ST Therapeutics. Uh, NST Biosciences. He will he will present it more himself as well. Alvaro Torres, CEO of Chiron Life Sciences, uh, one of the biggest companies in Latin America, based in Colombia. Antonio Costanzo, CEO of Cura Leaf International, uh, ex CEO of Emac, which was just recently acquired by Cura Leaf, and Oren Schuster, CEO of I Am Cannabis, which uh, can be considered the only MCO with Israeli-based patient clinical data, one of the biggest at least. So it's an extremely interesting panel. How are you doing, guys? Doing well. Doing well. Thank, Thank you. you. Perfect. Great. So let's start with the first question so we take advantage fully of our time here. Um, let's talk about the biggest challenges that uh, each one of you has, has faced, you know, expanding internationally. And we know that despite the 2018 farm bill in the United States or also in other international countries, hemp uh, has been used all over the world. But um, 
CBD is not really legalized, right? It's like in the gray space, kind of purgatory. So let's start with um, maybe um, Antonio. Do you want to tell us uh, your point of view? Sure. Thank sure. you, Claudia. And uh, again, okay. very happy to be very here. Happy Thanks to for the invitation. And hi to everyone. Uh, so the, the biggest challenge I think that anyone has when going international is navigating regulations. You know, in this industry, as we all know, regulations are not uniform. They differ from state to state in certain instances, like in the US, or from country to country, for instance, in Europe. And they differ if you talk about medicinal cannabis or if you talk about CBD wellness products. And so specifically to your question, Claudia, if you look at Europe, which is the, um, the, con the continent that I'm more familiar with because I've been developing EMAC, now Curative International in Europe, the difficulty has been that every single country, despite having some common standards and principles on the manufacturing side, had a different approach to how patients could access medical cannabis and had a different or slightly different interpretation of the rules around CBD products. So today still, when it comes to wellness CBD products, we are having to deal with different approaches by different regulators in Germany, in the UK, in Italy, in France, which cover a number of regulations, European regulation, but also local regulation. So that is the biggest difficulty that we found. And I think it's common to everyone who's gone international. Thank you. I have to unmute myself. I actually have additional questions on that on that subject. But let's jump to the next one. Um, in what ways do you do you each one of you and your companies differentiate your business model from other cannabis companies and competitors? Obviously, everybody has an edge, a different approach. Um, I would like to start with Jay because I, I've been working with Jay actually in the past couple of years. And in one of, of his co three companies, which he can actually explain a little bit, uh, each one of them, um, he's approaching everything a little bit differently. Uh, what are the benefits of having uh, the drugs derived from compounds that are synthesized from the plant and not from the plant itself? So... Gloria, we take a, um, an approach where we don't believe it's natural versus synthetic, um, but instead giving the patient the option of choosing either the RX route or the, the natural route. Um, and it's helped us navigate, as Antonio said, some of the challenges you have uh, inside the CBD space. For example, uh, Australia, the UK, Brazil, um, I'm currently in Barcelona, which, um, you know, Spain is one of those places inside the European Union that, uh, that did not hold up the, um, uh, what came out of France with, with the case in, in regards to uh, CBD being able to product to be sold. So, you know, it's, it, it's challenging to navigate. So we look at it from three approaches. We, we take the RX route. Uh, we run preclinicals uh, going into trials as well. Um, we look at it from the natural approach, but putting science behind that approach and taking true talk studies and, and, and really digging deep into the science behind putting out these products. Um, and then one of the advantages that we have in the consumer goods side of the business that we run is that we basically focus on uh, non-competitive products. Uh, so we have, we have one beverage company. Uh, we have one edible company. Uh, we have one company that focuses on skincare, and what we do is take those products that have been successful inside the United States, and then open them into a larger platform, you know, globally. Whether it be in Asia, Europe, uh, we love the South American market. Think it's going to be a really hot market once COVID starts to settle down. Um, you know, so so that's the approach we take. I, I think you can't just look at it from one approach, but I think that you do need to look at it from every aspect if you do intend to, to grow your business. Great. As a matter of fact, uh, um, what about the noble food uh, um, requirements, which just started now in Europe, I guess, uh, a month ago or so? Uh, would that be compliant to those new requirements, the CBD hemp, uh, you know, uh, um, products inside uh, in, ingredients uh, inside any type of finished products right 
Yeah, well, I think it's once again coming from a, a drug manufacturing approach and putting together uh, drug master files for the FDA. Um, when putting these dossiers together, whether it be for the UK, uh, Australia or Brazil, you really need to know the protocols in in putting those packages together and submitting them and, and, and following along the line of, you know, taking the scientific approach to putting this product out, which, you know, won't let them scan. It's, it's considered in some countries still a narcotic, no different than THC. So, you know, navigating those inroads is, is super important if, uh, if you want to take a global approach to this, this industry. Okay. Yeah. Still on the topic of how you differentiate yourself, right? Antonio, um, we're going to talk about Europe, as we said, but let's compare a little bit of, uh, you know, how uh, certain products uh, by, have been launched by Cure Relief in the U.S. market. Uh, Select Squeeze was just launched in, I guess, all 14 states, and I think Boris last uh, February during the conference, he was announcing this launch and saying it will come at the same time in all of our states. That's how Clear Leaf does it, right? So how would you, how are you going to do it in Europe on the other hand, in the UK, Germany, Italy, Switzerland, Portugal, uh, how would you uh, launch new products in what manner? Again, you have to differentiate between medical cannabis and CBD wellness products that do not require a prescription. So when it comes to medical cannabis, you can use the same product or almost the same product in different countries in Europe. You need to go through, in certain cases, registration processes for those products. In other cases, you have to submit a big amount of documentation on the safety of uh, the product. And you have a different approach to how the product is prescribed. In certain countries, you need a specialist who will prescribe the product. In other countries, it's any GP that can prescribe the product. So again, it goes back to the point, you need to be aware of how the different countries are enforcing uh, medical cannabis programs. Or on the CBD wellness side, to the point of novel food, novel food uh, you know, has been around for uh, the better part of one and a half years now. We have two applications uh, that we have submitted with two different partners. One has been already validated which doesn't mean approved, it's validated, it's the first step, then you go through the approval uh, process. It's going to take some time, but we're going to get to the point where we have a product that is can be used uh, as an ingestible product in every single country in Europe. So I'm repeating myself, I'm probably boring people, but it's all about navigating regulations. I think I think also Jay was saying similar. Uh, this is the way of doing it. Thank you so much, Antonio. So I'm going to uh, switch this question. Actually, still in the same subject, which is how do you differentiate yourself, right? To Oren now. So I was studying a little bit of company, uh, which is obviously I'm very uh, I'm very interested in everything, anything that comes from Israel. So uh, as of Right now, I mean, a couple of months ago, uh, in April 2021, you acquired Israel's largest retail and online pharmacy business, Panaxia. Yep. But you've also made other acquisitions to to secure a vertical, posi a vertical position, right? Uh, with um, cultivations in Canada, like Tricom, MIM, Sublink Culture, uh, what is your business model? What are, you, what are you after? Do you want to supply Europe? Do you want to supply other uh, countries, continents? So I, I'm see as of now, focus mainly in three countries, which is Israel, Germany, and Canada. Uh, and uh, Israel and Germany more in the connection of the EU market, which is our main focus. Uh, so IMC start as, as, has been one of the pioneers in this industry. And you asked about how we, we um, different, what we, we're doing different. Okay, I will say it like that. So I think that the fact that we started from a very medical market and we supplied for many years directly to patients enable us to collect a lot of data, clinical data, and to validate this data along the years because we've done it for almost 10 years. So we had the opportunity to, to know exactly what kind of strains we are giving to the patients, what indications those, those patients have. And in the medical market, uh, we have done a, 
that a lot of that uh, we, we collected a lot of data and the Israeli market is very medical and research oriented so I think that today we know about our strains uh, to what indications they are helping uh, what patients report reported on each of the, the the strains so it's very easy now to use it and to help patients to find the exact strains that they, they need and uh, I think that this is something that very unique it's super relevant in the uh, in Germany for example where we are active because it's it's a medical market and doctors want clinical data so I think that this is a huge, huge advantage that we are bringing to the medical market Absolutely, yes. And Germany is leading kind of regulations in Europe, so and Europe is yeah. only medical at this stage. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, now, now, next question. Uh, would legalization happen in, in so many countries at the same time, right, across the world? Um, which markets or countries will you prioritize in the next two to three years? Um, so I would like to start with Jay because he has three companies, different countries, and I've seen him actually put this together in the past few years. So I would like for him to uh, describe where the operations are, which countries, right? And when you touch, uh, uh, and you start, when you start talking about United States also, how do you deal with current interstate commerce within the United States? So, you know, our platform reaches from North America, South America, we're in, uh, Europe, Asia, um, and working on submitting a dossier right now um, to help out the uh, two of the three license holders in Australia. Um, so, you know, we, we really take it from an international approach. And, and once again, I really focus on the, the science aspect of it. And I think, you know, having clinical data to go to specialists is is key because you know look the united states and canada establish markets as you start to go into markets europe for example germany poland um when you do or the uk when you have specialists uh they're going to want to know basically who ran the trials um where the data was collected um you know so so you really need to focus on that because it is a drug um, and the markets are, are different. It's, it's not the same as entering the, the U.S. market. And, you know, for us, uh, we started out in the cannabis space in the U.S., uh, but kind of pivoted um, in the United States. We only have one asset, which is a, a DEA approved laboratory that we work in and kind of transitioned into the CBD space there where, you know, interstate commerce was easier for us. Right. So, um, you know, we, 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 we like the markets that are difficult to get in, right? Because if you have good SOPs in place, you'll have the ability to get there. And look, this isn't a, a business where you jump in and make money in six months. You've got to be able to stick out, you know, two to three years of, of getting into the market. And, and the thing is, sometimes first to market is not always, and I'm not going to say not always, I'm going to say it's probably not the, the best position to take. Sometimes coming in you know, second, third, and fourth after that guy's broke the ice is, is the way to go. And, you know, we like those markets. Brazil is one of them. Australia is another one. Um, so, like I said, the more difficult um, it is, the, the better it is for us to, to, to really put those SOPs in place and, and get into those markets. And, and those are the ones we like. So that's, uh, you know, that's the future of where we see the, the business in these bigger markets. Thank you so much, Jay. Actually, I think I should ask this question a little bit to everybody because the, the investors, the audience wants to know where each one of these companies are expanding. So um, next, Antonio, uh, which market country or it, are you thinking of you know, expanding or developing more operations in the next two or three years? Or uh, Go ahead. Thanks. So Curalif obviously you know, started as a U.S. company and is still the main focus of the company. So the U.S. will remain the main focus for, for the group. Clearly, with the acquisition of AMAC and now Curalif International, there is also a focus on expanding internationally, in particular in uh, Europe. And when it comes to Europe, the biggest uh, markets are Germany, the U.K. We think that uh, Italy and France are also going to develop in the next two to three years significantly. And that's on the medical side. And on top of that, we believe that certain countries will start to legalize recreational use in, uh, in Europe. There is a number of ongoing 
uh, political processes that are happening in certain countries. I can name uh, the Netherlands, Switzerland, uh, Malta, uh, Portugal, probably Germany, possibly Germany after the elections in September. So we think that trend is happening. We're going to see it um, moving forward. And those are the focus. Those, that is the focus that we will have in the next uh, few years. Okay, great. Actually, a side question still to Antonio, okay, quickly. Um, I know we talked about Europe and Italy as well. Um, which, which countries in Europe, European countries, do you think would be the best market for medicinal cannabis treatments or nutraceutical over-the-counter versus which European countries would be more, uh, will be more advanced politically for recreational legalization? So uh, legalization of REC, as I said, there is a number of countries that are currently looking at that in its names that I've uh, outlined earlier. If I had to guess who is going to go first, so first of all, we know for a fact that the Netherlands and Switzerland have implemented or are implementing uh, some recreational pilot project. So that is happening. In terms of full legalization, if I, if I had to place a, be a bet, I would probably pick Portugal as the first country that will go full rec in the next uh, couple of years. And uh, when it comes to over-the-counter or CBD wellness products, it's uh, anyone's guess. UK today is the largest country in, uh, in terms of CBD sales in uh, Europe. Germany is not far behind, is uh, following suit. Uh, if, you know, if in Europe, if you bet on the five big countries, UK, Germany, France, Italy, and Spain, you're normally betting on the right countries. Now, Alvaro, tell us, tell us, uh, uh, I, I, we know a little bit about, you know, your expansion plans in Latin America and Europe as well. Tell us which markets, countries you want to develop more in the next couple of years. Well, thank you, Claudia. Um, no, uh, our approach, uh, particularly in Latin America, is a very vertically integrated approach. So we cultivate in Colombia, low cost, very pharma grade. Uh, type of products and then we have our own health centers and our own clinics and we prescribe to our own patients and that's the growth that we've been having you know very exponentially even even with the COVID situation. I think for this year particularly LATAM you know, we already started in Colombia we're growing very fast we uh, started our first clinic in Peru this week and had, having our first patients and certainly the approach of taking our clinic Serenia all the, all the way Latin America is going to be one that you know, we're going to be doing this year particularly in Mexico and Brazil second half of the year. I think, uh, I don't remember it was Antonio, it was Oren who was talking about regulation. I think also access is very important, you know, when you talk about these markets and educating doctors, educating patients, uh, which is why uh, in our case, at least vertical integration plays a big role because we're able to get, get those patients. And as Oren was saying before, it's really all about the data and it's all about how to convince. I mean, uh, when we think about medical markets, in particularly in LATAM and Brazil, all these countries, there is a lot that is not known, right? And there's a lot of expectation from doctors on, on how, how do you train them, what type of education, what type of, um, how, how do you show them the evidence? And so for us having those clinics and being able, uh, having the ability to, you know, have access to the patients, access to the insurance, because, you know, in Colombia, we got insurance coverage for, my, uh, for medical cannabis since December. We just got our first patient in Peru with insurance companies. And the more data we can provide, uh, not, not only from a health perspective, but also from a, uh, economic perspective to insurance companies, and I'm sure like like uh, what Oren has been doing in Israel, that the more we can do that, the more access we open. And the more access we open, the more this market will develop. I think that's what we're taking for, for Latin America. For Europe, you know, we're focused on UK and Germany. We just started sales. We're just in that, in that process. We're not there yet or, you know, at the position that you know, Oren and Antonio and, and Jay are probably are. Uh, but I think what we're also taking is all this information and all this data that we're able to gather directly from the patient because, you know, we've seen more than 10,000 patients with medical cannabis. Uh, how you start showing doctors that you're switching pregabalin, pupremorphine, morphine, tramadol, and you're able to make a different uh, use of medical cannabis and start breaking down those barriers, the more of that data you're able to collect. And I think, uh, if I may speak on, on all of these studies, the more the companies are able to do that, the more access will improve. Right, this market will be developed by several companies who need to break those barriers. There's the opportunity is huge. Uh, I think for us in Latam, you know, we, certainly we've been leading, leading the charge. Hopefully, more companies will follow to try to break those those barriers. But when I think about you know Mexico, Colombia, Peru, Brazil, UK, and Germany, I think that's enough in the plate. And even just in Latin America, I think about Mexico and Brazil. It's 
two huge markets that is all going to be about how do we bring more access and how do we make more patients and more that we develop in Colombia, the more that we'll continue to show in the rest of that time. Yeah, yeah, as a matter of fact, you touched something very, very important that Brazil and Mexico. So Brazil, over 210, 11 million people, Mexico, over 130 million. Uh, Mexico is getting federally legalized at the moment, hopefully by this year, so, uh, in, the, in the hands of the Senate at this point. Brazil, totally conservative, but uh, back at the beginning of 2000, uh, uh, 2020, uh, I guess they approved guidelines for import of medical cannabis. Now, I know from uh, analyzing kind of life sciences uh, reports that currently you guys are operating uh, with this, um, with the authorization for compassionate care imports. Uh, will you obtain the sanitary authorization with Anvisa? Because the problem with Anvisa is they don't want only EU GMP certification. They want this 12 month stability testing uh, for humidity over the shelf. I was learning everything about it. It's crazy, right? So what, what will you do about it? Well, I think, first of all, uh, the more quality is required, uh, and I'm sure everybody would agree, the better, because we need to make sure that patients are safe, at least from my perspective, uh, a safe product always, is always very important, particularly when you're talking about a conservative society in Latin America that's, you know, I mean, at least particularly from my point of view, we've seen cannabis, we've always been the illegal growers of marijuana, right? So when you want to switch to medical, you need to make a difference. Uh, with black markets and such. But uh, yes, we're starting with you with that compassionate care. We're going to have our first patient soon for us. We're doing two things. It's only also on the production and, and yes, the, the registration with Ambisa, but also on the access and the clinics. Because I think that without that part of the equation, it doesn't matter how many products are going to be there because patients need to know about them and patients and doctors need to know. I think the one thing about Brazil is it's a very exciting market. Uh, when it comes to CBD, the labeling is a lot easier. When you talk about THC or one-to-one, -one, the labeling uh, restrictions that are on those products for registration are, are going to make it very more harder to try to position brands, which is why access matters a lot when it comes to to, uh, to, uh, to patients and access. But, you know, yes, we're on that track. I think there's, you know, it's a huge market, 250, 220 million people. Uh, and, you know, and it's not just one big market. You have to think about different cities. Sao Paulo has 30 million people. Now, so yes, that one city is, is as big as Brazil, uh, Canada, sorry. So uh, I think if you continue about market, there's the registration is getting, of course, more complex. But I think that's just also uh, you know, part of the story. I mean, look at when Canada started, none of those quality controls were in place when Canada started you know, 12 years ago. And maybe that helped the, grow the industry, but the more we know about cannabis, the, know, the more we know about stabilities and, and th those type of practices, I think the more safer patients will feel, the more safer doctors will feel to prescribe. And I think that only works to build a real credible market because in the end, you're really trying to compete against in some conditions like chronic pain, with opiates and you have to you know, take that quality to that level. Exactly, we hope that happens very soon. Uh, Oren, uh, the next uh, two, three years uh, of expansion, which country, which uh, region, which market? It's a very good question. <clears throat> uh, we just uh, had an election in Israel and uh, it seems like the new coalition uh, have just uh, announced that uh, uh, all the parties signed that they're going to legalize cannabis. Uh, so I think that uh, assuming that this government will be will form, then we will know it in about a, a week. So legalization will start very quickly in Israel, I believe, because there is a, a very strong support. Now, Israel is like Michigan, if you take the numbers. Uh, so it's, it can be a significant market. Uh, it's not an easy market for foreigners to, to, to come into this market. Uh, it's, it's very different. It's, uh, so I think that uh, we will have very strong focus on the Israeli market in the coming years because the market, uh, the potential is huge. And we are already solid in this market. Too, so it makes sense to take a leading position in an emerging market like this market. Uh, we are definitely uh, focusing on the German market now. Uh, and uh, like Antonio said, 
I think that in Europe it's very simple. If you have the, the few biggest countries that uh, you are watching closely, you have an excellent overview over the continent. Uh, and Germany is the most populated country and the most advanced today with the medical program. And uh, I think that also uh, even the toughest regarding regulations. And I, I agree with everything that uh, uh, has been said. The, what, what is setting the business today is the regulations. So we went to the most difficult place. It's much easier to go to other places uh, in Europe. I think that Germany will see significant change uh, in the coming years. And I think that, like Antonio said, I completely agree. We can see that some countries have started the legalization process. Uh, some are uh, in a pilot program, like uh, there is in France, the UK. It's all over the continent, actually. So definitely the EU is the, the main focus for us in the coming years. Amazing. And, and uh, the legalization in Israel... Uh, is recreational? Recreational, yes. So uh, they the, the just announced about, about that. All the parties in the coalition have signed. And this the, the most diversified coalition that ever been in Israel. You have uh, all the society of Israel are represented in, in this uh, coalition. So I think that it's a very good sign that you see that, that all of Israel want uh, legalization. And Israel is considered to be a conservative country, relatively, because we have mixed uh, population. Absolutely, yes. But I, I heard, uh, and I didn't study that yet, but I heard that, that uh, Morocco and Lebanon gave some form of legalizations as well, right? So in the Middle East, Mediterranean areas, there's a lot of movement. Yes, that is correct. And also, I would say the, the African continent altogether, because you have, you mentioned, so in Morocco, there is a, the, the, the law passed the first, uh, I think it was the House, one of the two. Uh, so I think it's in the House and it has to go to, uh, to the Senate now. Um, South Africa is also working on legalization of recreational and uh, medical, both. You have other countries in uh, Africa that are trying to take advantage of their climate in order to become a hub for cultivation and production of the raw material or the flowers to then be exported. Obviously, the, the difficulty there is meeting the standards that are required in certain countries, and in particular in Europe, which is not always uh, easy. But clearly, you know, that secular trend towards the legalization of uh, cannabis is happening everywhere. I would also include Asia. I mean, Thailand you know, yeah. decided to uh, also legalize hemp and products derived from hemp. It's a major first step. Japan just announced that they're going to be allowing medical cannabis or medical cannabis products into the country, which again, a major step. So I think in the next 10 to 20 years, those of us who are still in this industry will be uh, witnessing an, an amazing development, an amazing growth trajectory across the globe. Right. What about Muslim countries? It's funny you say that. There will be an announcement in the uh, next coming weeks with one of the Gulf states, um, you know, coming out with a, with a medical cannabis program. So it's, uh, you know, once once the Gulf gets on board, I think that was the last barrier to entry. I mean, it was was Asia was difficult. Um, but, you know, as Antonio said, Japan uh groundbreaking and uh and news out of the gulf is is, is coming and uh you know it's it, it's big for the industry to see you know uh, coming out of of a country where um super strict programs uh there'll be no you know legalization of recreation i don't think uh in the foreseen future in the gulf but look medical program is a start and and it's a big start for this industry there so yeah, I, I think, by the way, that uh, in Israel, uh, we are a mixed country. So uh, now in the coalition, uh, the Arab uh, party, the big Arab party, signed pro-legalization, uh, not medical, legalization, full medicalization. And, you know, today, the Arab community in Israel, the Muslim Arab community in Israel, is part of the medical uh, program. 
and you can see it in, uh, in also in Muslim uh, cities and people uh, are using medical cannabis as a treatment. That's amazing news uh, also because of, it's been used in recreational matters over there for a long time. But actually let's talk about education here. How do we get some countries like you know Antonio? We also have Italy. We know that it's decriminalized and medicinal is is legal, but in reality, most of the population don't know about it, right? And of course, uh, Alvaro can tell us a little bit about, uh, I mean, he has experience on, you know, building on this extensive network of clinics and partnerships with pharmacies where you actually provide education and training. But uh, uh, how can we, you know, get uh, uh, this knowledge base to as many people as possible so that all also our, our moms or our, you know, older people can say, oh, I'm going to use this treatment instead of only relying on chemotherapy, for example. Um, anybody that who wants to uh, uh, add on this, uh, well, any of you guys? If I may start, you know, Claudia, at least from the perspective of Latin America and Colombia, I think the conversation is getting a lot, a lot easier, a lot better. I mean, this, for example, uh, this month, we partnered with 21 clinics all across Colombia, and we launched a national coverage campaign offering free consultations for cannabis all the way from the north to the Amazon jungle. Some things like that have never been done. Or you couldn't think about doing like something like that a year ago. And the reason why, you know, even today, we're already on those 3,000, 4,000 consultations. That's already filled by almost 50% in the first two days of June. Because the more people start talking about the stories that are being published on Instagram so, and people talking about the real experiences, the more people start to say, well, this is a good medication. And yes, you know, there's patients that are, you know, taking a lot of medications and trying to find a different alternative. This type of access program that, that we're doing in Colombia, we're going to try to do all, all, all across LATAM. But also the type of things that you couldn't think about before and be able to have with the media and partners with the media. So the big uh, TV chains or you know, star, sorry, networks are starting to talk about it prime time. Uh, you know, those are the type of things that are increasing access because the more people see this at 8 p.m. watching the news and they see a you know, 10 second, 30 second spot nationwide about, listen, anxiety, pain, depression, come to a clinic. It doesn't have to be ours, of course, uh, but it's a partnership. And, and let's figure out an alternative. So um, I think that's something that we couldn't do before. Now we're able to do that because of the, of the rate. And the more, you know, like countries like Israel, like Corinne saying, uh, Thailand, they all this start to talk about it, the, the less, the more people will read in the news and the more open they will be to that. I think it's going to be, of course, a different, a big challenge. But you know, just to think about nationwide ads or inside the, you know, like the, the Colombia CNN being able to say, hey, starting tomorrow, more than 4,000 to 5,000 consultations for medical cannabis. That's something you couldn't think about before. So, you know, the more patients are talking about it and in, on, particularly with the force of social media, uh, I think we're seeing that access, that conversation happening uh, with all, all age groups. No? Uh, in fact, no, for example, in our clinics, most of our patients are above 65 years old. <laughs> so though, they are the ones who are needing that because they don't want to keep, you know, spend the rest of their lives hooked in opiates. Well, it looks like Latin America is ahead of Europe, uh, to some countries at least. Oh my God, I'm impressed. It's true. Uh, um, Jay, how do, you, how do we break the stigma, uh, especially going around the past few years, you know, developing these businesses in so many countries, but you were in Africa too, I remember. So how do you break the stigma or how do you get, you know, part of the culture? It, it's, it starts with education. Yeah, you know, we, uh, we live in Italy, right? So what we do, we spend time in the US, we're in Italy. And um, no, and the demand is great in Italy. Um, the issue is the access, right? Obviously it's a, it's a program that goes through the military um, but people want cannabis in Italy. Um, but you know, Europe, uh, and I would imagine same, same problems you run into in, in Africa and South America is, is education. And it has to start at the top. You're not going out immediately to educate the consumer, but you have to start with, you know, everybody from the, uh, the ministers of health down to the universities to the pharmacist, uh, you know, the consumer trusts the pharmacist. He can tr he trusts the doctor. Um, you know, he, he doesn't trust specifically the company that comes in and says, hey, this cannabis works, use it because we say so. So, 
you know, you, you've got to start programs to really educate the medical professionals. And then the medical professionals will go out and spread the word on how good a product is as compared to other things that are, you know, that are over the shelf or, or you know, prescribed by, by doctors for the past 20, 30 years based on trials and clinicals that have been run in the past. I mean, we are a young industry. So, so we need to get out there and we need to educate and it starts at the top. We have only a couple of minutes, but so on the same topic without switching, I was going to ask other questions. Uh, or and same thing, education, right? How do you educate? Of course, you acquired all these chains of the clinics. So in Israel, that's uh, pretty uh, straightforward, but also in other countries uh, that, yeah, you're going to Germany, obviously, they're very welcome in Canada. But what's your point of view? So in, in Israel, uh, cannabis, uh, there is a research about cannabis in any university, any hospital in Israel. So it's well known. It's out there. Uh, people are talking about that. I think that it's completely different than what it was a few years ago. And for example, in Germany, what we have done, we took all the clinical data that we collected. And all the know-how that we collected for so many years of working directly with patients and be able to collect this data. And we build educational materials out of that, especially for this, the, the market, for, especially for professionals. Because the professionals are not professionals in cannabis. They don't have the clinical experience in that. So uh, this is exactly what we are doing. And I can tell you that uh, there is a great need for that. And we can see the feedbacks in uh, Germany, for example. Great. Thank you. Do I have uh, one more minute or two more minutes? I don't know. It looks like uh, they're not telling me anything. About so. One more minute. One, one more minute. minute. Can I? So, um, well, one minute, we don't do much. So let's just ask a simple question. Around the globe, you know, we have Europe, Middle East, North America, Latin America, now Asia too. Um, uh, where do you think the, the customers or, or patients are, are more knowledgeable nowadays or more inclined? Of course, you know, uh, let's exclude the United States uh, from this uh, uh, picture. And, and sorry, Antonio. Look, in Europe, there is, the estimates are that there are 90, 90 million people that use cannabis on a regular basis. 20% of which, so 18 million, use it for self-medication purposes. So we don't need to create the demand. We just need to create the access, as Alvaro and Oren and Jay were saying. So we need to give the ability to explain what cannabis is to the, to the professionals, to the doctors, and they are the ones who are going to prescribe when it comes to medical cannabis. The patients are there. People are using it. We are converting a, a, an industry that was completely illegal for 70 years into something that is legal, but we're not changing anyone's habit. Perfect. Thank you so much, Antonio, Alvaro, Jay, Oren. It was amazing speaking with you and sharing all of this news. Thank you, Wonderful Claudia. panel. Thank well, you all very much. Jay, Oren, Antonio, Claudia, <laughs> thank you all. Uh, Claudia, we'll see you tomorrow for your fireside. Oren, Jay, uh, and Antonio, we'll see you soon as well. Thank you all. Alvaro, if you wouldn't mind sticking around. Hey, Elliot, how are you? Oh, I'm well, man. It's good to see you again. Uh, yes. Always love listening to conversations around international legalization because it affects us all. Uh, and it affects anybody that's looking at the wonderful opportunity of Chiron Life Sciences. And that's what we're going to get to dive into here. I know we have a screen share that's about to pop up. But Alvaro, I'm going to let you take it away, sir. Thank you. Oh, sorry, sorry, Alvaro, one thing. We will have our first winner announced after this presentation. That was so rude of me. I'm so sorry, Alvaro. Uh, <laughs> we, yeah, we will. Yeah, well, we'll get you something too. We're going to announce the winner of our options newsletter right after the presentation. All right. Thank you. Now you can take it away. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. Um, good afternoon. My name is Alvaro Torres. I am the co founder and CEO of Cairo Life Sciences. We are. Uh, B2C, patient-focused global cannabis company from LATAM, focus on the markets of Latin America and the markets in Europe. Um, we started this company about four years ago. I would say that the last uh, 12 months have been you know, tremendously great for us in terms of starting to see that our thesis is starting to happen and how we look at the big opportunity in these markets that we're focusing on. When, I, when we started this company, we were really thinking about 
the big markets of Latin America, the big markets of Europe, and what the opportunity for disruption is, particularly here in Latin America. There's 75 million people in this region that you know have conditions such as chronic pain, anxiety, depression, epilepsy, and such. 53% of these 75 million people are, are taking uh, chronic pain. And when we start looking at what the disruption of this current opioid market in Latin, which is a billion dollars in Latin America, $4.8 billion in Europe, and how can medical cannabis disrupt that big market, which of course is now becoming a lot more in the news because of all these health problems that it can cause in the long term. And just to think about it, what, what that disruption can look like, you know, in Colombia alone, a neuropathic patient can cost to the insurance companies or to the government up to 5200 5, uh, US dollars per year. 80% of that, 80% of that is focused on pregabalin, morphine, bupromorphine, tramadol, opioid-based medication. I think when we thought about it four years ago, we say, how can we bring in medical cannabis as a you know, alternative, viable alternative, safe for patients and disrupt this huge market with something that can be better for the health-wise and economic-wise. And I think in particular in the last quarter, we've been able to show investors, uh, sorry, insurance companies and, and patients that this is, this is working. So we're very excited about it. Uh, we started looking at, at Europe about a year and a half ago. Europe is a, a tremendous market, as you know, the last panel that I was just on, we were, everybody was talking about with tremendous needs, lots of pain patients uh, with, you know, a, a lot more significant purchasing power. Uh, and, you know, in Germany with an insured market. And you know, when we think about the markets that we're targeting, particularly for this year, you know, our focus on Mexico, Colombia, Peru, Brazil, UK, and Germany. I think these six markets represent a, a very big opportunity. And I, see, I think certainly that the, the way Cairo has been doing our business, you know, uh, in, particularly in these conditions with the pandemic, it's very exciting what we can achieve as, and, and, and a leader in these markets in the next couple of years. So, you know, to go back to Colombia, where I'm calling you from right now, uh, and they, I think the model that we're going to be using all across Latin America, you know, we've always been considered ourselves as a B2C company. Uh, we are here to improve the life of quality of patients. We are here to disrupt the traditional pharmaceutical industry. And we are doing that, particularly in the, in the, in the, in the pain uh, area of, of treatment. We're focused in Latin America and, and, in, and in Europe. Uh, from the very beginning, we've been a company that knows and understands regulation. We were just talking in the panel how, that in, how important that is. I think that's a competitive advantage when it comes to building a cannabis business. We were the first company to sell in Colombia, first company to sell in Peru, first company to open a medical cannabis clinic. And yesterday, we opened our first medical cannabis clinic in Peru and started having patients. So being able to understand regulations, I think, is a it's a key uh, aspect of our business and certainly one that's helping us to grow. We've seen more than 9,000 uh, patients since we started in Colombia, more than 20,000 paid medical cannabis prescriptions as of the end of May. We've been growing at tremendous rate in terms of our medical cannabis pro uh, products, 140% quarter on quarter. And I think most importantly, because of that B2C aspect of our business, uh, we're able to enjoy very healthy gross margins at 80, 90%, which I don't think you're know, able to see many other markets. Why? Because at least in Colombia, Latin America, and our plan for expansion here, it's all about being vertically integrated. It's about producing low cost cannabis with a farmer grade level, um, and then be able to have you know, either on our own or partnering to be able to develop health centers, to be able to open clinics, be able to provide access, and then educate our own doctors and build that, that, that growth. And that's how we've been doing it. And, very exciting. We just, as I mentioned, we just opened our clinic in Peru, and it's exciting to know that we are able to build this very first international medical cannabis clinic that's providing and creating a lot of data that's helping us to develop the next stage of products, all, the, all focused on the improving the quality of life of patients. Um, in terms of the, uh, the, the things that I am very excited about in Latin America, we just got insurance company coverage in Colombia in December. I cannot understate how important that is for us and, and for the country and for access, which is really the one key word that we think about. But in Colombia, and I think the next two years, we will see that happening all across LATAM as insurance companies and governments realize that this is an opportunity to disrupt the opioid business, to be able to make access to healthcare a lot cheaper. And this is where the big opportunity is happening. In Colombia, you know, we have insurance coverage since December. Any patient that wants it can get it. Uh, and now it's just a matter of working with insurance companies to ensure that that access is happening. When we look at Colombia, we look at the strategy and, and the way that we think about our go-to-market. From the early beginnings of the company, is if we want to be a B2C company, how do we, uh, how are we able to provide more access? So you know, right now we have 11 uh, wholly owned health centers. 
uh, nine, uh, 10 here in Colombia, three main uh, hubs in, in the city of Bogota, so you know, eight million people, and then um, six and seven satellites that are spread all across the major cities. We just opened our first clinic in Peru, and that allows us to get more access to patients with the conditions for which medical cannabis can work. After that, I think the second part of what we do really well is how do we train doctors? How do we show them the evidence? Uh, starting from empirical to observational, and the more doctors are prescribing, which is happening right now, the more we can break those barriers, the more patients want the access, the more prescriptions are written, uh, the more we can think about access with insurance companies, and the more economics we can enjoy, which are then reinvesting the growth to our business to get to those million patients that we want to target in 2024. So the way that we, we've been able to show that, I think in that last quarter, it started to, to show us that we are on the right path, right? That you know, Colombia, Cairo, uh, Latin America, Europe, it's where Florida was four years ago. And it takes some time and it's challenging. And of course, the COVID pandemic doesn't help. But even in this situation, to be able to grow 140%, 120%, quarter on quarter, selling out you know, $50 unit products, enjoying 90% gross margins. And why this is happening is because you know, insurance coverage, which, which today accounts for 60% of our month on month sales, that's three times as much as last quarter. Uh, the product works because now we are able to monitor uh, how patients are feeling using the product. And when you can say 90% of our patients, and I'm talk, not talking about, about small amounts, I'm talking about nine to 10,000 patients are saying, well, after four months, I'm feeling really good and I'm dropping some more medications that I used to take before. That means the product works. That means the Chiron brand is helping people. Uh, and then of course, when we talk to insurance companies and show them, listen, out of those 55, $5,200 US that you spend a year on, on treating neuropathic pain patients, and we can reduce that cost by 60% because of a, you know, integrative care management using medical cannabis. That's the dis disruption aspect of our business. And we haven't been able to talk about it before because we just started getting all this information. And we're spreading it all around to insurance companies. And this is going to create a big floodgates of insurance coverage in Colombia. And then, therefore, the more evidence we're showing to other countries, the more that will happen. And, you know, lastly, we'll say that the retention rates that we're getting on patients are great. And retention for patients is very important for a business because that means sustainability of growth, that we need to focus on new patient acquisition, but also making sure that as many patients as, as we can are staying the program in a, in a responsible way. When we look at Latin America, I'm very excited about this year. It's been a tough process. It's been long regulations, everything that we talked in the last panel. But I think Cairo has a very unique way and a very smart way to approach this. We already started selling in Peru last year. Now we're opening our first clinic. I think that's going to provide tremendous growth for us. We are very excited about Mexico. Uh, you know, regulations for medical already in place. We'll be opening our first clinics in Mexico later half of this year. And the same with Brazil. Our first patients are coming very, very soon. And then we are looking now, how do we expand the Serenia base? And when we do that, when we have a Serenia clinic that has a network in Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and Brazil, that's just going to continue uh, to create great things for us. So looking back at Europe, what we've been doing in Europe, it's taking all this know-how, all this understanding and moving it there. And one of the things that we're learning, particularly in Latam and Colombia, is how do we treat patients? I mean, I'm not only excited about the growth in revenues and, and profitability, which are very important, but also the fact that we are able to grow our business, bring more patients, even in the middle of, of all this crisis that, of course, hasn't stopped in Colombia. But I think that just creates a lot of mode around the way that we're doing our business. We've been growing our, our total patient consults. And more important than that as well is how many patients are coming to our clinics and using medical cannabis. So growing from 18% of our patients in Q1, mostly heavily towards March, versus 6% of those patients in Q3 of last year. So, you know, when we start looking at those metrics and the way all these metrics are growing, even today, 3rd of June, it's very exciting what we're doing. And there's, of course, nobody else doing this. And I think that is building for us a very significant mode and a very, I would say, smart way to be able to own our, our future. You know? So it's going to be all about access and such. And when we look at what, how we take all that information and be able to capture the markets in the UK and Germany, we had our first human in Germany uh, in, in March of, of this year. We're already uh, have our, our next shipments in Germany in this quarter, which are a lot, a lot bigger. At the UK, we are having continuously more patients taking our products. And the more data, the more insight we're able to provide to educate doctors with the real world evidence that we have 
in, in Colombia and in Latin America, I think that's creating, that's going to create uh, not only more access, but certainly a uh, position from the patient, the doctors, that we know what we're talking about. When we talk about disruption, how do we do it and how we can translate those in, in, into the markets like Europe. So, you know, when we talk about what, what those things are, it's about medical education, it's about real world evidence. Uh, it's, it's all about uh, things that are gonna make and, and pay doctors and patients feel much better about about the way that we are, are growing. So again, that clinical expertise, how do we treat patients? How do you think about an integrative care for a patient with medical cannabis and making that patient feel better? And also saving money, which is of course, in these regions, a big part of healthcare costs are a big part of you know, people and government's expenditures. And the more we can figure out a way to reduce that so that that money can be spent somewhere else, the more economic growth is, these regions will have and the more we will be a part of that. So we're well, well on our track to those uh, million patients. You know, I think Europe is going to be a great opportunity. And when we look at what we've been able to achieve with all these circumstances, growth in revenues, uh, gross profitability, the fact that we're able to, to have these great, healthy uh, gross profits that because of that B2C strategy, I'm not here to sell uh, coffee for a dollar a pound. We're here to create brands that create value. And the more we do that, the more we can enjoy. I think, of course, for us growing in Colombia, low cost alternative, all of those things are absolutely true. And we've taken advantage for that to ourselves and also to the patients so we can provide an economic product that's going to change a lot of uh, people's lives. So, you know, in, a, in just to wrap it up, you know, when we're looking at what we want to do and we've been, you know, we're a lean company. We have, uh, you know, the cash resources to continue moving forward. Uh, we are right now in a position where you know, we can get, we can look at that, the cash flow neutrality in, in the short term because of the growth that we're seeing on, on our cannabis. And of course, it's not just about sales, it's about profitability of those sales and how sustainable those sales are. So the things that we measure are about how do we get to that sustainability. And uh, you know, we're targeting only six countries and it's a, it's a lot of load work, but you know, I think we've been able to go in a very difficult environment, particularly in Latin America, as you can imagine, what we can do after this, it's going to be really amazing. I mean, uh, next week, the, the most of the country of Colombia is opening up again, and that's gonna create a lot more growth for us. Uh, you know, certainly we're the leader in international medical markets, at least in Latama, we have a winning position in UK and, and Europe, where unique seed to patient strategy, vertically integrated, uh, with more than 80% gross profits. I think our business model in Colombia is proven to work. There's a reason we're doing it in Peru. We will do this in Mexico and Brazil and everywhere we can do this strategy. And it's proven to work. It's proven to bring profitability back to the company. And we're able, we are very excited about expanding that. Uh, I think the execution that we've shown, particularly these last 12 months is, is great. The, the environment hasn't been easy, but that, I think that's what's really appealing uh, what we like because, you know, Colombia, sales in Colombia, Peru, UK, and Germany in the middle of this pandemic is not everybody can say that, particularly with showing that growth. And I would say just lastly, our, our team, I, I'm, I'm blessed to be able to have a, a team that is so, that executes so high and thinks about uh, different things all the time. I mean, just, just this month, we launched a national campaign for cannabis access in Colombia. It's right now being broadcasted in every me major media outlet in this country offering patients more than 3,000 free consoles to open up the access to medical cannabis. To think that that is being done and led by our company and by our team, that couldn't be done a year ago. And to know that we're leading that and opening that access, the more patients understand the benefits of this, the more doctors are understanding this. And this type of coverage, these are the, the type of things that our team is able to execute because we understand that this is all about providing a different alternative and a different access. So with that being said, and I'm very excited about being here, being able to share a story. I think we have a unique story. It's we're in the very early stages of this. So, you know, Elliot, again, thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure. And we are more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Of course, my friend. Uh, awesome, awesome update. Thank you. We do have one from the chat uh, about insurance companies. How many are currently covering medical cannabis in Colombia? So uh, the regulation in Colombia basically from the government says, you know, any patient should be able to get it. I think right now we've been working with one insurance company, one of the largest. And what we're working today as we speak is to educate insurance companies so that they can open the administrative process to give access to the patients. Uh, so if I tell you 
that uh, at the end of this year we we'll expect four or five to happen. I think we're in the well track of that. The more evidence we're showing on the savings that these companies can have, that is creating a very positive effect. So a lot more we will come certainly this year because of what we're, we're the conversations that we're having with them. And the more access there is, the more patients are asking them, why don't I have the access that I could have in another insurance company? And that's also creating a bit of a you know tension in terms of, you know, I, I want my patients to leave. You know? So all of right. these things are very positive. Fantastic. We do have another one here. Uh, do you have enough medicine to supply the demand you're expecting or going to see? Well, you know, when I started this company, uh, particularly even four years ago, uh, cannabis companies were valued on the install capacity. For me, it's first build the demand, the supply will follow. There's a thousand people cultivating in Colombia, a thousand licenses. The prices of, of cannabis raw product have dropped more than 80% in the last 12 months. I don't think, for example, in issues of, of CBD, that supply will ever be a problem. In, 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 in that case, the way we build our facilities, we have the install capacity to extract a lot more that we can grow. And even in the growing side, if we need to, uh, it's very easy for us to continue to grow. So that's not really a concern I have, even for some of our products. We even, you know, for our epilepsy product, we even buy some flour from third parties in Colombia. And, you know, so when you're living in a country like this, it's not really a matter of supply. Uh, it's really a matter of how do you put in the patient's hands. And that's where our focus has been, not necessarily on building 200 hectares of land that you know you may not even have the ability to sell. And if you're going to sell them, you're going to have to sell them at a cheaper price all the time because somebody's going to be out there building the demand. Absolutely. Uh, we do have time for one more here. Yes, of course. Uh, great. Uh, is the NHS of the UK becoming more cooperative, or cooperative with cannabis therapies? Well, I, I think I think for sure. You know, we are part of this project called 2021. They recently announced the first results. More than 900 patients in a in a in a registry showing the the, the government and showing uh, other doctors the benefits of medical cannabis. I think the more uh, authorities start to see this, because it's been legal in the UK for some time. It's just the fear of some doctors of uh, whatever retribution they may have for prescribing it. But this type of registry, like 2021, are opening a lot of doors and a lot of uh, eyes. And you know, UK, a lot more people are talking about it. I, I think the NHS is just a matter of conservatism, you know. But it's a lot of fear that's being, I think, brought down all the time. But the more evidence that is shown, so yes, absolutely, I think the NHS is moving in the right direction. Speed is of the essence, of course. And I think it's just a matter of education. And the more education is happening, the more patients are taking it. And, you know, a year from now, we'll forget that it was so slow to start. <laughs> we'll be talking about huge numbers in the UK because this is happening exponentially. Right. Avado, been a pleasure having you, sir. Always a pleasure having you with us. Uh, we've seen some wonderful updates this year already. Uh, I think our chat very much enjoys having you. So thank you again for being here. The website's up on the screen. They are listed on the OTC. It is KHRNF, I believe, uh, TSXKHRN. Thank you so much again, Alvaro. Be well, my friend. Thank you, Eric. And thank you, everybody. Have a great day and stay safe, please. Thank you so much. Awesome. So that was a wonderful presentation from uh, Chiron Life Sciences that uh, immediately followed a really informative panel about uh, brand expansion internationally in the cannabis industry, what legalization uh, could do to affect that. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm learning a lot. I hope you all are too. Uh, we have a fun presentation coming up from the senior market strategist of Schaefer's Investment Research. But first, uh, we do have a very fun announcement. We do have our first winner uh, of our giveaway, Mohammed Amr, A-M-E-R, uh, Mohammed Amr. Uh, he has won uh, the subscription to our options newsletter. Thank you so much for participating. Now you may be wondering, Elliot, how on earth do I participate and win things from you? Uh, well, I got the answer for you right here, y'all. Uh, is participate in our Slido polls. That QR code right there, hover your phone over, over the screen. Uh, get it up. Uh, and you can participate throughout the day. We're going to do a few questions right now. Uh, so you all are correct, 100% correct on this. Let's go to the next question. When do you think cannabis will be legalized in the U.S.? All right. So this year, within the next five years, within the next 10 years, 10 plus years from now, please answer this. This is a huge topic of conversation in this conference. Uh, please give me your thoughts. For me, I personally think it'll be within the next five to 10. Uh, so within the next 10 years is probably what I would say, uh, decriminalized much, much sooner. Um, but it seems people may 
be a little bit more optimistic than I am. Uh, but if you do not answer this, unfortunately, I can't give you free things. I would love to give you free things. Please let me give you free things. All right, that third time. Uh, so y'all, please, uh, Slido question here. Again, Mohammed Amr was the winner of our first options newsletter. We do have another newsletter product to give away. And then at the end of the day, we have a free lifetime subscription to Benzinga Pro. Uh, I use Benzinga Pro daily. Uh, it is a wonderful item, uh, that I, I, a wonderful source of information and data for uh, my portfolio that really started to outperform once I started using Benzinga Pro. Uh, all right. So we have four people that have answered, four people that can possibly get the one of our prizes here. Um, great, so we have this one. The correct answer, y'all, is lock voting is, how do I, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, within the next five years, there is no correct answer. That's why there's no correct answer button here, because uh, this is your opinion. I'm smart, thank you. Uh, also, uh, that is it actually for announcements. So also nothing. Uh, all right. So next up again, we have the chief market strategist of Schaefer's Investment Research. Uh, his name is Tony Venosa. I'm excited to bring him over. Uh, welcome. Oh, that was my fault. Welcome, Tony. How are you? Good. How you doing? Good. I'm trying to get a lot of information out in a short amount of time, man. Uh, but I'm excited to open up the next 20 minutes to you. Teach us about investing. Teach us about investment research. Uh, and ideally, we can all become better investors because of it. Thank you. Okay, let's get started here. Good afternoon. Today, I would like to briefly discuss with you on adding an edge to your options trading in the cannabis sector, while at the same time, introduce to you some of the more liquid cannabis stocks that we follow and trade. My name is Tony Venosa, and I'm a senior market strategist with Schaefer's Investment Research from Cincinnati, Ohio. I've been with Schaefer's for nearly 12 years. Schaefer's Investment Research has been providing recommendation services and stock option education since its beginning in 1981 by founder and CEO Bernie Schaefer. Headquartered in Cincinnati, Ohio, Schaefer's Investment Research has become a leading and trusted source of research and analysis for individual investors in major financial media outlets. What I want to impress upon you today is the importance of having an edge, which is having a slight advantage over other market players. At Schaefer's, whenever we submit a trade to our subscribers, we must answer the question, why now? Why should this stock move in the direction you're entering and why should it move now? It sounds simple enough, but it's extremely important to ask yourself this question whenever you enter a trade. And more importantly, you must be able to answer the question. Another related question that needs an answer is what are one or two things that you know that others may not? It doesn't have to be complex, just something that most market players are not observing or taking notice in a particular stock. An example of an observation that I guarantee most people will know about is a head and shoulders topping pattern. We are trying to avoid spots where other people will be inclined to enter or exit. We want, to, we want to identify entry points where the crowd is unlikely to join us. Today, I'm gonna to show you some of the ways we answer these questions when we issue trades. And by the end of my talk, you will benefit by learning some of the edges we use to find winning trades. The single most important takeaway I want you to remember is you must have an edge to consistently profit in the options market. Not only because it'll lead to profitability, but it'll also build the confidence you'll need to succeed and you'll need confidence so on your higher conviction trades, you can increase your position side, size. So I want you, want you to ask yourself in every trade you execute, do I have an edge in this trade? At Schaefer's, what sets us apart from the crowd is our methodology, which is a three-tiered approach to analyzing the markets, which Bernie Schaefer aptly named expectational analysis which we believe gives us a leg up on the competition. We use a combination of fundamental analysis, technical analysis, and investor sentiment to uncover trading opportunities the rest of the crowd is missing. So let's, let's first discuss some of the simple ways we use fundamentals. A company can choose to return capital to its shareholders in one of two ways. The first one is through issuing dividends, where percentage of a company's earnings are returned to their shareholders. And the second is through stock buybacks, 
where a company repurchases their shares in the marketplace, thus reducing the number of outstanding shares available and will effectively increase the company's earnings per share. During the past 15 years, stock buybacks have become standard operating procedure for many companies. There's two ways a company can do a buyback. The first is through a direct repurchase from shareholders. And the more common way is buying back shares on the open market. Stock prices tend to rise on, the, on these announcements, which may mean companies will pay more to execute the buyback. The key to analyzing buybacks is the percentage of shares outstanding that are being repurchased rather than the absolute dollar amount. A stock buyback of six to 8% of all outstanding shares can make us take notice. A stock buyback of 10% or more can be perceived as a strong buy. Obviously, this is just one key aspect and should not be viewed as the sole reason for jumping into a stock. The fundamental applications of a stock buyback are merely one thing to consider when picking stocks. Due to the infancy of the cannabis sector, there's not been much action in the way of stock buybacks, but I do have three examples to show you. This is a chart of Scott's Miracle Group company, ticker SMG, which offers hydroponic products to help users grow plants. They announced a stock buyback on Fe February 2nd, 2020 of $750 million, which at that time represented 12.5% of the outstanding shares. Since then, shares have risen 85%. This is a chart of tobacco giant Altria, ticker MO, which has a 45% equity stake in Kronos Group, ticker CRON. They announced a buyback on January 28th of this year of $2 billion. Since that announcement, shares have risen over 22%. Lastly, alcohol producer Constellation Brands, ticker STZ, which took a $4 billion equity investment in Canopy Growth, ticker CGC, the largest pot stock in the world. They announced a $2 billion buyback of January 7th of this year. Shares are up 9% since this announcement. Another tool to our fundamental analysis is observing insider transactions, which I think is underrated and not widely, widely followed. Insider transactions are legal transactions conducted by corporate insiders, such as directors and CEOs who buy and sell stock in their own companies. They must report their trades to the SEC within two business days. Knowledge of a company insider buying or selling a large number of shares would be valuable to an investor. SEC rules prevent insiders from trading company stock within any six month period. So if an insider is buying their company's stock an investor can reasonably assume the company's fundamentals are in decent shape. Nehat Sehun, a renowned professor and researcher in the field of insider trading at the University of Michigan, found out that when executives bought shares in their own companies, the stock tended to outperform the total market by 8.9% over the next 12 months. Conversely, when they sold shares, the stock underperformed the market by 5.4%. This is a graph courtesy of marketbeat.com, which shows the past three to four years of insider buying and selling of Amaris, ticker AMRS. Amaris's connection to the cannabis sector is through the research and production of biosynthetic cannabinoids, including CBG, which, was, which is referred to as the mother of all cannabinoids. Here's Amaris's stock chart going back to 2019. The green circles roughly depict all insider purchases during that quarter. The second quarter of 2019 saw $38 million of purchases with one director making a $4.3 million purchase. In the first half of 2020, the same director made an additional pur purchase of $11 million. This same director took enormous profits on April 13th of this year by selling 4.6 million shares at $14.96, equating to around $70 million. Now I'm not recommending, just one second here. Now I'm not recommending to anyone trading in the cannabis sector to buy a stock based solely on, insider, on an insider purchase. I would consider insider purchases and sales to be one tool 
that many market participants are not using in their own, in, in their own analysis. I combine my analysis with other factors to find an optimal place for entries and exits. This is a daily chart of 22nd Century Group, ticker XXII, which is a biotechnology company with prior experience working in the tobacco industry. They work on developing new hemp and cannabis plants with optimized and unique cannabinoid profiles. On the chart, I highlighted two dates this year in green. On March 16th, a director for 22nd Century Group purchased 52,400 shares at $2.86. And two weeks later, the, C the CEO purchased 15,000 shares at $3.23. On April 26, a month later, shares made a new 52-week high at $6.07, nearly doubling their investments. So let's quickly move on to technical analysis. I'm going to show you a couple of the technical factors I like to follow. One of the most basic concepts of technical analysis is support and resistance, but I think can be the most powerful. It really is a simple concept and keeping it simple is a plus in trading the markets. So key points below the current price are known as support where buyers could be expected. And those above the current price are resistance where sellers could be expected. The levels I'm about to show you will help for potential entries and exits with the objective of avoiding crowded trades and answering the question, why now? The optimal trades to make are the ones where multiple levels come together, thus strengthening the case for support or resistance. We believe paying attention to a company's market capitalization level can reveal important levels not found on a typical price chart. It amazes us how an how market cap round levels such as the 1 billion, 5 billion, 10 billion, et cetera, can often act as magnets while also serving as support and resistance levels. Here's a chart of Cure Leaf Holdings, ticker CURLF, based in Wakefield, Massachusetts, which engages in the production and sale of cannabis through retail and wholesale channels. The, plot, the chart plots the market capitalization levels for Cure Leaf going back to June of 2019. As we can see in the chart, the round number $5 billion market cap level acted as resistance in 2019. Finally, in August 2020, shares broke this level. They faded back for a retest and then proceeded to rally to the $10 billion market cap level in January of this year. Shares continue to consolidate around this $10 billion market cap level. This is a chart of Canadian company Aurora Cannabis, ticker ACB which produces and distributes medical cannabis products worldwide. On the chart, Aurora Cannabis first reached the $10 billion market cap milestone in October of 2018 before following all the way back to the $5 billion market cap level. A subsequent rally back to the $10 billion market cap level in 2019 formed a double top pattern. Shares fell all the way back to the $1 billion market cap level where it's been basing since. Here's a chart of Innovative Industrial Properties, ticker IIPR, the only publicly traded cannabis-focused real estate investment trusts. In June of 2019, shares broke through the $1 billion market cap level for the first time in its young history. Shares chopped around this level for the next 10 months until a strong rally in the latter half of 2020 lifted shares all the way to the $5 billion market cap level in February of this year. From there, shares peaked and have been connected have been correcting below this $5 billion market cap level. Round number levels are another simple way to analyze price charts. Round number levels such as 10, 20, 50, and 100 can also act as magnets for stocks. This is a chart of the Cannabis ETF Alternative Harvest, ticker MJ, which is one of the more liquid names in the space. If you need immediate exposure to the cannabis sector, this ETF is your best bet. Looking at the daily chart, we can observe shares trudging along in 2020, finding support on each test of the round number $10 level. Next round number, the next round number, the $20 level, acted as a magnet for shares where they doubled from November 2020 to January of this year. 
Shares relaxed for a couple weeks before an unsustainable rally just above the $30 level produced a blow off top. The $20 level has been a sticky level since. If you are considering a purchase in the can cannabis sector, the basing action above the $20 level is looking promising. Here's a two year chart of, can of Canadian company Canopy Growth, ticker CGC, which is also listed on the NASDAQ. The $20 level acted as resistance on three occasions on the chart in 2020. Finally, in November, shares broke this level and quickly rallied up just shy of the $30 level in early December. Shares formed a bull flag for the remaining part of the month before a sizable rally through the $30 level and up through the $50 level where it had its blow off top. I want to emphasize the importance of looking at levels on a chart and you'll start to notice how stocks react and act around these psychologically significant numbers. Simplicity can sometimes be a beautiful thing. Your analysis and specific stocks may not always uncover elegant examples as I've showed, but putting in the effort to discover stocks that do respect certain numbers will be rewarded. Let's move on to the final piece of expectational analysis, sentiment. One of the sentiment indicators we heavily use is the buy to open put call ratio, which we feel can reflect the degrees of optimism or pessimism in a stock or index. We calculate the put call ratio by simply taking the number of bought open puts traded on the day and divide that by the number of bought open calls traded that day also. We can calculate these ratios on individual stocks, indices, or the overall market. The theory is that near market lows, the put call ratio will be high, usually greater than one, reflecting more puts being traded relative to call options, thus reflecting pessimism on the stock. When this ratio is near or at an extreme, it can mark a bottom. Conversely, an extreme low in the put call ratio can reflect strong optimism in a name, which could signal a potential top. Thus, the put call ratio is a contrary indicator when it reaches extreme highs or lows. This is a chart of Jazz Pharmaceuticals, ticker JAZZ, which acquired GW Pharma in early 2021, which is the first company to have the only FDA approved drug that is derived from cannabis substances. The chart shows instances where the 10 day buy to open put call ratio spiked, indicating put purchases were rising relative to call purchases which is a sign of pessimism. The rolling over action in the ratio provided the clue on when to enter on the long side. Short interest is one of my favorite go-to indicators for sentiment. It measures the level of investor pessimism by the amount of shares sold short on a, on a particular stock. Short sales are reported by brokerage firms twice a month, usually on the 1st and 15th with a one week delay. Every stock has a reported short interest, which is released to the public. There are two primary ways we use to measure the level of short interest. The first is a short interest ratio, which is the total number of shares sold short divided by a stock's average daily volume. The ratio represents a rough estimate on how many days it would take investors to buy back all their shorted shares at the stock's average daily volume. A reading of five is viewed as heavy pessimistic sentiment. The other way we measure short interest is a percentage of a stock's total float, which is the total number of shares of a company available for trading. A reading of 10% is viewed as heavy pessimism. By checking for changes in a stock's short interest, we are able to gauge the public's level of pessimism toward a stock. Generally speaking, a high short interest number indicates Investors have a negative outlook on the company and expect the shares to decline, which allows them to profit. From I'm going to do this left here, Tony, just to let you know. Okay, thank you. From a contrarian viewpoint, we see this pessimism as bullish if the stock is in an uptrend. Because a short seller has unlimited risk, the pressure to cover will build as shares continue to march higher. There is a flip side of this analysis. Elevated short interest can be viewed as bearish in the context of a downtrending stock. We consider the bears to be in control of the stock and continued downward momentum gives the shorts little reason to exit their winning trades. 
Short interest in Kronos Group, ticker CRON, which can be seen in the bottom pane of the chart, began to rise in April of 2019, which coincided with a peak in shares. Bears took control by increasing their position from 19 million shares short to just over 64 million shares in March of last year, sending shares down 76% from its peak. A substantial short covering period is currently taking place, which began to accelerate last fall, sending shares from $5 to over $10 in February. Okay, that's all I have for you today. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody, including Ben Zenga, for giving me the opportunity to briefly discuss uh, and introduce you some of the ways we analyze companies in the cannabis sector at Schaefer's Investment Research. If you have any questions, please send them over and I'll try to reply as soon as possible. Tony, thank you so much, man. Really thank appreciate you. being here. You always drop a knowledge bomb on us. So thank you for going into some cannabis stocks. I think super valuable for all of us. Thank Thanks you. again. All right. Thank appreciate you. it. Uh, that is Tony Venosa, Senior Market Strategist of Schaefer's Investment Research. Uh, awesome. Love having Schaefer's with us. We really do always get a nice uh, bit of education there on investing. Uh, next up, uh, we have, uh, I'm excited about this chat. I got the opportunity to moderate Stephen Miles uh, from Sharp Capital Advisors. There he is. How are you, sir? Hello, Elliot. How you doing, buddy? I am well. I'm well. Good to see you again. You are uh, well. This is our second discussion of the year. I'm very excited about it. Uh, I think we have some poignant topics. Uh, and y'all, as you listen to this, uh, Steve is a uh, is a is, is a genius when it comes to understanding the markets, understanding uh, you know what to look for in investment opportunities. Uh, and I think we're going to look at the next five years or so uh, and, and really kind of dive into that. So, Steve. Uh, my knowledge is not what they're looking for here. So I'm going to turn it over to you. For the you know for those that may have missed our February conference, can you give us just a quick update on who Sharp is, what you focus on within the cannabis space? Absolutely. And thank you for those kind words. Of course. <laughs> it's, it's rare that somebody is so complimentary of me, so I really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> I always enjoy speaking to you as well, Elliot. I hope you know that. Thank so, you. yeah, I, I uh, Steve Miles, I've been... Um, uh, providing advisory services in the private capital markets to privately held companies now for my entire career. And I'm about to be a grandfather. So it's been quite some, uh, quite a long time. Congrats. Uh, yeah. I'm the, uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm the managing partner of a, of a firm called Livingstone that I co-founded in 07. Uh, Sharp is an affiliate of Livingstone that we started a couple years ago to focus exclusively on uh, cannabis. Uh, but to provide the same services and specifically uh, we, we're primarily uh, M&A advisory, primarily on the sell side. So representing privately held companies and privately managed sale transactions and uh, uh, the same capital, uh, private capital markets where we're raising uh, debt or equity, again, primarily for privately held businesses and primarily in private capital market transactions. and. Those are the types of deals we, we're working on at, at Sharp, just to give you a, a flavor. Uh, we're raising uh, debt uh, securities uh, for a three-state private MSO. We're raising debt and equity for, for another private five-state MSO. And we, we just got hired on our first uh, sell side, which is a, a single-state operator, but, but of size. So those are the types of transactions we, we work on, and uh, we're very bullish on the sector and, and excited to be involved with it. Fantastic. So you have killer insights. You're just going to tell us all what everybody's doing and where to put their money. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> joke. <laughs> so, all right. So at, at the end of our last discussion in February, you left us with some advice. Uh, the advice was focus on proven operators in limited license states. Uh, we've had some discussion on this today uh, about what those, you know, what limited license states are out there. Uh, but I'd love your thoughts uh, on any states, specifically ones that may have come online between the end of February and now, uh, that may match the advice you gave us or that that pique your interest, if you will. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I, you know, I think that advice is is still sound and will will always be sound. You know, operators in, in limited license states have you know basically a state mandated uh, oligopolistic uh, structure, which which generates very high margins and, and protected uh, businesses. So that's always going to be attractive, and you've seen money flow in into those states uh, like Illinois and and Pennsylvania and 
Maryland and Massachusetts, which has a different structure. But uh, so, but but states that are coming online, for instance, we we're very excited about Missouri. Uh, we're just completing a capital raise for a ground up uh, vertical in, in Missouri. Uh, we took this on because it's it's two operators that are very proven from a different similar medicinal market where they've built and and generated profitable businesses in those markets so we thought they'd be good teams to back but missouri is interesting because uh, you know it's it's because of the residency requirement uh in the in the law they really boxed out msos from being meaningful players in that market and they also really constricted capital flows in the market but the, but the medicinal program is extraordinarily strong. They already have 165 some odd thousand patients, same size as Ohio. Most people assume it's going adult use in 2022, uh, but but there really aren't any well capitalized players down there, or only a handful. So that would be an example of a very attractive market. We think we're going to see a similar dynamic as these southeastern states uh, legalize and, and put medicinal programs in place. They're going to try to protect some amount of local market uh, participation. And, and so there, there's still going to be a lot of opportunities for the non-MSOs to participate in this industry, in our opinion, in, in, in many of these states. That's super interesting. Now, we, we always touch on that next wave of entrepreneurs, uh, where they're going to come from, what they're going to look like, and perhaps they come from a market like a Missouri, uh, you know, where they have the opportunity to get that step ahead. Uh, that's super interesting. Um, yeah, but at the so, same time, though, I mean, to your point about the next entrepreneur, I mean, we're we're equally bullish on uh, the Western states. We're, we're bullish on California. We're bullish on Colorado. We're bullish on Arizona. Uh, we're trying to actually bring on a partner right now to cover the whole West for us, you know, which if you cool. Arizona, Nevada, Utah, Oregon, Washington, California, you're talking about a $20 billion market right now. And, um, you know, I think the general consensus is it, oh, the MSOs don't like California and Colorado. Oh, th th those markets are, are too scary because of the regulatory framework or because of how mature they are. But we view it quite the opposite. We, we think that the operators who are building successful business models in those hyper competitive, very mature markets of California and Colorado and, and, and Michigan has a similar dynamic a few years behind. But the operators that are going to that build their businesses in the face of that type of competitive landscape can really take their show on the road and be very, very successful in these more limited license uh, <laughs> markets, particularly as the limited license markets ultimately open up, which which they will as a matter of course. That's, that's super interesting. I mean, uh, the whole theme of this conference really, I mean, it really was unintentional, but just because of what's happening in the market is cash flow and consolidation. Uh, you know, so we'll get to that in a second, but uh, I'd like to dive a little bit more specifically, I guess, into that. Uh, and, and that's really vertical integration. So, you know, whether it's through regulations or strategy, uh, we, we've seen a variety of models as you have just, you know, touched on pretty eloquently, uh, specifically uh, about how vertical integration is driving M&A. Um, and I'd love to get your thoughts on how it's trending right now. Uh, you know, whether it is by regulation or strategy, uh, you know, or success? Yeah, well, look, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, not all markets uh, allow vertical integration and, and certainly lots of them have uh, rules in terms of the number of retailers you can own or the number of cultivation you could own that that put a, a governor on the amount of vertical integration. But our, our thesis is that for the foreseeable future, if you can be vertically integrated in a market, you need to be vertically integrated in a market. Uh, you know, and, and that's because there's an enormous amount of uh, margin capture by being vertically integrated uh, because, you know, the cultivator is often operating on a 70 percent margin and the, and the retailer is operating on a 18 percent margin. So, so to blend those, you get a much more profitable business. There, there's obviously huge 280E implications to being vertically integrated and being able to shift that uh, earning stream around the organization to more tax advantageous uh, entities like the cultivation. The ability to, to control your supply chain, uh, particularly in these markets that are early and nascent and there's not sufficient supply. So you have a lot of retailers, for instance, I mean, truly ran away with Florida, 
because you know they had they were the only people that had any supply and they had it on all their shelves and so that's where you were able to get the product um so there, there's enormous benefits to vertical integration um that uh and it's you know look i i did deals for years in, in the garbage business and in the garbage business you want to be vertically integrated you want to own the landfill and you want to pick up the trash from the guy's curb because otherwise if you're just picking up the trash from the guy's curb very low margin very capital intensive and if the guy at the landfill decides he wants to start charging you double and there's no other options you got a real problem so you know it, it, and, and i also always joke people well the beer industry is not way well yeah but there's a reason that they put the three-tier system in place for the beer industry after prohibition because they knew that you could create monster profitable businesses if you were allowed to be vertically integrated in in that manner and and so it's true for the cultivators too the cultivators want to own retail you know you look at a state like michigan for instance michigan didn't have enough uh, of its own cultivation. Everybody ran around and built cultivation. All manner of cultivation is coming online. Well, now all of a sudden the cultivators are having trouble finding sufficient retail distribute outlets for their, for their product, particularly because some of the big cultivators are vertically integrated. They own their own retail and they're not making it really easy to put somebody else's product on their shelves for obvious reasons. Someday they'll have to because the consumer will demand it. But, but right now, the consumer is just happy that there's a store around the block that has product. And so, you know, it, so now all the cultivators are trying to buy retail in Michigan. The retailers actually don't make much money, but they know that they've, they're sitting on a pretty valuable asset all of a sudden and they're bidding up the price of it. So it, it's, it's uh, you know, it's you and I have discussed this before, you know, someday will there be interstate commerce? Someday will these, uh, all these cultivations be albatrosses? Will there be mega farming? Will it be an agricultural commodity and a retail and a CPG? Probably, uh, of course, I, uh, no crystal ball, probably not within my productive life. But, but for the foreseeable future, to be vertically integrated in these state markets that allow for it has enormous advantages. Uh, that was a wonderful answer, Steve. Uh, I do have a follow-up question, though, for that. Uh, for these retailers in Michigan specifically, uh, we see a variety of strategies. Uh, I know some that you know maybe have four dispensaries. I know some that their goal is to have 100. I is it the same percentage uh, of, of success, of revenue, You know whether you have 100 or four? Uh, do you need to own the cultivation in order to make true profits in that state? It's such a great question. I mean, uh, you know, uh, are there benefits to scale at retail? You know, not huge, right? Uh, if you have 20 in, a, in an area, you can have a district manager that's covering 20 as opposed to covering three. You've got some buying power, so you're going to be getting a little bit better prices to the extent that you have, you know, a lot more retail. So there, there are some uh, scale advantages, but, but not as many as would be, you know, immediately mm -hmm. obvious. But I... That still doesn't mean that it's not a good strategy. You have a lot of re huge retail, but like we just went out to California a few weeks ago. I mentioned we're going to try to hire somebody out there, but we wanted to check it out. We haven't spent a lot of time out there and kind of traveled from San Fran down to LA on a, looking at dispensaries. How can there not be a mega retailer in, in California? I, I don't understand it. The biggest retailer, I think, is, as we're told, is you know 10 or 15 units. Well, I, it sure makes sense to me that there would be a 100 or 150 unit operator in California, but but not so much because it's going to change the, the dynamic of the retail operations. It's probably still going to be a 17, 18% margin business, but your ability to touch the consumer, you know, this is an industry that's still very much in the experiential stage. Again, I, what gets me so excited about this industry is not that, uh, you know, uh, guys like me, when they were 25 who buy bags of weed for $75, all of a sudden they're going to start buying it legally for two twenty-five. I don't think that's the play. <laughs> I think the play is a bunch of new people are, 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 are experiencing the plant for the first time in, in all manner of different form factors, in all mm -hmm. manner of different dosages, but they need to experience that. They need to, and that can only happen at the point of sale. And, and so when everybody talks about building brands and it's so important and it is so important, but how would you ever do that if you're not touching the consumer? And the difference in experiences that we had at certain retailers in California were night and day, walked into one and there was so much product Thought my head was going to pop off. I never could have figured out what, what I wanted or, or how to deal with it. We walked into the other one, the Bud Tedder met us at the entryway, walked us through the entire store. Here's this, here's that. I'll leave you alone if you want. Ask me any questions. It was completely different. And we did experiment with a few different things. And that's us. We're in the industry. 
<laughs> so, yeah. Wow. So that I mean, it's, I still think that veto is is very important for the foreseeable future for the reasons I, I just mentioned. And it's kind of a necessary evil and it's not terribly profitable and it's plagued by 280E. I mean, I would never want to own a single one <laughs> to win, you know, seven or eight million, but, but to own 10 or 15 of them in a, in a market that's valued by other people. And then particularly, as we've discussed, if when you do go to exit, if you're selling to a cultivator who's in need of that distribution capability, he's going to pay a lot more than what he would otherwise pay. Thank you for that. That was awesome. Um, all right, so let's get to the question of the day. Federal legalization. What are your expectations, timeline? And as we do this, I wanna show you something that a few members of our audience filled out this poll uh, just recently, uh, and they seem to think it's gonna be within the next five years. So we gave them, albeit, you know, not like yearly options wow. here, but in five-year increments, <laughs> <laughs> you know, got to be somewhat judicious. Uh, but Steve, what do you think, man? Well, I, what I think is is based on what I hear from, uh, you know, lawyers and lobbyists who are pretty intimately involved. And I'm sure the same folks that lots of people today have, have interacted with. But, but it does seem like we're going to that there will be incremental federal legalization, uh, hopefully starting with, you know, safe banking, perhaps the MORE Act, uh, but but that there's a lot of wood to chop to get to full D-class uh, in terms of social equity, uh, in terms of expungement, in terms of just a, in, the fact that Biden doesn't really want uh, uh, full legalization, uh, the fact that it's a pretty effective political tool for the Democrats that they use against the Republicans quite uh, in quite a savvy manner. <laughs> so I don't think we're going to see D-class or, or, or full legalization, which I'm sure is great news to, it certainly is to us and our business, it is to all the MSOs, uh, not rooting for full legalization anytime soon. But I do think that we're going to have important incremental steps and, and safe banking would be huge in terms of freeing up additional sources of capital and, and bringing down some of that cost of capital to something more reflective of the actual risk profile uh, to get more uh, act or states, any type of states act where, you know, all of a sudden private equity could participate in it potentially. And uh, I, I think we'll, we will see those things because it has enough support with, with Schumer and, 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 and Booker and the others. So that, that's kind of our expectations. That by before the midterms, we're going to have something that feels good and probably gives another boost to these these stocks and another boost to transaction activity. Not that it needs a, a huge boost. Um, and then we're probably not going to see much more until uh, the next administration. But who knows? Yeah. Well, I, I I think there are some people out there praying you're wrong, and some people praying you you are underestimating. The timeline. <laughs> um, so, I mean, people on opposite ends of that scale, it's very interesting to hear it from your perspective as somebody who is pretty deep into the capital structure of it. Um, so, as we kind of wrap up here, you know, obviously we have an audience of investors. If these investors or, or any investor you speak to uh, isn't sold yet on cannabis as an investment opportunity, what do you say to them? Uh, what, what advice do you have for those people? I mean, it's just, you're just, I, I would think just missing, you know, a, a gold rush, you know, I'm still very uh, much in the early stages of, of a gold rush. It's, it's really nothing short of that. I mean, you have an industry that's grown from a standing start to $20 billion in a period of, you know, six or seven years. Uh, everybody uh, expects that to continue to grow at 25% plus per year as new states come online, as new consumers come to the product, as, as states' infrastructure builds out. So to have, and you have margins in the industry that are that are really, you know, quite astronomical. I don't, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't very, I'm not very good at analyzing the public companies. I don't, I'm not a public market guy to begin with. I own the stocks. I own a couple of the stocks that I believe in and, and I, I'm in a, a, a an index fund because I just think all, you know, we're going to continue to have incremental federal legalization. We have, you know, continued uh, all the negativity around this drug going away. So I just think the whole sector will continue to, to rise at a nice clip. There'll be winners and losers, uh, of course. Um, but, you know, it's so profitable. 
<laughs> it's just so <laughs> wildly proud. I mean, you're growing a plant that you know yields a half a pound that in some states you can sell for three thousand dollars a pound. It's I mean, you just don't have to be all that much of a mathematician to figure out how wildly profitable that is. I know there's a ton that more that goes into it to actually get it to the consumer package tested, I, of course. But but the margins are astronomical. The growth is fantastic. The, uh, the, 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 the charlatans, for the most part, are out of the industry. The people running, the management teams and the, the, the caliber of people that they're bringing onto their C-suite teams are impressive and are real people. And so, and I, and I think you have a lot, uh, still have a good, healthy mix of people that understand the culture and, uh, you know, enough of that to, you know, because that is important, of course, where it came from. Uh, that's an important consumer base. But there's a lot of people that know how to build businesses in the face of astronomical growth. And and so uh, I, I think that uh, you, you would, I, I don't know how you could not invest in the sector, to, to be honest. You heard it from Steve Miles himself. <laughs> Steve, that was fantastic. You gave some really insightful answers on vertical integration, uh, on federal legalization, on what markets that interest you, like a Missouri, maybe the West Coast, for different reasons, albeit. But uh, I, I really appreciate you being here. And it's nice to get an update from you. And next event, October 13th and 14th, we will be in person. Uh, right. Maybe I think we can do this on an actual stage in front of actual people. I can't wait. Hopefully we have weather like we have today. So, Oh, man. Well, it's pouring outside, so rub it in. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, thank you. Thank you again, my friend. We'll Thanks, see you, buddy. Look forward to talking to you soon. Sounds good, man. Bye. Awesome. So I appreciate very much Steve being with us. I always think he drops incredible knowledge from the investment bank perspective, uh, an advisor perspective, and somebody that is just generally entrenched in this industry. Uh, the conversation doesn't stop there, though. Uh, I am very excited for the next uh, discussion, not led by me, albeit led by a much, much cooler, suave guy than me. He's got better hair. D got just better a couple years younger, that's all. That oh, is, man. That's all I got on you. <laughs> all right. Well, Javier Hase, welcome back. Managing Director of Benzinga Cannabis. Uh, after this discussion, ideally, we can do some more polls. I'm going to let you welcome on a good friend of Benzinga and somebody who I think uh, works a lot enough with the companies to uh, drop some great insights here. So I'm going to back out. I'm going to let her come over. Enjoy it. So uh, as um, Steve was just saying in, in the prior session, this is a great time to invest in the cannabis industry. And today I am joined by someone helping uh, other people do exactly that. Uh, her name is Judy Rinkus. She's the founder and CEO of Seat to Sale Funding. Judy, how are you doing? I'm doing well, uh, Javi. And well, well, yeah, you may have the best hair, but but um, Elliot, he, he definitely has the best eyebrows I think I've seen since Brooke Shields, if, you, if I'm you know, aging myself there. So, yay. <laughs> a Brooke Shields. I love that. Uh, I'm going to use it. I'm going to use it next time I have to compliment him. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about yourself, please. I mean, you, sure, Julie, of C2Cell Funding and what you do. So, um, uh, the I I I start. I'm the founder of Seed to Sale Funding. Um, I currently have uh, four other team members. I started this um, this firm almost a uh, little over two years ago. Um, prior to that, I had been in um, commercial banking and commercial lending my entire career since college graduation. And we're not going to go into how long ago that was. And <laughs> um, uh, and so. Um, and the way I got drawn into it was uh, I had I, I was doing commercial lending. And after I left banking, per se, I was getting, you know, contacted by my former very good borrowers, commercial real estate developers, uh, business people who wanted to get into the industry. And this was shortly after Michigan went with recreational. I'm, in, I'm located in Michigan and mm -hmm. they couldn't oh. find anything. Yep, they were used to going. They were used to going, uh, you know, typically to a to a bank because that's what they were most used to. And so, over the course of a few months, I was able to build up a network of around twenty different direct lenders, um, and also recruit four of my um, former banking buddies. And um, huh. so, we started this that's firm. Cool. And was, um, it, was it was it hard? Was it hard to convince started, people working in banking to come work in? Cannabis, which to most people is just weed, right? 
Like it's, um, <laughs> you know, banking, regulated banking is, I don't even want to use the right term. It's a very difficult place to work and has been for about the last 10 years since the Great Recession. Mm -hmm. So no, it really wasn't that hard to do. <laughs> um, you know, there were just so many th things we could, even then we couldn't do. Uh, our hands were tied, yet we knew they were good deals. And um, and so there's some things that we'll probably hit upon um, with regard to my business model that that makes, um, makes this a very fun and interesting um, industry to be working in. Um, so anyway, this started about two years ago. We've um, we've done almost fifty million dollars of transactions since that time with just our small boutique team. So the way we our, our business model is basically we're we are consultant and but we specialize in um, the placement of debt capital per se. Our capital that our I call them my lenders. Some might call them investors. Um, they mm -hmm. uh, they are non dilutive in nature. Um, all they want to get out of a particular transaction is the payment of their interest, any fees, and eventually be repaid for their principal. So they're not mm -hmm. taking any part of the business. They're not participating in the upside. They're leaving that to the actual sponsors, founders, and, and th those investors. Um, and um, so uh, we we do this uh, for, for, it's a fee-based approach. Um, and a couple of things um, that, well, I'll let it. I'll let it stay there. You wanted the history. That's kind of where we sit right now. Um, mm -hmm. So we've done around fifty million in transactions. Um, we have right around forty million dollars in an active pipeline right now, which is defined by um, the the clients have paid us a, a small retainer, and um, we've done the initial vetting, and we're in the process of getting enough information to be able to send it to one or more of our commercial lenders for review. So it's uh, going to be another good year. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Let's hope so. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, you know, we, th there's several questions I have from from your introduction. Probably, I'd start with with why go for debt financing versus equity financing, right? Uh, some may argue, yeah, equity means you give out, you know, you give someone else a piece of your business, but you are not the sole responsible for the potential downside, right? You're not on the hook for debt, right? But so like, what, what's the benefit of debt financing versus equity financing? Well, I think in the long run, um, almost always um, uh, debt financing is gonna be more cost effective. It may not seem like it upfront, you know, there's certain things that have to be paid for, there are, lender fees, OID, if you will, there's, um, you know, the interest rates are certainly much higher than what a lot of uh, commercial borrowers are used to. Um, it, you know, I, I figure without banks being in the commercial lending, the banks take up about 50% of the US banking space in general for all industries. So you mm -hmm. take them out, you're, you know, you don't have a lot of competition. And of course, that's what's part of what's driving up these, um, these returns and these rates. Mm -hmm. um, so at first, you might think, why would I sign up for that? But if you if you put pen to paper, and you figure out if you believe in your business plan, and you believe that you have a tremendous amount of upside, why would you share that just with someone, which is what you're doing when you're selling more equity? And um, it, in, and then your the, the existing investors that you have in your business should appreciate a prudent amount of equity in the capital stack yeah. for yeah. the reason that that's going to increase their ROI. Yeah. And so um, that's that's really the thing that people have to wrap their arms around. Um, you know, mm -hmm. people are di everyone's different. Everyone has a different goal for what they want their um, venture to come out to be. But certainly, if you expect um, to be able to perhaps sell your um, your a company or your uh, whatever, uh, you know, in say five years time, whatever it might be, um, and you want to monetize that, um, having some having some debt capital um, in a prudent fashion um, really yeah. makes a lot of sense. Oh yeah. No, definitely. And, and it's, as you were saying earlier, a non-dilutive way to, to finance your business. Now, you know, right. a quick follow, who is this for, right? Which, which kind of companies would benefit the most from, from debt financing versus equity financing? 
Well, we are concentrating, it, that pl certainly plant, plant touching um, businesses not only can probably benefit the most, but have the most options. Not that there's tons of options out there, but probably the most. Part of that is, and probably people more on the cultivation and um, ma uh, manufacturing side, not to say that retail doesn't have an element, but um, those portions of the industry are pretty capital intensive, right? You have to invest in PP&E. What is a natural for a lender to take as collateral? PP&E, <laughs> right? And most of the loans that I offer are senior secured uh, facilities. So mm -hmm. it, it follows that you would be, have the most luck getting financing for those asset-based projects and can get the most operating leverage out of, uh, and financial leverage out of, uh, if you're in the, those portions of the industry. Now you are mentioning, you know, you, you are connecting people looking for capital, mostly plant touching businesses to suppliers of debt capital, right? And that means you are not, so C2 sale funding or Judy yourself, are not the direct lenders, right? So this in turn means, mm -hmm. means you charge a fee, right? And I have yeah. to ask like, why why would I pay you, right? Why, why would I go to you instead of directly to the lender? Like if, if, sure. if you're gonna take a fee. And sure. I, I, I don't mean to be mean or facetious, no, right? It's, I, a, it's I, a fair question. That's, that's, our, that's our entire value proposition around here. I'm happy okay. to talk about it. Um, the, the primary reason is these are called private lenders for a reason. There's a reason they're private lenders. They like to stay private. Not all of them. Certainly we have the category killers out there like the uh, IIPR and everything. Now they're going to do more of a sale leaseback, which we also offer. Um, but there are a few out there that are, are, are um, but they also concentrate in, in larger transactions. Um, there are an awful lot of family offices, private funds um, out there who, who have raised a good amount of capital and are looking for places to put that capital. You could you will spend weeks on end searching for every last one of those and waste a lot of your time that you could be spending on much more profitable activities. Or you can call me, okay? And I can I can circumvent that because I know most of them. And um, mm -hmm. in the midst of doing that, you're getting advice. I we charge our fees are are not based on which lender you choose to go with. So whatever advice we give you is completely agnostic. Um, you're working with a team of commercial lenders with over a hundred years of combined experience. I think I probably have the most of that experience, but in any case, um, and and we speak lender. Okay, we yeah, we know yeah. how to. That's one of my it's favorite very ways. different. It's it can be very different if you're talking to um, say an investment banker who specializes more in equity raises. They speak equity. They don't necessarily speak lender, okay? They can be very different in terms of terminology and the focus under yeah, which a totally. particular um, group of people would be willing to invest funds. Um, yeah, there's it's funny you mentioned that. that. It's, it's very funny yes. you mentioned that because that's exactly what happens to me many times from covering the industry, right? I know I speak equity much more fluently or venture capital much more fluently that, than debt, right? or lender. Uh, yeah. So when you talk about senior, you know, secured facilities, I'm, I'm going back like many times just to check what it means, right? Like these <laughs> kinds of I so, see so. do the same thing with the equity side. So I guess, thank God for uh, Investopedia. That's all I have to say. <laughs> um, but I, and I make no, I, I make no representation of being an expert uh, in equity or having those kind of contacts. Gen we often work jointly with um, uh, investment bankers, and I'm happy to take any of those kind of conversations that anybody out there would, would have. You know, if you're doing a, a, a capital raise in general and you're trying to raise, say, 20 million of it, you know, maybe it would be better off for everybody if you look for maybe half of that, if there are the assets to support it in the mm -hmm. proportion of a debt. That lowers the load that you have to go to in terms of the rest of your raise and increases, uh, I think, um, your standing in front of in, in front of your clients very much so because you're really going to be doing them a big favor. Yeah. And I work we work oftentimes with uh, the equity providers. They get to do their equity speak, and I get to do my lender speak. <laughs> 
That's fantastic. Um, you know, one of the the other things that really um, caught my eye in relation to this model, right? When I was asking why pay for your services, one of uh, the you know the main drivers of my bullish hypothesis behind your business, uh, you know, revolves around you being able to or allowing uh, companies to tap diverse pools of capital, right? You can help them reach several lenders with just like one pitch or the, the one, right? right? Um, and I know pitching is hard. It's really hard and it gets repetitive and it gets boring and it gets exhausting. Uh, Unless you with you, I love that. dealing with lenders. It's sick, but true. <laughs> so you take some of that yeah. off, uh, you know, the, the company's hands, right? Correct. I mean, it saves. Think of think of the the time that either you or your CFO would be spending, and, and think about it in terms of uh, like sunk cost. Let's say you start out with one group that looks really promising, is saying some good things, thinks they can do a deal for you. Something happens, and they're not able to perform, and there can be lots of reasons for that. There could be something that came up on your side, um, certainly during a. Uh, COVID, not so much now, but it happened, it's happened in the past during the Great Recession. People maybe don't even have the funding, the, the, the lenders maybe don't. And then you have to start over with somebody else. In our case, we can pivot. We already have the core of the information that we need from you. We've done a write-up. We've done an analysis. We get a no from somebody for whatever reason might be. We seamlessly move on to the next source. And whenever I bring in something, um, you know, I usually have a, a lender A in mind, a lender B, and a lender C automatically. I know exactly what my backup plans are going to be for a particular client. Mm -hmm. yeah, it just exactly. saves a tremendous amount of time. Actually, um, one of the people in the audience, Myron Hubbard, is wondering if these funds are available nationwide or only for Michigan residents. Oh, no, not at all. We're, we are definitely nationwide. Um, I wish we could say we could go into Canada, Canada internationally, but we're not able to yet. However, if you're listening in and you run a debt fund out of Canada or something, please contact me. We'd love to because I do get a lot of um, inquiries along those lines. But yes, we can go anywhere where it's legal and licensed. Um, certainly most of what we've done has been Michi in Michigan. I've lived in Michigan all my life. I went to college here. I mean, you know, I'm about one degree of separation away from pretty much everybody in the cannabis or the finance area in Michigan. But yes, we're actively moving into other states. Feel free to contact me. We're, we're happy to talk to you about anywhere in the, in the U.S. Actually, that's, that's a great segue. I was going to ask this at the very end, but where can people reach you? Where can they contact you? So that really the best thing is my website, which is uh, seed to sale funding.com. It's right on your screen. Right there. yeah. There's a contact Super button <laughs> and there's a phone number. That phone number comes right to me. One of the benefits of being sort of this, uh, you know, boutique firm is everything's extremely personal. <laughs> and um, so the inquiries all come through me and then um, and then we go from there. But that's really the easiest way. My website will also give you a, a page on we call it featured transactions, which has a number of our um, uh, tombstones, if you will, on the deals. Most of them have actual names of clients. And if you know them, you're welcome to contact any of them for a reference. Um, and um, and I guess that I would also say that's another reason to do business with us, too, is we have a proven track, uh, track record. We know yeah. we, we do know uh, based on prior deals that we've done, we with high productability, uh, predictability, what our lenders will and will not do. And if we really feel that something is not a doable deal, we'll tell you immediately. Yeah, indeed. And, and the proven track record, you know, speaks for itself. Did you say more than 45, almost $50 million in? in almost 50. Yep. Yep. Right? Just about 50. I'm just waiting for it to click over to 50 and I'm going to change my website and everything. <laughs> yeah, that's exciting. It's like it's like waiting for the K on Instagram or something. Exactly. <laughs> we have uh, two more minutes and I'm curious about one of the the the. Uh, verticals in your business, right? I know how, how sale leasebacks work. We have an amazing panel about sa sale leasebacks during our conference as well. But there's, you know, uh, purchase order financing and equipment leases. And how do they work? What are they? Um, you know? do, do I, two minutes. Okay. So uh, <laughs> purchase order financing is really best used for a B2B business. So uh, if you have a, if you're a manufacturer, 
uh, or you're an extraction company or you're a grower, but not so much for the retail side of your business, but where you're selling it to another um, company and there's going to be, there's a purchase order that's been generated that you've received and you have some, um, there's a, but there's a lag uh, before you can ship those goods and be paid. Um, you can discount those purchase orders under some circumstances and get the, the funds that you need to run the business in the interim before you're able to collect that cash. So it's a form of factoring. Okay, so that's the quickest and easiest way to do to talk about that one. Equipment mm -hmm. financing is simply if you're buying equipment and you need to finance it. So um, by equipment, it's usually going to be more of, again, that manufacturing equipment. Most of the time, mm -hmm. things that go into a, a cultivation facility are typically covered within a real estate transaction, uh, right. such as lighting and that kind of thing. But if you're doing a bottle of Anything that's not nailed to the ground, yeah. basically. Right. <laughs> right. You're, you're doing a bottling line. You need extraction equipment. You need, uh, in some situations, kitchen equipment, things like that, um, where you have a hard cost. Uh, we can arrange for equipment loans or leases. So that's just the, and it's just one other one of the other projects. And we can do multiple of these together. So we could do a real estate transaction. We can also you can retain us as well for the equipment and for the working capital, depending on where you stand in your timing. That's perfect. The full suite. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. I have one very quick question from the audience from Jim who asks, it's a yes, no question. Do you partner with other lenders or syndicates? We absolutely do. Do that frequently. Yes. Happy to talk to you. Perfect. C2SaleFunding.com. Feel free to reach out to Judy. Not just feel free. Do it. <laughs> and Judy, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you so much. And we'll you in our October event in Chicago. I'm sure you'll be there as well, right? I hope oh. so. Thank we'll make you. it happen. We'll make it happen, Judy. Oh. Uh, also, Thanks. I am in the process of uh, changing my name to Brooke Shields. So in the last 20 <laughs> minutes, I have started that process. Uh, I started <laughs> starting, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> start, starting with, uh, you, you know, oh. my, my street yeah. name here. You, uh, started, you started something you cannot stop now. Oh, it, the moment she said yeah, it, I, I couldn't stop it, Javi. Steer into the skin. <laughs> Steering into that skit real hard. Uh, Judy, thank you so much. Uh, really thanks appreciate so you joining us. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Javier, thanks, man. Appreciate you. Yeah. Awesome, y'all. Real quick, we have an awesome, awesome presentation coming your way. I just want to get this question to you. We'll give it about 15 seconds up. Which company, cannabis company, was the first to go public on a major U.S. exchange? All right, so we're split votes right now, Canopy and Tilray. Uh, what is the correct answer? Nobody thinks it's Grogen or Aurora. Um, you know, well, we'll see what the right answer is. Y'all, please answer. Uh, if you all participate in these Slido questions, you get free things like a free lifetime subscription to Benzinga Pro. And there's still a free newsletter giveaway happening. So uh, in the next two plus hours, you could win something. All right. Uh, it is up for you. I'll leave it open for a little bit and drop that down, though, and bring over a very, very well thought of uh, CEO, Jeffrey Binnick. How are you, sir? Hey, great. Uh, and thanks for having me here today. How are you yeah, doing? I'm doing well, man. I'm doing well. It's been a, it's been think, a long I day. Think answer, I think the answer to that question is Tilray. <laughs> I think you're right. Now I got to close the voting. <laughs> no, Jeff, you're, you're exactly right. Uh, you are here to tell us about Alifia Health. Uh, so I'm going to let you get to it. We talked to you recently on Cannabis Hour. I'm super excited because I think you've had some updates even since then. So I'm going to hop off the screen and let you take it away. Yeah, thank you. Big announcement today. Big announcement. And uh, good afternoon. Again, Elliot and team there. Thank you. Uh, and a big thank you to that team uh, at Benzinga for hosting this event and really giving us a great platform for both issuers and retail investors. So welcome all. And uh, I'm going to tell our my name, for those of you that don't know, is Jeffrey Benick. I am the CEO of Alipia Health, uh, which is listed on the TSX and the symbol AH, and on the OTCQX markets as Alif, A-L-E-A-F. Like many of you watching, I'm also a shareholder, and I've invested my own money into this company 
because I strongly believe in the growth potential of this business. And I'm hoping to answer some of those, uh, uh, sorry, the, those scenarios and paint some scenarios for you today. So my experience has uh, truly been supply chain for the most part, uh, from some of the biggest uh, CPGs globally, from Mondelez, Walmart, Nestle, Campbell Soup, uh, just to name a few. So I've taken a lot of the lessons I've learned in supply chain and being very entrepreneurial and I'm really using our second mover advantage here to advance our company forward. And uh, it's an exciting story. Prior to that, I had a, uh, a small stint in professional hockey. And it's really what was the genesis of me getting involved in cannabis. You see, a lot of the folks and a lot of the players I played with, uh, both uh, on my team and opposing, uh, and, uh, um, you know, a lot of them were suffering from a lot of issues, whether it's been, you know, pain, uh, chronic pain, sleep issues, uh, mental stress, anxiety, uh, uh, just to name a few of some of the indications. And, you know, for the most part, a lot of these players were, you know, turned on to opiates and narcotics, unfortunately. And and what's happened is a lot of these uh, friends and players and, and teammates and, and folks I played against have unfortunately uh, uh, become addicted to a lot of these uh, types of uh, uh, narcotics and opiates. And I really wanted to change that. And I felt cannabis was the change. And here we are. So, uh, you know, a quick intro into Alipia. We view ourselves as a second generation licensed producer. Uh, we're only founded in 2018. And since then, we built and operationalized our world class production assets, which became licensed in the first half of 2020. And it's only in the back half of last year that we commenced bringing high value cannabis products to the market at scale. So just to give you some perspective, in 2018, we reported 600,000 in cannabis revenue. In 2019, that number increased to over 11 million. And in 2020, cannabis revenue was 41 million. And we are well on our way to beating that this year. So from day one, we've been very uh, incredibly focused on building a patient ecosystem providing a one-stop shop for medical cannabis patients. And to that end, we built a very diverse and differentiated roster of cannabis products, which we've now also begun to deploy in the adult use market and internationally. And that's something I'll spend a fair bit of time discussing today. We are truly a vertically integrated uh, uh, company. And, and we, you know, when we started this business, um, you know, being vertically integrated was so important because, you know, you had to grow your own flower, you had to find your own patients, you had to produce your own products, uh, you had to uh, then finally uh, be able to see here and script the patients, uh, formulate, package, and then ship to them. And we very much believe still in that vertically integrated ecosystem. And, and it, you know, what it's done for us, it's it's really diversified and integrated our production ecosystem. So we have facilities that have only been licensed in 2020, and we have three production facilities, one that's outdoor, another one that's a greenhouse state of the art, and then finally our manufacturing in, in, uh, in Paris. So we love this integrated model. It gives us a huge point of differentiation uh, for us, especially as we're formulating and making some of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, brands and and, and uh, opportunities that we're selling into uh, through our house of brands and also the clinic and research. Like Canada, international markets have been slow to go and slow to develop, you know, beginning to change though, and, and, and it's creating some really big opportunities and we're gonna seize them. So currently we have products in Australia and the big news today, for those of you that not have heard fresh off the press, is that we just made our first shipment to Germany. This has been something we've been working for on for over two years. And for the first time, you know, we have first mover advantage. This is the largest medical cannabis market in the world. And only a handful of companies have successfully exported there. There's high barriers to entries, and we expect to ship around 200 kilos of dried flour to the inter inter sorry, international markets uh, this quarter. So that's this quarter ending in June. And also, th we think this will ramp up quickly throughout 2021. And we're really excited about uh, this opportunity. We've also secured export permits to complete another shipment to Australia, which we think will happen this month. All the work we've done over the last two years has set the stage now for repeated per repurchase, sorry, repeated purchase orders. We prime the, the sales pipe, and the purchase orders are flowing. 
We are already processing three additional purchase orders. And we truly think our Sour Kush cultivar and our Flow cultivar, which have tested very favorably uh, off the charts, uh, are going to be uh, league leading in Germany. We really believe it. I think that uh, we're going to be uh, trailblazing in Germany just, just to start in terms of Europe. And we think our flower will be top notch there. Um, and we are also working on getting approval to export our cannabis derivative formats in addition to the dried flower. And we're excited about that. That's kind of the next order of business for us. So in our outdoor grow, we were first in Cam. We were growing on 13 acres in 2019. And then in 2020, we, uh, uh, we acquired the property right next to us. And we grew on about 50 acres and harvested 31,000 kilograms. So plants for 2021. So, uh, you know, a lot of investors have been waiting. And if you look at the bottom right-hand uh, portion of that slide there, you'll see that's an updated photo. And we've already started uh, planting. We're well on our way. And this will be our best year for a number of reasons. The biggest one is that all the infrastructure was built last year and it's producing uh, and, and working fully on its uh, uh, at top notch right now from irrigation and also uh, the feed systems with absolutely nothing encumbering us from really running at this hard. This is the first year we did everything on site in Port Perry. Propagation, uh, planting, uh, everything is a, truly a standalone and we're really focused. We introduced some really uh, amazing new cultivars that you're going to hear about. And it's really created an opportunity for us to build a huge dried uh, flower portfolio, uh, which I'm going to talk about that really lends into some of the brands that we're building and the success we're having as a low cost API, high quality uh, producer coming out of, uh, uh, out of Port Perry. So as I mentioned again, uh, been up at that site a few times. Uh, we're well ahead of the curve. Uh, we think this is going to be a banner year for us, uh, growing a tremendous amount of low cost, high quality product. Now let's move to the brands and product portfolio. So that's exactly what you see on this slide here. What we've developed is a highly differentiated portfolio of brands, each which is own unique products and appealing to specific consumer audiences. A key theme here is focus, focusing on areas where we have competitive advantages and there were gaps in the market. So under Sunday market, there are five brands. I'm going to start with uh, uh, Kin Slips. It's incredibly innovative, sublingual strips. It's a rapid onset. It's great for patients and consumers as it's discreet and easy to use. And this is our top selling product from uh, format in 2021. Bogart's Kitchen is our edibles only brand. Our first product was THC Soft Chews with the CBD line extension just released. And this week, we're making the first shipments of a totally new product, salted caramel pretzels. Again, more to come here. Divi is our everyday cannabis brands. High quality, high potency flour, pre-rolls and vapes are by far the largest product uh, categories in Canada. And we've launched with pre-rolls and dry flour at very accessible prices that have made a great splash in the market. Our new Divi pre-rolls were the top selling SKUs on the Ontario Canvas store for the last two weeks, which is great uh, for a start for this brand. We are now launching our 14 gram and 10 gram milled flour uh, uh, first shipments, uh, sorry, pouches and first shipments were made last week. So stay tuned, they'll be in the stores uh, real soon. Okay, so keep an eye on looking out for those. Next one that really excites me is Noon and Night. <clears throat> it's truly a traily, trailblazing brand as it delivers CBD dominant wellness and personal care products. So this really sets us apart and fills a gap in the cannabis marketplace. We launched first with, uh, with of its uh, one of a kind Omega CBD soft gels and then CBD lavender fizz bath bombs. Both are doing very well and very creative. Our CBD over-the-counter opportunity is something that we are highly anticipating. We think that uh, Health Canada uh, is reviewing uh, the Cannabis Act, and we truly believe that at some point soon, you'll be able to buy CBD products over-the-counter in your supermarkets, health food stores, and we think we're positioning ourselves very well, having great outdoor, low-cost input material, creating high-end 
uh, uh, products, uh, CPG type CBD products that will be available over the counter in formats that everyone's already used to. So uh, you're just going to get it with CBD. Our omega-3 products are one of the most popular nutritional uh, supplements in North America, and we are now the only bit cannabis company with this kind of offering. I want to talk about our uh, key differentiator is our, in our medical model. So today, you could order, you could self-refer, you could be seen, heard, and scripted by 10 a.m., registered by 11, and have that delivery of your product that same day. That's world-class. And I got to tell you, so many of my friends, uh, so many shareholders, and so many patients uh, uh, send me a ton of great emails and a whole bunch of great communication on how amazing that service is. And, and we're just going to keep doing that uh, and expanding that across the country. And we're doing really well with that. I also want to move over to our Unifor opportunity. Uh, so this is coverage from large employers. So we just launched the program of medical cannabis coverage and started seeing our first patients in the last couple of weeks. So being able to gain access to insurance coverage for workers is a game changer. And we are very excited to continue scaling this up. The first company to join the Unifor program is the Ford Motor Company of Canada. And I can tell you we're working on several others right now. Having fully covered uh, 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 cannabis is a game changer. And I also wanna say we're now providing medical cannabis care products to unite Ford employees as the last couple of weeks. And uh, the response has been great. And, uh, you know, on that note, I just want to say one of the competitive advantage of us working with a big company like Unifor is the data that we're, that we're actually accumulating. And it's real data in the sense that uh, when we go in and uh, do sales pitches to large employers or other unions, uh, the first thing they ask is, you know, what's, you know, give me the cost benefit of analysis. This is the first time we're going to have quantifiable data where we could do a cost benefit analysis on you know, uh, um, you know, opiates versus cannabis and narcotics versus cannabis, but more so the improvement in performance, production, and quality of life of that employee, which is monumental. Just going to briefly show you a couple last slides of our Paris facility. You know, it's uh, it's where all our derivative pro products are made. We sell pro and that we sell. We produce everything in house. It's uh, we have an innovative team that's always hard at work and we have a commercial kitchen where we produce our Bogart's uh, kitchen branded edibles. Uh, Grimsby is our greenhouse. It's really ramping up now. International sales, huge, you know, 25 to hopefully 30 K of great yielding, low cost, uh, JCP compliant, high potency and great quality. Uh, so thank you very much for participating in this presentation. Uh, all the best to you and your families. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jeff. Uh, really good insights and congrats on the news, man. That's huge. Yeah, I got to tell you, we're we're really excited about that. It's been uh, it's been over a year in 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 you know progress, and it's exciting because we're taking fifty cent grams and selling them into Europe for a much much higher price, and uh, <laughs> the demand is incredible. That pipeline's so full. Uh, we're excited about it, and uh, it's a lot of work, but. Uh, we're ex even more excited about the derivative products. So when you're launching and, you know, the consumers and patients get to know you out in uh, Germany, Poland, uh, Czech, and all those countries, uh, when you can sell other products, and it's just going to be exciting. Now, uh, in that vein, uh, I'm very curious. Uh, you know, you just launched a ton of new products. And, and you know, that, that was a, a lot of the news that uh, I think you released a, a couple months back, maybe less. Gosh, time flies. Um, but I'm curious – how are you um, marketing those brands, expanding those brands uh, internationally between these different markets that you're now working in? Uh, we, we did touch on that earlier, but I'd love your thoughts, uh, you know, specifically on what you're doing at Alifia. Yeah, so look, we're working on relationships. So, you know, we're working with, uh, you know, some of the top, uh, you know, sales teams out in those marketplaces that have huge penetration already. And, you know, the key there is having first mover advantage. So, when, you know, your products are in the market first and foremost, and everyone's going to learn everything about your products and associating it to Alifia, Emblem, and any of our other brands. It's a huge competitive advantage. And, and we're going we're gonna to tap that as hard as we can. And uh, I'm telling you, we're excited. I'm excited uh, to be a shareholder, and I'm excited for our shareholders because, uh, we truly are starting to fire on all cylinders, and, and we're just going to keep hitting that nail on the head right now. 
Well, that's one thing I've always noticed about Alifia is you have very loyal shareholders. Uh, and it seems like you always have. So you guys must be doing it right over there. Um, I guess, you know, in terms of my own curiosity, um, oh, oh, I lost my question. I had written it down. Uh, oh, well, I lost it. I was curious about your outdoor grow in Port Perry. I know that's what it was about. Uh, you know, I, I know you all, uh, or it is one of the largest outdoor grows in Canada, if I'm not mistaken. So I was curious about the value that that offers your company. Yeah, so look, uh, it's it's a it's a tremendous amount of infrastructure. Unless you see it, you really can't appreciate it. But it's a self-sustaining asset of ours now. And uh, it's just going to, you know, not only produce a ton of weight of great product, uh, but the THC levels of cultivars, uh, you are just going to be so incredible and the cost is even better. And uh, so we're excited about it. This is going to probably be the best year we ever had. We're so far ahead of any other year we had. And I'm really hoping to, you know, hopefully have an investor day out there this year to all our uh, loyal investors. We love you. We work hard for you. I can guarantee you we throw nickels around like man manhole covers for you. And we're going to keep doing that. Uh, and, uh, you know, Alifia Long, Alifia Strong. I love that, Jeff. Uh, that's great, man. And I appreciate you being here and sharing your story with us. And ideally, we picked up a few loyal uh, shareholders along the way. So thank you again, my friend. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, all right, everybody. That was Jeff Benick, CEO of Alifia Health, OTC listed, uh, A-L-E-A-F. Uh, super interesting company. Uh, and I'm super excited to see the news that comes out over the next few months because I don't think they're going to be quiet. Uh, if, I, if I have picked up anything from Jeff, it is that man is, is making some moves. That being said, just a quick announcement before we get our next educator over. Uh, he's going to drop some knowledge on me. The correct answer was Tilray. Which cannabis company was the first to go public on a major U.S. exchange? It was indeed Tilray. Uh, awesome. We'll get another question post Gianni. I'm going to get this off. Get Gianni up. My Hi. friend, welcome. We are glad to have you. How are you? Thanks, Elliot. Yeah, good. Glad to be here. How are you? Oh, doing well, man. Doing well. It's been a full day of cannabis education. Uh, cool. I'm excited to hear what you have to say as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. We got lots of charts to cover. So let me go ahead and uh, get everything situated here. So I'm going to take you through a top-down cannabis analysis. Uh, but before I do that, i uh, tell you a little bit about myself. I've been in the digital trading pits uh, per se for almost a decade. Uh, started off in the advisory world uh, of the markets, but transitioned into more research and analysis. And, um, you know, I've been doing some work with Benzinga too. And so we, we apply these principles that um, I've learned over the years, you know, working with the institutions, you know, your Fidelities, your Vanguards and your Schwabs and so on and so forth. And, you know, it turns out they have a pretty good way of uh, analyzing the markets and, uh, you know, profiting off of moves and, um, you know, the, the thing that we did was transition that institutional knowledge to make it more retail friendly. And so we have some advantages as individual traders and investors compared to the large institutions. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit at the end, but I know why you're here is to learn about cannabis. So what I'm going to do is take you through a plethora of charts um, in this sector to uh, really give you a, a bird's eye view of what it looks like from an analyst and a trader's perspective. So uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of the cannabis trends um, that have been unfolding within the industry in the last uh, few years. We've had uh, tremendous growth in indoor cultivation, you know, greenhouses and um, hydroponics and labs and so on and so forth. There's been a larger demand for uh, higher potency, especially with respect to THC. Um, here in the United States, where I'm based, legalization has, um, you know, increased significantly, uh, more than 50% of the country at a, at a state level has legalized uh, cannabis. And then the, the big thing in the last year and a half was that the lockdowns and the pandemic led to higher use. Uh, people were locked at home, so they sparked up a dube. Um, and then uh, the big thing too, that was a major headwind, especially in terms of getting a lot of these companies access to financing and, and raising capital um, were the restrictive uh, finance laws in place. And that was more so an issue in the United States. Now in Canada, it's fully legal. So they have access to traditional banking. But since cannabis is still technically a schedule one drug within the United States uh, at a federal level, th there are some loopholes that a lot of the companies had to jump through 
to have access to traditional banking. Um, but at the end of the day, it's still a very young public market. Um, so one of the headwinds that we faced as traders and analysts in terms of looking at charts is the limited data that we, that we have. So um, I just saw the, the poll that was up on screen, you know, Tilray is the, the oldest trading stock. I actually would have guessed uh, Canopy Growth, but that's beside the point. But uh, uh, these stocks really only have data going back to, you know, I think it's like 2014 or 2015. So, you know, we're not dealing with a company like you know your your Walmart's or your Exxon Mobil's that have been around for decades with a lot of data uh, to analyze. We're working you know more off of principles and reliable chart patterns because those patterns still um, are present in these stocks. And so that's what I'm going to focus on today is how a trader and an analyst is going to play this sector because there are some uh, portions or subsectors within cannabis. And we're going to talk about psychedelics too. There are some that are in uptrends and there are some that are in downtrends. And our approach to those subsectors or individual stocks, depending on their trend, is going to be contingent on that very fact. So without further ado, let's get looking at these charts. Uh, I have a, a couple dozen charts I want to go through with you here today. So let's start off with the uh, oldest uh, ETF in the cannabis sector, which is the Alternative Harvest, ticker symbol MJ. Now, most of the charts that I'm going to be sharing with you here today are weekly charts because um, I like to say, when in doubt, zoom out. And the, uh, the reason why we do that is because the trend is your friend. And the longer a trend is in place, the more powerful it is. So generally speaking, an uptrend on a uh, that's been in existence for you know three to four years is going to be more significant with respect to the direction of a stock or any security compared to an uptrend on a two hourly chart. I think that's uh, pretty pretty sensible there. So, um, but we're looking at the weekly chart here for the uh, Alternative Harvest ETF, and we have data uh, on this chart going back to mid 2015, and this this has been in a downtrend, or at least it was in a downtrend up until the bottom that formed in March of 2020. So that was a very significant low, not just in the markets at large, but potentially in the cannabis sector as well. And then we had the secondary higher low, which was very key with respect to the trend because an uptrend is characterized by higher highs and higher lows. So this higher low was the first step that was needed in the establishment of a new uptrend, which we now arguably have because we've been making higher highs and higher lows Follow my cursor here. Now we had this blow off top uh, in February uh, earlier this year. Um, let's see, did we, we didn't quite take out the high from 2019. However, we did uh, probably just form a significant higher low of the sorts earlier this, well, no, we're in June now uh, in May, in mid May. So, you know, we have another potential higher low here and um, for me, bird's eye view, top down view. So long as this mid May holds, uh, this mid May low holds in cannabis, it's looking very promising, but here's the other key. We have this upper horizontal trend line here. So we've identified a rounding bottom pattern and this is a reversal pattern. And we usually see these types of patterns form when a downtrend is ending. And that would essentially be the confirmation signal for the end of the previous bear market in MJ would be a close above this upper horizontal trend line because we would be making a higher closing high and we would have you know high, consecutive higher highs and higher lows. So uh, I'm, I'm actually very constructive on the cannabis sector overall. Now we're going to talk about certain stocks and individual um, you know equities in the space that may do better than others. Um, but like I said, as long as this mid-May low holds, I think the uh, risk reward ratio could favor the bulls, um, which is great since we're talking about cannabis for this uh, presentation. What I have here now is it's called a ratio chart. And what we do, I do this on my stock charts program. We take the ratio of two separate uh, assets and we do this to see how they are performing relative to each other. And we do this to observe relative strength because as traders and analysts, especially if we are probing 
the long or the buy side of a market, we want to be long the strongest stocks within the strongest sector. So what this ratio tells us um, is that when it's declining, it tells us that the S&P is outperforming cannabis. When it's rising, as it has been since, since September 2020, it tells us that you're getting more bang for your buck in the cannabis sector. So it means that if this ratio is rising, MJ is appreciating more than the S&P, but it could also mean that if MJ and the S&P are down, that MJ is down less. And so that's a good thing, right? You know, if the market enters a correction and the S&P is down 10%, but your cannabis ETF is only down 5%, well, you're, you're ahead mathematically, right? So this is what this type of analysis helps us to conduct um, is, you know, how, how are we positioning ourselves to achieve maximum performance? But we see here how, uh, you know, cannabis really wasn't doing well up until Q3, Q4 of last year, and it's had a good start to the year. And we may have just formed a significant higher low. Um, and this speaks to the potential opportunities uh, in which we'll discuss further on within the sector. Now, I mentioned how we were going to uh, talk about some psychedelics. This is an even younger market than cannabis. So uh, two previous charts were weekly charts. This one here is a daily chart of the Horizons Psychedelic Stock Index ETF. And I have a daily chart because it's only been around. This ETF's only been around since mid-February. But... Not much is really going on in this uh, sector right now. Uh, we keep seeing lower lows and lower highs. Um, we do have some bullish divergence in price from the RSI indicator. So what that means is that prices are making new lows, but the momentum indicator is not. This can be a sign that downside momentum is waning. However, momentum indicators are only secondary in importance. Uh, maybe even tertiary or, you know, to the third order. The number one indicator is price and we see downtrends. Uh, we see a downtrend in the CTF. Now, there is some hope for the bullish case. We do observe uh, what may be a falling wedge, but if we flatten out this lower trend line and make it horizontal, it could be a descending triangle. Now, the difference between those two chart patterns is stark because a descending triangle is a continuation pattern. In continuation patterns, there's more than just the descending triangle. There's, there's a variety of them. But continuation patterns are chart patterns that we see um, that lead to a continuation of the trend. That's why they're called continuation patterns. And so in this case, we very clearly see a downtrend, lower lows and lower highs. But if this is a falling wedge, those are reversal patterns. Now, a reversal would only be confirmed, really. We'd have to close above this downward sloping upper trend line. But I would ideally like to see this HPSYF ETF. That's a lot of, that's a lot there. Uh, I'd like to see it close above this eight bucks, um, 820 mark. Uh, a meaningful close above resistance would lend credence to the notion that the downtrend is complete. So uh, I, I'm going to say that. There's more opportunities in the cannabis sector right now compared to the psychedelic sector until we see a close uh, in this psychedelic ETF above uh, eight bucks or 820. Okay, now we're gonna look at a ratio chart between uh, that same psychedelic ETF and the S&P. This is a daily one as well because there's not much chart data. And we see here that this is a clean cut downtrend as well. So. The, uh, the capital flows, the direction uh, in which the money is flowing within the market is very much telling us that the S&P has been a better trade compared to uh, cannabis and uh, psychedelics. However, that corner could be turning with respect to cannabis since the uh, potential higher low that we just saw. Uh, but in psychedelics, we, we need a little bit more potential downside uh, to shake out some of the um, Perhaps it's overconfidence or, you know, a lot of times people think it's a foregone conclusion in order, you know, a new industry comes to market and there's going to be, uh, you know, money made easily. But I come from a time um, <laughs> where IPO used to stand for it's probably overpriced. Uh, nowadays in this bull market, that's not so much the case anymore. You see a lot of IPOs booming off the bat, but that's beside the point. So 
Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through a few charts. We'll look at a few uh, blue chip cannabis companies. We'll look at some subsectors within the cannabis space. I got a couple psychedelic charts. And then I'm going to share what I think is the greatest opportunity within cannabis uh, specifically because I think, um, you know, there's a lot of components to the sector, uh, which we'll touch on uh, in these upcoming charts. But I, I think there's a really good opportunity in a certain area in the market. And it's really not that groundbreaking. But as a trader and analyst, I'm going to focus on where the money's going. And the weight of the evidence tells us that the money is heading in a particular direction. But let's start off with uh, the blue chip canopy growth uh, weekly chart. This is a, uh, a growing company. They grow uh, cannabis and um, it's the largest cannabis company in the world. So this serves as a pretty good barometer for the overall direction of the um, the sector, probably uh, because you know MJ uh, owns quite a bit, the ETF owns quite a bit of this stock. But what we see here is that we did emerge from a pretty significant bear market downtrend uh, at the end of last year. So uh, I extended this upper horizontal trend line to illustrate a specific purpose, which I'll get to in a moment. But the chart pattern that's um, worth noting here is the rounding bottom. So we have an upper horizontal trend line acting as resistance and then a parabola U-shaped lower portion of the pattern. It's representative of a compression and volatility. You know how the trading range gets a little bit tighter before prices break out. So we broke out uh, from this rounding bottom pattern in Q4 of 2020 and we rallied pretty strongly and we didn't quite make an all-time high, but we tested the all-time high, but then prices fell back uh, after topping out in Q1 of this year. And then we had a successful retest of former resistance turn support. And that's a very key principle that I want you to take away from today. When resistance breaks, it becomes support. When support breaks, it becomes resistance. And that principle holds true within the cannabis market as well. Now I wanna point something else out. Note how we had the final low in March of 2020. We had bullish divergence in price in the RSI indicator. This was a sign that downside momentum was waning. Now, it's a similar story as the MJ ETF. If this low can hold, um, you know, there's, there's really uh, no reason to not be probing the long side of this market. I mean, if you want to set a stop loss below, you know, the, the lows of this May, that's, that's a pretty favorable risk reward entry. I myself, I, I usually don't, um, you know, risk more than seven to eight percent on a uh, position equity trade, but, you know, articulate your own risk tolerance. Some people risk 10, some people risk five, but you have to, um, you know, basically be comfortable risking a certain amount before you uh, speculate in equities. Okay, let's take a look at another grower here. This is Kronos Group. Uh, this is a weekly chart as well. Similar chart pattern to uh, Canopy Growth. This one had a very impressive run. I remember the uh, the pot stock boom very vividly from, um, you know, it was late 2017 uh, in some parts into 2018, but similar chart pattern here that we observed in the previous slide. We have a rounding bottom. Prices broke above the upper horizontal trend line that was acting as resistance. And note how we actually did fall below this former level of resistance, which had turned support. But I wanted to show this example here because support and resistance levels are not always necessarily hard lines in the sand. In other words, they're not um, individual numbers or individual prices per se. Many times we see zones. So you can see where my laser pointer is here. It's around the $7 mark. There's a, there was a support and resistance level in this chrono stock between seven and you know 850, let's say. Now we're back above that level. So si similar story here. We may have seen a significant higher low. This high from earlier this year took out you know the previous lower highs where my cursor is uh, hovering over right now. That's constructive. And it's looking it's looking like there's opportunity within the sector, not just at a you know broader level. Uh, when looking at the ETF, but even as we're digging through the individual stocks, you know there there is uh, some promising signs with respect to the bullish case. Um, okay, now for the longest um, public uh, cannabis stock, which maybe it traded under a different ticker symbol, or maybe it was um, I, it, it escapes me right now whether Tilray is Canadian. I do think it is a Canadian stock. 
Um, but you'll have to excuse me. I'm more of a technical analyst, so uh, I'm not as familiar with the fundamental details of some of these companies, even though I do uh, I do like to know the general story to know what they're into. But um, in any event, this Tilray stock, another weekly chart, similar chart pattern here. Uh, but note how on this one, we didn't really have any significant bullish divergence in price from the RSI indicator. But we did emerge from this rounding bottom. Okay. And then we had a successful retest of former resistance turn support. So similar story here, higher low, we have a higher high uh, as compared to the high from earlier uh, in 2020. So a little over a year ago, and it's looking constructive. I mean, if Tilray can clear this $30 mark, I mean, I really wouldn't be surprised to see it make a run at its all-time highs. So tremendous uh, reward opportunity here. But, you know, as a trader, we have to think in terms of risk. One of the, you know, I like to approach trading as a business and your, your business inventory when it comes to trading is your money, your capital. If you run out of money, you're, you're out of business. So you have to be comfortable taking losses. You have to articulate your risk. And when your risk parameter is breached, you need to have the ability to jump out if you want to last uh, in this business. So, okay, now I want, I want to pivot a little bit from the, uh, the you know, pure growing aspects of the cannabis sector. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the um, secondary beneficiaries of what's going on in the cannabis sphere, right? So you have stuff like hydroponics that are benefiting, you know, fertilizers, infrastructure, you know, uh, people got to build their hoop houses. They got to, you know, get their LED lights or, you know, whatever kind of lights they use, so on and so forth. So what we have here is a daily chart. This is a relatively newer company. It's called Hydro Farm Holdings Group. And they're uh, in hydroponics and, you know, they dabble in the cannabis uh, sector a little bit. Um, but I just wanted to share this to, you know, take, take you a, a little bit through some of the potential opportunities in other, uh, you know, related sectors to cannabis. So uh, this stock uh, is kind of in a downtrend. Um, you know, we may have seen some higher lows, but we've yet to see any meaningful higher highs. So that's why I said kind of, because it's, it's a little bit more neutral. But what we observe here is an ascending triangle. So we have an upper horizontal trend line acting as resistance, and we have an upward sloping lower trend line. Now, this belongs to the family of triangles, which I um, shared the descending triangle earlier, a couple slides ago. The, these are continuation patterns. And what we observe here is a downtrend. So this is very much a, uh, a hands-off type of stock until we see a meaningful close above resistance or below support. Because um, in, in essence, it's consolidating its losses from this steep sell-off uh, in late February, early March. So until we can close above this level of resistance or below this level of support, this is going to be range bound. But historically, when we see these ascending triangles, we lean with the idea that it may resolve in the downside direction. So unless uh, Hydro Farm can close above this you know, $70 mark, uh, it looks like the trend may resolve to the downside. All right, let's take a look at another hydroponic slash infrastructure uh, company related to cannabis. Uh, Grow Generation, this is actually a stock that we shared with uh, subscribers to our um, breakout opportunity letter uh, here at Benzinga. Uh, had some nice profit there last year, but this one is uh, you know, pretty much the complete opposite of the previous example that I showed. Uh, this is a stock that it's in a very clear cut uptrend. And you'll notice that we have a similar uh, pattern illustrated here. I would call this a saucer instead of a rounding bottom. And the nuance there is that a rounding bottom is something you see at the end of a downtrend, but this stock was already in an uptrend. So words and definitions matter, right? We have to make sure that we're understanding uh, each other in a similar way with respect to you know our language. And in this one, it's a saucer because it was already in an uptrend, and we broke above that. Formed a bull flag, had a you know ascending triangle slash pennant consolidation, rose within this ascending price channel. We broke that price channel, that ascending one, uh, in February of this year, and now we've been consolidating within this descending price channel over the last three to four months. Now, when we see these, uh, you know, this up ascending trend line is comprised of two upward sloping trend lines. When this lower trend line breaks, it doesn't mean that the uptrend is over. Rather, it means that the rate of ascent is subject to change, and that has indeed happened. I mean, after all, Look at the consolidation. The stock has done nothing really since February of this year. 
but we do appear to be forming a higher low in this space. So I like this stock much better than the previous example that I showed, because like I said at the very beginning, the trend is your friend. I like to buy high and sell higher. I like to use the buying power of the institutions, you know, the entities that actually have the pockets that are deep enough to move the price of a security. Because the fact of the matter is if, is if you're an individual trader or investor like myself, unless you're moving hundreds of millions or billions of dollars worth uh, of money, you really don't have the buying power to move the price of a stock. Now, the exception is if you're trading, you know, thinly traded penny stocks, but um, we're not even showing examples of that. Although I think I do have an example of a penny stock um, in this slide. It's a psychedelic one. We'll get that uh, get to that in a few uh, moments here. But uh, in summary, I do like grow generation uh, much better than the hydro farm example that I just shared. Okay, so let's talk about a fertilizing stock. This is Scott's, um, you know, like the Scott's Lawn Care Fertilizer Company. So obviously, you know, the uh, the growers need to fertilize their crops. I actually do some urban farming uh, myself, I although I don't grow cannabis, I grow vegetables. So, you know, I, I'm uh, intimately familiar with uh, fertilizer and the importance of it to bring nutrients to the soil. Although there are some uh, cannabis growers that don't use dirt. And um, I've always found that fascinating, uh, well, especially since I work with vegetables, but I digress. In any case, the, um, the chart pattern we have here is an ascending price channel. These are normally continuation patterns. But note how we broke below the uh, lower trend line, the upper, upward sloping lower trend line of this pattern. Oh, sorry, that was my uh, end of day bell. The market just closed. Uh, we have uh, the break through this upward sloping trend line. And again, this is indicative that the rate of ascent in this stock, which experienced a very powerful bull run in the last 12 months, is subject to change. I mean, the stock from the corona crash lows um, in March of 2020, more than tripled. So it was a big winner, but it looks like it could use a, um, a period of, uh, you know, consolidation here in the last, uh, in the next few months. Okay. This is a Canadian company, Village Farms International. They actually, uh, this is a weekly chart, ticker symbol VFF. They, they grow a lot of produce, um, but they're getting into cannabis as well, apparently. So I really like this chart. I think it's very constructive, not just because we're seeing uh, agricultural commodities emerge from you know a multi-decade uh, bear market. Um, so that's constructive for a, a company that would grow agricultural commodities like this one. But the, the chart pattern is very constructive as well. And so we, we observe a um, pretty extensive uptrend. Uh, really, since we bottomed in March of 2020, we've been making higher highs and higher lows. We made a new all-time high in February uh, of this year. We appear to have made a higher low here recently. May really appears to have been an important turning point in the cannabis sector. And I think that's an excellent line in the sand. You know, if we start to see these cannabis stocks break below their May lows, we'll reevaluate. But until then, we're seeing a lot of higher lows. And that's very constructive with respect to the uh, bullish trend. So the chart pattern we see here is a cup and handle. So we have an upper horizontal trend line acting as resistance, a larger U-shaped parabola that acts uh, as the cup, and then a secondary smaller U-shaped parabola that acts as the handle. So on this one, if we can close above the upper horizontal trend line acting as resistance, let's see, this is around 17 bucks. I wouldn't be surprised to see this stock shoot up as high as, let's say uh, we have a price objective is 30 to $35 per share. So I think this one has tremendous upside. Um, that's that's not this, you know, I'm not saying go buy it now. Um, you know, again, that projection is only confirmed if we close above this upper horizontal trend line. But if you want to try to get in a little bit early, we are a little extended off of these lows from, you know, just buying it now. Because if this low happened around the $758 area, you know, we're already three bucks higher. You know, you might be, you know, if you just bought it now, you could be risking 30%, which is way more than I would ever risk. Um, you know, if this was the final low. So, but the chart pattern looks optimistic, but we have to let price guide our actions. We're not going to initiate a trade unless price confirms it. Okay, this is a, uh, I call it a cosmetic cannabis company, uh, Amaris. And uh, weekly chart here, we have a broadening wedge, upper horizontal trend line acting as resistance, and then a downward sloping lower trend line. 
we have a break above resistance. And this is a company that, you know, uh, does like hemp CBD products as it pertains to cosmetics, higher highs and higher lows, clean uptrend. Uh, we did already uh, satisfy the upside projection from this price pattern. So, you know, not my favorite one that I've shared here today in terms of potential risk reward. Um, but, you know, it is in an uptrend. So uh, if you're buying stocks, uh, any stock for that matter, it helps to buy stocks that are in uptrends. And yes, I am speaking from experience in that respect. Okay, let's take a look at a couple psychedelic stocks here. Um, so this is Compass Pathways. And we see how there's a similar price pattern on these on this individual stock compared to the psychedelic ETF that we shared earlier. So uh, it's pretty much gone sideways uh, since its IPO, um, you know, late last year. But we have a uh, descending triangle pattern here, and if we break below resistance, we could see another washout to retest, you know, where it opened for its IPO. Um, but if we start to close above this thirty-eight dollar mark it would be constructive for the bullish case. But right now it's just in a consolidation that must be respected. Uh, res respected, you don't want to just rush into a trade just because you like the idea. I know that sounds a little counterintuitive, but uh, an important lesson as a trader and an analyst, and this is uh, a quote that I think uh, John Maynard Keynes actually stated. Um, I'm not sure if he was the original one, but there's a saying that set that goes, the market can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. And so, you know, even though there will be tremendous growth within this space, eventually, that doesn't mean that the price today is reflective of said growth. Now, you might eventually be right, but you got to think of the opportunity cost. If you get caught holding the bag on a stock that does nothing for, you know, six months to, you know, uh, two or three years just because you liked the idea of it. Uh, well, you're missing out on other investment opportunities. So that's how I approach every market as a trader and as an analyst. All right, I told you I had a penny stock, and this is it. This is Numinous Wellness. Uh, this is another uh, psychotherapy uh, stock that uses psychedelics to um, treat uh, medical con or mental conditions. And similar chart pattern, descending triangle belongs to the family of uh, triangles, which are continuation patterns. Now, this one's in an uptrend. Higher highs and higher lows. So this is a little bit different compared to the other ones. Um, but, you know, I'd like to see it close above a buck here. Um, I don't really trade penny stocks, but if it closes above a buck, I wouldn't be surprised to see it run up to the $2 area. And then if that happens, we could have another price pattern form. It would be like a saucer. And then at that point, you know, you could be talking seeing prices as high as three fifty four bucks. But um, don't let the potential upside lure you in to a trade. Think in terms of risk, okay? Because that's what's going to keep you in this game long enough to eventually make money. Okay, this is the last um, slide I had before I want to show you what I think is the best opportunity within cannabis right now. This is what I call a defensive uh, cannabis play, and it's Constellation Brands. This is a beverage maker that recently partnered with Canopy Growth. And this isn't an uptrend, right? So we broke out of an inverted head and shoulders pattern. This was a reversal pattern. We broke out of that late last year. And this is such a good textbook example of that inverted head and shoulders pattern because head and shoulders pattern, whether it's inverted or uh, right side up, are not always reversals. They're reversals when they close above or below the neckline, which this one did. So it was confirmed as a reversal. But when we, when we observe an inverted head and shoulders pattern like we see now, we want to see the right shoulder be higher than the left one. Now, we will still see periodically, you know, inverted head and shoulders pattern, confirm the reversal with the lower right shoulder. But in my experience, and I think there have been analysts out there that have done statistical work on this as well. But when the right shoulder is higher, when the low is higher than the left shoulder's low, it's, it's a stronger signal that the... Uh, reversal is bound to happen. So we broke out from this um, inverted head and shoulders, and we've been consolidating within this ascending triangle uh, over the last, uh, really since the beginning of the year, so the last five to six months. So if we can close above this upper horizontal trend line of this pattern, I like a move uh, into the high 200s, potentially even low 300s. Okay, so let's talk about what I think is the best opportunity within cannabis. And it's related to the healthcare and biotech sector. So there's a lot going on in this chart, and I'll walk you through it. So the first thing is that the green and red 
line is the MJ Cannabis ETF. Okay, so you, it's pretty much the same one that I shared at the very beginning. Without the candlesticks, it's just line charts. The orange line is the small cap biotech ETF, XBI. Okay, the blue purple color is healthcare. Okay, the healthcare ETF. This line at the bottom of this chart is the MJ's correlation to the S&P 500. Now, we'll see that it was inverted uh, it was an inverse correlation for a few months of 2020 and then the correlation started to move positively, but really over the last 2 months or so there's been no correlation. And that's actually I think a, a good thing given the maturity of the current rally. Um, because when we get into the you know later stages, there, there's some indications that the broader equity rally is maturing. I don't think we're set to top out for another few weeks or maybe even another month or so, but that's just an opinion, not a position. I'm not short, but that's just my opinion. Um, it's, it's good to see correlations like this because this is telling us that cannabis could offer some downside protection, even if you want to stay long. We talked about that when we looked at the ratio chart earlier on. So I think there's good value in cannabis overall, but that's not good enough for me in the way we trade. We want to be, we want outperformance in the ups, upside and downside protection on the downside. So let's see how cannabis is outperforming uh, relative to healthcare. So this is the ratio between uh, the MJ ETF and the Vanguard healthcare uh, ETF. So here we see a rounding bottom pattern formation. We have the bullish divergence in, pri uh, in the ratio from the RSI indicator, and we may have potentially formed a significant higher low. So if we can close above this upper horizontal trend line, that's going to tell us that there's going to be more opportunities within the cannabis space compared to healthcare. And that helps you from you know, articulating a long strategy within the market, right? The next one is biotech similar pattern, rounding bottom. We had some bu bullish divergence in the ratio from the RSI indicator. We can clear this upper horizontal trend line. There's going to be more opportunities within cannabis compared to biotech. Now, the nuances is, is that, that our thinking is that there's going to be opportunities within healthcare and biotech related cannabis companies, right? Which is the segue into this next stock that I'm sharing, Jazz Pharmaceuticals. So Jazz Pharmaceuticals, this is a weekly chart. They bought GW Pharmaceuticals, which was one of the first companies that worked with uh, treating illnesses with cannabis. So, uh, and GW Pharmaceuticals is still trading and that's gonna be my next slide. So spoiler alert, but this is a beautiful chart. It's a multi-year base. There's a saying in trading, the bigger the base, the higher the space. Uh, this you know, uh, saucer pattern has been forming. Uh, you know, for over two years, almost three, uh, and we're, you know, we're pressing up against resistance now. So if we can close above 1A on Jazz Pharmaceuticals, I, I like the idea of this being a, you know, 280 to $300 uh, stock, potentially even higher. Uh, it's very constructive, but again, let price guide your actions. Don't just rush into a stock just because it has potential upside. Let the trigger happen first. And the next one, uh, this must be the spinoff that, uh, you know, Jazz Pharmaceuticals, um, you know, did after they purchased GW Pharmaceuticals because it's still trading. And what we have here is the broadening wedge. We broke above the upper horizontal trend line that's acted as resistance. And then we've been consolidating in this rectangle or bull flag. I do like the idea of it being a rectangle a bit more. This is a little bit long for it to be a bull flag. Bull flags usually don't last this long, but this, the story is the same. We're consolidating near highs. That's bullish price action. If a market goes sideways instead of going down, that bodes well for the bullish case. So I think the best opportunities within cannabis are in uh, healthcare and you know biotech-oriented cannabis companies. And these these uh, two charts that I just shared, I think, are the best-looking ones technically uh, within that space. So I'm coming around the corner here. Uh, this is my last slide. Um, you know, at the end of the day, trading principles matter the most. Uh, you have to be able to effectively manage risk, you know, be able to cut your losses and size your positions accordingly. I myself, I usually put no more in my most speculative accounts. I, I usually put no more than 20 to 25% of my total given capital into a position. 
Um, at the end of the day, you know, some people put 5%, some people put uh, 10%. It really just depends on your temperament, but you have to articulate that. You have to come to the market with the plan. If you don't, if you if you don't humble yourself before the market, the market will humble you. So it does uh, help to have a little humility uh, with respect to m risk management. And then you have to articulate your time horizon. So a lot of these charts that we shared today were weekly charts. I found that those are most effective for position trading, which I would define as a position that one would hold uh, from a definitional standpoint uh, with the intention of holding from three weeks to three months. Now, I'm also a major proponent of cutting your losses short and letting your winners run. So if I enter a, uh, a long uh, position on a stock uh, with the intention of it being a position trade, but then I get to the three month mark and I'm up, you know, 50, 60 percent. I'm not going to close it out just because I've reached that, you know, that time uh, restraint. I'm going to let my winner run. Now, I will incrementally raise my stop losses um, to protect some of that gain and to, you know, mitigate the downside. Because one of the most damaging things psychologically for a trader is to see a large gain turn into a loss. So, you know, one of the rules I employ is if I'm up 12% on a trade, I'm not going to let that turn into a loss. I'm going to raise the stop, uh, the stop up to break even. Um, and then, you know, once I get up 20, 30%, I'm raising that in like 10% increments. So you, you need to give stocks a little bit of, a, a, of an ability to fluctuate and, you know, digest their gains and trade sideways, but you, you never want to neglect the downside uh, risk in, in any position you have from the long side of the market. And I mean, we do got to wrap up here, my friend. Okay. Good. Well, the last yeah. thing I was going to say is uh, opinions are not positions. So uh, that's <laughs> what I shared with you today uh, were my uh, opinions. And I don't even necessarily have positions in uh, all of these companies per se, but Peter, I, I do trade them. So not yeah. right at this moment. <laughs> well, it was, a, it was a wonderful presentation. I appreciate it. Yeah. I mean, in my opinion, go big or go home, 100% of your capital in one stock, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to condone that, Elliot. But uh, <laughs> you're not going to be caught on camera condoning that. And please, no, my, my opinion, out. your wallet, right? <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Johnny. I really appreciate you being here, man. Love the education, the know-how you bring, uh, and I'll be taking a further look into some of the some of the charts you pointed out. Uh, thanks so much again, man. Uh, wait, where can we find you? Um, ben, Benzinger Premium Breakout Opportunity Letter. Um, I mean, we're cater as well, uh, but we got the uh, breakout opportunity letter. Go to Benzinga.com, uh, go to the premium, and uh, we got some great services with uh, uh, our niche in picking out stocks that are about to break out. So okay. Awesome. Gianni, thank you so much again, man. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Elliot. All right. Fantastic, y'all. Uh, I do want to offer one Slido question before we move to our next presenter, who I'm very excited about. First time on our stage. Which form of cannabis do you think will have the most long-term success? Uh, is it flour, drinkables, vapes, edibles, topicals, wax, resin, rosin, whatever? Um, so uh, please, QR code there. We will also have the link in the chat as well uh, if your camera's not working. Uh, but this is a wonderful way uh, to submit uh, ways to win a free lifetime subscription to Benzinga Pro uh, or maybe win a free newsletter. Uh, either way, uh, we're going to announce another winner here shortly after the next presentation. Uh, but please uh, join us. Uh, participate. We'll be doing this all day again tomorrow with some more giveaways. Uh, but love having all of these presenters here today. Love having these educators. We're not done. Uh, we have two more incredible sessions left. One with Good Earth Organics. Uh, he was just talking about the hydroponic space uh, and the ancillary space to cannabis. Uh, she is a part of it, Liz Wald. Uh, I'm going to get rid of this, bring her over. Liz, how are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, of course. Welcome. Glad to have you. Um, so I guess without any further ado, please do tell us about Good Earth Organics. I'm going to get out of your way. Perfect. Well, first of all, I'll get through the quick disclosure slide. Um, Good Earth Organics, what we do is we manufacture and distribute premium organic potting soils and soil amendments, which are nutrients that you add to the soil. And what's special about this soil is it's formulated specifically for growing cannabis and hemp. This is super important in the cannabis and hemp space because 
Getting toxins out of your plants is critical, not only to pass all the tests that it goes through, but also for people who are taking cannabis for medical purposes and don't want to have all those things in it. So what we do is we help you grow tremendous cannabis for whatever purpose you're using it. But before I kind of dive into the company, I wanted to just go at a, a 20,000 foot level a little bit on cannabis. Most of you people here are already really familiar with the space and interested in investing in it. But just to remind everyone that we're already up to 36 states out of 50 um, that have some form of legalization. 17 of those are adult use, including my home state of New York, which finally is coming around the, uh, the bend in the Northeast. And Another big piece for us is 22 states allow for home grow. And we think this is going to be a really interesting part of the market that will expand and that people will want premium products when they're growing cannabis at home, either for like a hobby or really because they have very specific needs they're trying to meet. We know that everyone is getting on board with legalization and states are really coming around because of the job creation, which is incredible. Even in a pandemic, cannabis added 77,000 jobs. Um, and you know, the, the revenues in the industry are, are well uh, on their way to doubling over the next couple of years, getting up to about $40 billion. However, it's difficult for a lot of people to invest in this sector. Um, you know, lack of federalization leaves some people on the sidelines. Uh, many of the bigger, uh, companies that you actually see traded um, are Canadian and on the Canadian exchanges, but they're also very much plant touching. And people, some people are reticent or flat out not allowed to um, invest in a plant touching business. Um, and private companies are often limited to accredited investors. And that's something that that is not a limitation when investing in us. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. So we really think Good Earth Organics offers a great solution to these problems. First and foremost, we are an ancillary business. Um, like Elliot mentioned, you know, somebody was talking about hydroponics. We sell into those hydroponic stores. Um, we're the, we are a consumable input that people use over and over and over. Many growers um, do not amend their soil. They just replace the soil on every grow. I was at a um, indoor grow yesterday. I'm in Oregon this week and I was out there um, visiting this grow and she does, you know, six turns a year, all new soil, all new amendments, even all new pots. So having a consumable is a great business to be in. And, you know, we think it's a great time to invest before all the institutional money jumps in. Um, we all know that legalization and legislation is moving in the right direction and everyone's got their fingers crossed for safe banking or um, even, you know, legalization at some point. So talking a little bit about our product, um, Good Earth Organics was founded in this area called the Emerald Triangle, which is the premier growing region for outdoor cannabis in the country. It runs from about Southern Oregon down into Northern California. And we got our start in 2008 when the founder, a retired chemist, moved to this part of the country in a, in a little town called Cave Junction and started talking to people about, you know, growing cannabis. And they all had needs. They wanted an organic product that was, you know, really customized to their growing. And we have become a beloved brand in that part of the country. People know us. They love us. They come back to us year after year after year. There aren't very many national brands really focused on cannabis that are also certified organic. Um, and so we think that our heritage, our knowledge, and our ability to take that and bring it to markets is really going to help us set us apart as we go national. And we saw that just last week when we were at Canacon in Oklahoma City talking to people about, you know, all of the knowledge that we have in growing cannabis um, really translated and truckloads of orders were coming for our soil out of that show. Um, the other thing is in general public, and especially since the pandemic, I think, you know, more and more people are gardening, more and more people are, you know, they're ordering food online and they're really like reading, like what is in this stuff? And, and, you know, more and more sections of grocery stores are being devoted to organic. And soil is kind of the main thing that drives whether your plant is organic, because that's where they get their food. You know, plants really need soil, air, water, and sun. And air, water, and sun can all come from mother nature. Um, but the soil has been so degraded 
over time uh, globally that, you know, people put new soil down. Potting soil isn't actually made from dirt, right? It's made from all these organic ingredients, peat moss and um, compost and cocoa core and things like that. And more and more cannabis growers are understanding the value of going organic in their soil. So we'll talk a little bit about the numbers. The organic soil market is um, expected to double to about $3 billion. And almost two thirds of all growers are already entirely organic, but uh, more and more are partially organic and moving 100% of the way. Um, you know, the revenues, of course, for legal cannabis, both medical and adult use, are expected to be, you know, over 40 billion in the next few years. And as legalization and legislation moves forward, that really could go up, you know, I mean, New York alone added about $4 billion to that number. So we get a few more states coming in. I think these numbers are only gonna go up. So we really do have a premium product. You can see here, this is a sample of three, our three core soils. All of them are clean green and OMRI certified, which means all of the ingredients in them are 100% certified organic. Um, and again, you know, when growers are testing, um, everything that is grown has to be tested at the state level, particularly on the West Coast, California and Oregon. They're very, very, very high tests for purity and lack of tox toxins and metals and all that kind of thing. So using an organic soil, you know, you're not going to have any issues around those tests. And again, um, people who are consuming cannabis are also going to know that they're not getting a lot of toxins or any of these kind of, you know, synthetic um, things that can come when you have a lot of stuff in your soil that's going straight into the plants. Um, we admit, we call it, we talk about a living soil. It really is alive, right? Like it's all full of microorganisms and different things that help a plant grow. Now, if you're an indoor grower, you don't want it to be alive. You want an inert soil, and then you're going to feed your cannabis plants, you know, often through a hydroponic system. So um, the, the blue soil that you see here, cloud nine, is an inert soil. It doesn't have all the nutrients added to it. It's just cocoa core and um, uh, perlite and peat moss. And so you can really dial in exactly what you want. And that's what we do. We create a line of products that work as a system, both soils and nutrients that can be customized to the different types of growing that you're doing. And I talked a little bit about clean cannabis already and how important it is that you don't have um, a bunch of junk in your cannabis. And particularly for these medical patients who smoke cannabis and it goes straight into their lungs and there's nothing in there to filter it out. So I want to talk about our model and who we sell to. We like to call it a DTG model, direct to grower. And there are, you know, historically over the last 12 years, being in the Emerald Triangle where all these large cultivators are, um, we have sold primarily commercially to large cultivators. In the last year, we have really tried to dial in and launch our, our home direct to consumer sales. We're currently available on our own website, on amazon.com, on walmart.com. You can find us, you'll be able to find us soon on some hydro uh, platforms as well. Um, but we really, you know, whether you're buying a truckload, a pallet, or a two and a half gallon bag, we can meet the needs of growers of all different sizes. And we think that's an important thing as we go from Southern Oregon to becoming a nationally recognized brand and are available in multiple channels in multiple geographies. So home grow, we think is a really untapped opportunity. I wanted to spend a second on this because in, in 2019, there was about 50 billion spent on lawn and garden at retail. And during the pandemic, you know, there was a huge upsurge in new gardeners, something like 18 million new people um, joined uh, into the idea of, hey, I want to garden. You know, there's not much else you could do and you can't leave your house. So we think that there's going to be a real opportunity as home grow and this interest in gardening combine. And, you know, early surveys say that about a third of the population over 18 would home grow, like they would give it a shot, they would try it. And that could add, a, you know, another $14 billion or so to this industry. If just you know, if they just spend $100 on inputs. So, you know, it remains to be seen how this will develop, but we do think this will be a large piece of the market going forward. 
A little bit about the company. Um, we're just about to put out our audited 2020 financials, and you're going to see um, improvement over that 40% year-over-year growth in 2019. We'll have you know about 50% uh, or so for 2020. Um, we have a very clean balance sheet, just one class of stock, no outstanding warrants, um, a great team, both on the ground, the team that actually makes the product and interacts with the customers, as well as um, a management team that we've brought in. We have a, a CEO, Tony Luciano, who comes from a very much consumer packaged goods background um, at you know A plus type places like Port, um, Procter and Gamble, and people like me who come right out of the digital world. I was very early at AOL and Etsy and crowdfunding at Indiegogo, and you know bringing that direct to consumer piece to the mix. Um, you know, we think of ourselves as building a platform, not a product. Our, our, our products work as a system, and this direct-to-grower platform is how we're building our company so that people know the Good Earth Organics brand, and they're going to ask for it whether they're coming to us directly or going through distribution channels like hydroponic stores. We're raising the capital here, but we're looking for about $10 million total really to expand not only our footprint geographically, but also our product line and, um, and our distribution channels. And I'll talk a little bit more about that and how we think that's going to build our revenues over time. And finally, we are going to do a listing, um, a crowdfunding uh, listing on a platform called Seed Invest. We've already raised about a million and a half dollars on that platform, and we will be turning that platform back on in the next couple of weeks for everyone here and anyone else who's interested. Um, and then our plan is to do a direct public offering. So people will be able to take this investment and make it liquid very quickly. Of course, we hope everybody holds it for a long time. So. Um, quickly here, this is how we project revenues going out, and we see a lot of opportunity. Sorry, Liz, I just want to say five minutes left. Yep, you got it. Yep, uh, a lot of opportunity through acquisitions. Um, we see the opportunity to use our publicly traded stock as an arbitrage, the way Grow Generation has been doing, to say, hey, you know, we can buy somebody who's maybe at one times revenue and see the valuation in our stock go up four, five, six, ten times. Um, so we want to do that with the capital. As I mentioned, we want to expand distribution and develop new products. And acquisitions of new products is also an area that we think is a great way to get into new markets and get new customers. And so we're looking at products that can add to that line. Um, quickly, just talking about a couple of our, the other players in the space. You know, we've seen Grow Generation, we've seen Hydro Farm, and even Agrify, which really is more of an equipment um, seller do really well in terms of their enterprise value to um, trailing revenue numbers, what kind of valuations and they're getting. And this is what I was talking about, how we think there's an arbitrage opportunity to do some acquisitions and see really positive price appreciation on our stock. Um, Hydrofarm and Grow Generation are both, you know, great places for us to sell our products. They make a lot of their money in consumables, and that is exactly what we are. And we think the market is rewarding these ancillary stocks. We are truly the picks and shovels of this industry. You, We are literally on the ground floor. We are the dirt. We are the soil. Um, and it is a consumable. People use it over and over and over, often more than um, one time a year, especially for indoor growers. So if, if all goes well, you know, with those kinds of numbers, this is the kind of valuation that we might be able to see. Here's a, a quick snapshot of our team, and you can get more information on our website about everybody. But um, the two co-chairmen, Tim and Tim, they've known each other for 25 years. They've done investments together. It's a really awesome team. I mean, this group meets twice a week, um, and and we've just, you know, really gel well together and with the rest of the team. And I think we'll really be able to deliver on our strategies given the combinations and the backgrounds that we bring to the table. As I mentioned, we do have an exit strategy of going to the OTC market. Um, and most of our capital will be going to building this national brand and doing acquisitions and developing our products a bit further. So now is the time to invest. Everyone knows the cannabis market is booming. We are a fully legal investment in a ancillary consumable. The large institutional capital is still mostly on the sideline and we are gonna offer liquidity 
um, quickly with this investment. Finally, um, how to invest. Come to goodearthorganics.com and um, visit our investor relations page. And I will make sure that anyone who shoots us an email, either to Liz at goodearthorganics.com or IR at goodearthorganics.com, knows exactly when we are back up on Seed Invest. Um, our offering is $1.65 a share to $23 million pre money valuation. There's only a $1,000 minimum investment, and it is open to both accredited and non accredited investors. As I mentioned, we have already raised about a million and a half dollars from about 750 people, and we are going up to 10 million. Okay, thank you very much. And that's my contact info. I got a couple minutes left, right, Elliot? Yeah, Liz, wonderful job. That was Thank fantastic. You. And honestly, super, super exciting times ahead for Good Earth Organics, it sounds like. So very excited for you. Yeah, it was great. You know, like I mentioned, we were in Canacon in Oklahoma last week, and we had one of the biggest booths there. And you know, there's hundreds of people coming through and super excited that we're coming there and that we could bring a lot of knowledge. I mean, there's 6,000 licensed growers in tiny Oklahoma. And a lot of them are doing this for the first time. And so we really see that as a, as a great uh, jumping off point to, you know, the rest of the country, uh, you know, quite frankly. Fantastic. Liz, thank you so much for being here. Good Earth, GoodEarthOrganics.com. Uh, you can find, I believe, the investment opportunities there. Correct, Liz? Absolutely. We'll yep. Okay, beautiful. Uh, thank you again so much. Uh, we'll see Liz again in October, I believe, live and in person. Very can't excited wait. for that. Uh, oh, me too. Me too, Liz. Thank you again for being here. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody. You too. All right, y'all. Before we get to our last session of the day, but I got to tell you, last does not equal least in this event. Uh, this panel is a friggin' powerhouse filled. Uh, I do want to say, Julia Udi, congratulations. You are our second winner of the day. You have won a lifetime subscription to Benzinga's breakout newsletter uh, that Gianni, I believe, is uh, the author of. All right, y'all. So which form of cannabis do you think will have the most long-term success? Uh, a few of you uh, said drinkables. Interesting. All right. Let's go to another question real quick. Open this up for you all. Uh, what was the first date to legalize medical cannabis use? I wonder if our panel uh, knows. I, I, I'm sure they do. Uh, but, you know, I love putting people on the spot. So um, may, we'll, we'll ask them here soon. All right. But y'all, uh, take a quick uh, screen grab of that uh, QR code. A lot of you say California. Um, the link is also in the chat uh, as well. If you all would like to participate, you can still win a lifetime subscription to Benzinga Pro, best data platform for traders out there. Uh, all right, y'all. I am going to get rid of this and we're going to bring up our panel. Let's do it. Let's talk about sale leasebacks. We have Meryl Ross. How are you today? Oh, great. How are you? I'm fantastic. I'm great. I'm really excited for this conversation. I'm going to get out of here though. Uh, and I hope you all know uh, what the first date to legalize medically was. And I'm going to leave it at that and get off. Thank you so yeah, much. <laughs> I'll, I'll concede that I think it's California. Um, I, 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 we, I'm going to introduce the panelists in a minute here, but I just wanted to say that we're going to address a slightly broader topic than just sale leasebacks, as the title suggested. Um, we're going to talk about other forms of debt and credit facilities that our panelists offer to cannabis operators. Um, the panel is really nicely divided uh, between public companies and private firms, between net lease REITs and uh, commercial finance companies. So you're going to get a nice diversity diverse uh, uh, you know, a, a set of opinions, um, and we're going to hear from some, some people who have been involved in the industry for years and some pretty new entrants. So I think it, we have a nice balanced uh, presentation for you and hope you enjoy it. I'm going to ask each panelist to introduce themselves, and I'm going to go alphabetically by the company name, so that leaves uh, Len Tannenbaum at the AFC Gamma. Go ahead. I get to go, I get to go first. Great. And AFC Gamma is a lender to cannabis companies secured by cash flows, licenses, and real estate. We're listed on NASDAQ, Singles AFCG, and I think our RPO is about two months ago. So that's us. <laughs> yes. Um, next up, we have um, Paul Smithers from Innovative Industrial. Uh, thanks, Meryl. Um, I'm the president, CEO, and co-founder of Innovative Industrial Properties. Uh, IAP is a REIT 
It has a strategy of acquiring licensed cannabis production facilities in those states that have adopted cannabis programs. Uh, since our IPO in 2016, we have entered into long-term sale leaseback transactions with most of the top multi-state operators in the country. Uh, our leases are all triple net, have an average yield ranging from 11% to 15%, with 25 to 4% annual escalations, and have a weighted uh, average lease length of over 16 years. Uh, we currently own 73 properties in 18 different states, uh, with 25 different operators, uh, totaling about 6.6 .6 million square feet, and we are 100% leased. Uh, we remain the only U.S. cannabis focused REIT listed on the New York Stock Exchange and have a current market cap of about $4.3 billion. Uh, since our IPO, we've raised over $2 billion and have invested over $1.6 billion with licensed operators uh, through our sale leaseback program. Uh, in 2020 alone, uh, we invested approximately $700 million uh, and are on track to meet or beat that number this year. And uh, just last month, we were pleased to announce our debut bond offering, where we were able to raise uh, $300 million on a five-year unsecured note uh, with an investment uh, grade rating. So we're pretty happy about that. So. Yeah. Thank you. This is going to be a good year for you, huh? Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Next up, we have Anthony from uh, New Lake. Great. Thanks, Merrill. Thanks for having me. Um, Anthony Coniglio, President and Chief Investment Officer at New Lake Capital Partners. We were founded about two and a half years ago. Uh, we've raised over the last two and a half years across five rounds over $300 million. Um, we are triple net lease REIT, similar to IIPR. Today, we own 25 properties across nine states with seven different tenants and some of the leading uh, operators in the industry. Um, so we're excited to be here and have this conversation with everyone. And thank you for coming. Um, uh, last but not least, and I think um, Rob has presented so many times at Benzinga that he probably needs very little introduction, <laughs> uh, but go ahead, take it away. Thanks, Merrill. I'm Rob Seacrest, president and co-manager um, of the Plor Polaris Equity Group and the Polaris Fund. Polaris Equity Group focuses on doing value-add bridge lending to ca licensed cannabis transactions across the nation. We focus on acquiring and building out these facilities who are fully secured by the real estate. And uh, we've been in the sector. We were the first dedicated lender in the sector in 2016. Since that time, we've originated 50 transactions for over 177 million with almost half of that already paying off. Um, we launched our, our private mortgage REIT in 2018 and converted to a private, um, we launched our fund in 2018, converted to a private mortgage REIT in 2020. And we're really happy to be here today to round out. You've got a publicly traded mortgage REIT and you've got a couple uh, of traditional REITs, one publicly traded and one private as well. Yep. It's a very nice, diverse panel. And, and to that end, I'd like to ask each of you to describe your product offerings and talk about the type of financing you provide and what companies you're most likely to lend to. Are these multi-state operators? Are they vertically integrated? Are they single licensed startups? I think you'll be able to differentiate as you listen and between these companies because they each have a different level of expertise. And I'm going to reverse the order and start with you again, Rob. Okay. So our, our focus has been in the bridge lending. Um, we're typically doing 18 months uh, term loans for the acquisition build out of these facilities. Um, we have high performance cap capital and we're facilitating unlimited amount of draws in any one month. Um, we're typically doing transactions from five to 20 million and those transactions are, are nationwide. We're willing to look at any of the licensed states out there. Um, as far as the, the operators or the tenants, they do not need to be a multi-state operator, but they need to be very experienced operators. So we're looking at the quality of the operator, the quality of the, sp of the sponsor that's guaranteeing the loan, and obviously that the real estate as well. So people come to us to get these facilities acquired and built out, and then they're either gonna refinance with a more traditional lender or a lower cost lender, or go to one of the uh, alternative uh, REITs for the purchase of the property and cash out that, that those funds. Yeah, and I think that's a neck break because I'm next. So that's a great segue into, you know, Rob and I often talk about, right? He would do the early stage and then nice takeouts come into the sell leaseback transactions. And so for New Lake, we're a sell leaseback um, REIT. We acquire properties and enter into long-term leases so that the, uh, the operator can operate the property over 15 to 20 years. 
Um, it's noteworthy. We often get people asking the question, is there any interruption to our business? So this transaction takes a real estate asset, which in our opinion is better held by real estate investors as opposed to investors in the actual operating business. And we think that investors in the operating business want the company and the MSOs or the single state operators to actually um, use their precious capital to operate the business, grow EBITDA and grow sales. Um, who do we typically do transactions with? Again, these are sale leaseback transactions that we will do with multi-state operators as well as we've done single state operators. Um, we will do with dispensaries as well as cultivation facilities, processing facilities. Um, we've done small one property transactions. We've done multi-property transactions, as many as 10 at a time. Um, and so it really spans the gamut. And I would echo Rob's comments in terms of the operators that are best suited for these types of transactions. They're operators that are established. Again, they don't need to be multi-state operators, but they have to have experience operating in this complex industry and a demonstrated um, track record of success in if they're not profitable today or cash flow positive, making strong progress towards getting to cash flow positive or profitable um, and have a meaningful equity base. You know, we often see people who are startups that have no real equity. And it's really difficult to enter into a 15 or 20 year lease with an organization that's very thinly equitized and hasn't demonstrated the opportunity to grow revenue and, and to, to start getting towards profitability or even get free cash flow. I think that goes over to Paul at this uh, yeah, Paul. point. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, so um, you know, our current, current portfolio of uh, 25 different operators is about 80% MSO, uh, but we're always looking uh, for opportunities with well-qualified uh, single-state operators. And in fact, many of our current MSOs were single-state operators when we first uh, began our partnership with them. Um, over the 75 properties we own, um, 10 of them are retail. So the vast majority of our asset portfolio is in uh, cultivation and processing. Uh, we tend to focus on cultivation for a number of reasons, uh, chief of which is the scale of the asset. Uh, you know, our cultivation facilities can be as much as $50 million, uh, where you know a, a typical retail may be you know one, two, three, or four million dollars. Um, you know, I think the operators uh, of the cultivation facilities uh, tend to favor longer term leases, uh, which we also prefer. Um, so, again, we're 100 percent sale lease back. Uh, all our leases are absolute triple net, uh, which means the operator pays all insurance, uh, property tax uh, and all property level expenses uh, for the lease duration, um, including any capital expenditures and repairs and maintenance. Um, so, you know, our lease length range between 15 and 20 years. Uh, we don't have any purchase options or early termination clauses in our lease. And uh, we do uh, typically get a corporate level guarantee from the operator, but uh, no personal guarantees from any of the individuals. And I guess I'm next or last. Um, so my previous business, we, we built one of the bigger middle market lending firms. And how we did that, we lent, we had over $5 billion of assets. I would underwrite and, and distribute over a billion dollars a year to the middle market. Taking that lending expertise to a market that really had been dominated by sale leasebacks and NIPR, we're offering alternative to our customers in that they don't have to do a sale leaseback and lock up their asset for 15 years with escalators. They now can take a three to five year loan and pay it back if, uh, with a prepayment penalty even in the second year. If you believe Safe Act is passing and some other things, and you believe this industry is going to have yield compression, to offer a shorter term loan and not happen to be able to own your real estate over the long term may even pro provide a uh, cheap source of capital. So having that alternative and, and having built a 100 person organization, which I sold to Oak Tree uh, as a $5 billion asset manager, we've currently lent in 14 states. Uh, we have 13 loans. We're active. We did fifty million dollars in the first six weeks of this quarter, and so uh, we're we're really seeing a demand for our product from customers, which include multi-state operators, single-state operators, license holders that want to build something. If you put enough equity and have a proven, demonstrated track record of being able to build, we understand what the license values are. We don't currently lend 
to California, Oregon, or Washington. We don't, we really focus on the limited license states, those where the supply and demand dynamics we can understand. So it's a different type of model. We do do a lot of construction financing like Rob does. Uh, typically our loan sizes are between 10 and 50 million. So my hope next year is to write hundred million dollar checks. Well, that's a good goal. Um, what kind of returns do you try to generate for your stakeholders? Um, and it, you know, what do you think to accomplish in in on the next twelve months? I mean, Len just summarized it, um, but maybe we can just put in comparatively into context uh, the difference between the risk and reward of of a net lease operator versus a, a commercial finance company. Which order? Oh, do you want let me to say, you? who wants to go first? Um, maybe Paul. Can we start with you? Sure. Well, you know, we're a public company, um, so you know, I think the the returns our uh, investors expect, our appreciation, our share price. We also pay a dividend uh, that we've been able to increase uh, on quarter to quarter for the last twelve quarters. So, um, you know, if you bought our stock uh, when we came out at twenty dollars a share in December of two thousand sixteen, you'd have about a nine hundred percent return on that share. So. Um, Stocks perform very well. We pay the dividend. So our investors uh, look at that. Um, they like the liquidity uh, of being uh, having a New York Stock Exchange listing. Uh, so that's that's attractive to our investors. Um, now I'm not sure if you want to talk about you know why why a sale lease back may be preferable to a, to a mortgage. Um, you know we talk to a lot of our operators and. While there are certainly some advantages to uh, a mortgage product, um, a sale leaseback is wonderful. Uh, first of all, obviously it frees up the capital that's, that's uh, stuck in real estate for these operators and they need capital now. What they also like is the certainty of a 15 or 20 year, 20 year lease with us. They know what their mortgage or they know what their uh, debt payment or lease payment's gonna be uh, year over year. Um, and they're not, a, you know, the idea of getting a mortgage in maybe three or five years from now having to pay that off, nobody knows what that's going to look like if they have to go and refinance. So there's a lot of certainty in the lease, uh, say a leaseback model. Can you give us an idea of um, how much business you expect to do in the next 12 months? You referred to 700 million in um, last year and, um, you know, increasing that maybe talk about how much it increased since 2019, you know, so that we'd have that year over year comparison rather yeah. than making a projection. Yeah, so, you know, with our, our recent um, bond raise of 300 million, we've always told this street that when we do a capital raise, we expect to be able to place that capital within a six to nine month time period. We're at, we're confident we can do that again, if not well ahead of that. So the pipeline's very strong. I think uh, we did about 600 or 700 million last year. Uh, in acquisitions, I think we're certainly on track to meet or beat that this year. Um, we're getting all sorts of pipeline requests from our existing tenant uh, that, you know, they want to expand maybe the facility we already own. So they come back to us, you know, maybe they're in New York, just got a rec program and they need more money to expand to meet the demand. Uh, we're also seeing uh, some requests for, you know, M&A activity and acquisitions that uh, these operators need capital. Uh, so they're looking at sale lease back. And um, of course, the growth of the industry is tremendous with the new states coming on, uh, the projected 30% annual growth, uh, just a tremendous demand for this capital. That's certainly true. Um, <laughs> Rob, why don't you pipe um, sure. in here? Sure. Um, our, our, we're private, a private mortgage rate, so our share price is going to be non-volatile. It'll always be $1, so that's why we've chosen to stay uh, private. Um, our dividends um, have been consistently over our target of 15% each year that we've been operating this fund, and we're at 19% right now for the year to date. Um, that, those returns, we already know what they're headed for for the next 18 months. That's what we write our loan terms, so we will continue to outperform this year. Uh, as far as growth from the last year to this year, we had a 14x growth um, from last year to this year. Um, and in the next uh, 90 days, we'll put out $50 million worth of transactions and we expect to put out 100 million in no less than 180 uh, days uh, for the rest of this year. 
Awesome. That's good planning. Um, Anthony, you did a merger this year, earlier this year. Um, does that give you a better growth trajectory? Yes. Well, you know, in, in the merger is about scale. It's about being able to meet the needs of the client base. And what the client had, what the client base in the cannabis industry has is a voracious appetite for capital. These businesses are very capital intensive and most of the capital that they need is around real estate. And so whether they're big cultivation facilities or just building out scale retail networks, um, the need is massive. And so when we look at growth for this year, we see growth for our business coming in three forms. Number one, we have escalators so that every year the rent on our leases in place on our 25 plus leases will increase every year. So we get growth uh, every January 1st, just by virtue of those escalators. Number two is, as, as Paul was talking about, is the additional dollars that are requested from the existing tenants to continue to build out the properties that we own and that they're leasing from us. And then number three, the pipeline is extremely robust. And you know, our job here at this uh, at New Lake is to be able to raise capital. And we've raised over 300 million in the last two years uh, across five raises, we'll continue to raise capital in order to meet that pipeline demand need. So we get it from three places, from escalators, from additional tag on investments, as well as the robust capital need that the market has. I'd just like to know, is it more advantageous to you to add a new uh, client or tenant to your roster or to do tenant improvements with an existing uh, client? Yeah, it, it's a great question. Both have benefits um, in terms of adding additional intent tenant improvements to our existing deals. A lot of operating leverage in doing that. The documents are in place. The approval process is pretty quick. So that's, a, that's what I would call the low hanging fruit. But one of the core tenants of our underwriting philosophy is diversification, diversification by tenant, by state, as well as by um, property type, dispensary or cultivation or processing. And so when we look at the opportunities to deploy our capital, we like to keep that diversification in mind. So if there was a state that we're not in that we particularly like, uh, and similar to what was described earlier, we really do prefer limited license jurisdictions. Um, if there's an opportunity to get additional diversity, we think that that's critically important for the long-term success of our business and providing long-term value for our shareholders. And, and I, I could also add, agree with all that, but what we're seeing too is it's great when you have a tenant uh, come back to you for capital because now you have that partnership relationship. And we've been able to do it two, three, four, five, six times with some of our operators when they come back to us. So it's very important for us to start that relationship, keep it growing. And you know, when you have that type of relationship where that operator is going to come to you first, as, as their capital provider, that's a very valuable thing, I think, in this industry. Yeah, I think credibility, if I may just add on to that, I think that credibility point can't be overstated here. There are many folks, maybe some who are even watching this right now, who've had experiences where a group has come to them and said, we can provide that capital finance and that financing or that capital for your real estate only to not be able to show up at the closing table. Um, I'm sure all of us could share story after story that we've heard of situations like that. And so what we're seeing is operators um, are really looking towards groups that have demonstrated success and are more comfortable doing transactions with organizations that have the credibility in the marketplace. So I guess, I guess I'm last again, but um, it, it, it's an interesting dynamic. I think I echo what everybody says. There's going to be a massive demand in the industry. New York's alone going to be $5 billion of build out. And they're going to do it both through sale, lease back and through loans. It, it's it's not. And those that have gone sale, lease back, like Cureleaf, love the strategy of sale, lease back. And, and they do a great job doing it. Um, and some of them have decided, like Verano, to own their real estate. And they they intend to own it. So it's a, there, there's no right answer. Everybody, everybody picks a different path uh, in doing it. But I think... The most important thing is incumbency. We saw that in the middle market when Fifth Street was in a loan, when I did a loan and I had $5 billion of assets, you had, a, you had a very high chance when they needed more money of them coming back to us. So that's a very strong uh, differentiator is when, you have, when you're the incumbent lender or the incumbent sale leaseback provider, it's a very powerful thing because you have the documents done and you have the trust in the relationship. And so that's, that's something that we're working hard on is, is to be in, you know, the incumbent lender and a number of great uh, firms. As for returns, I, look, we just put out our first dividend of 38 cents. We said that was between 
uh, 75 and 90 percent of distributable income. So we're out earning our dividends so that that we put out publicly. So I can say that but it's only our first dividend. Uh, we, we have a limited operating history. We've only been public two months. But the great thing about the reputation that we provided is when we say we're going to do it, we do it. We have the capital to do it. We close on it. And that institutional uh, reputation is really critical in an industry where if you don't close on it, you may lose your license in a state like Missouri, where they're actually taking back licenses if you don't perform. So if you don't choose a lender or say a leaseback provider that, that is going to execute on that transaction, you actually can lose your license. And there's other states, I believe, that that might happen. Right. Uh, and, Merrill, yeah. I was going to say, Merrill, I'll, I'll throw in. I think it's really interesting when you think about the groups on the on the, the panel here is everybody has their place. I'm going to disagree with Len a little bit, so maybe we'll spice this up, where I, I do think that long term, the industry has no business in owning its real estate. And just the way Starbucks doesn't own their real estate, just the way FedEx doesn't own their real estate, just the way Walgreens doesn't own their real estate, I think what will happen long term is there'll be a point in time where investors really want the operators to focus on the balance sheet and want them to be optimizing that capital structure. So I think there'll be a point where um, the cost of capital for sale leaseback um, hits a sweet spot for those operators where they'll realize that investors who are focused on owning real estate are better sources of capital to fund a hard asset. Because if you really think about it, if an operator has $200 million of capital tied up in real estate that has a limited return potential, if they unleash that $200 million into the business to grow revenue, grow sales, expand the business from a CapEx perspective, investors will earn a greater return off of the multiple that they'd get from deploying that capital into the business versus sitting in a hard asset like real estate that really is limited in what it could generate. And so there'll be a point in time. Right. And ultimately, a more robust capital access for the industry as a whole will put all the debt offerings and equity offerings into perspective. I mean, if you can't access the equity markets, you can access the debt markets, you know, rarely are both sides of the market completely shut. So, I mean, I think that, um, you know, that basically what I wanted to address before we have to get into conclusion is um, how long is the runway that you think that um, you have ahead of you to, to you know, um, increase your business and, and maintain your returns um, before the the banking system, you know, has wide open access and before federal legalization, even even after federal legalization, the banking system will take time to learn the industry and, and to build a client list and come up to speed. So it's not like federal legalization is going to change things immediately. But how long you think the runway is for yeah business as you've come to know it. Sure. So maybe I could respond to it first. Um, we're tracking all the lenders that are lending in the space. There's 695 uh, banks that are doing depositor relations on FinCEN's website. Five to 10% of those are lending directly. So the misnomer that there's no banking for depositors and there's no banking for lending is vastly um, misunderstood. We're tracking eight FDIC insured banks lending directly, one publicly traded at LIBOR plus 300 to 450. Um, so it's out there and I don't see um, the uh, changing of policy, changing that instantaneously for the for the banks. If a bank wants to be in it, they can be in it right now. They just need to set up the compliance and get there. It's actually harder for depositors than it is for, for lending for, for most of the banks. And we're tracking 100 private lenders. So we monitor and track every single lender, every single property across the nation with, uh, with knowing what's happening out there. We need to know what the size of the market is for any particular license class in any particular state what the average build costs are, what's what's happening, are there any properties turning around? We have to know that information to make the decisions that we're making at the level that we're making at. So for us, we see this market being able to achieve these returns at least 24 to 36 months at our 15%, but we think it can maintain all the way up to probably as much as five years. And the reason that it is for that for us is that we already know what it is for the next 18 months. We also have equity that we're, we're feeding in through an OID discount that is artificially will continue to inflate that yield as the rates start to compress. Our 15% target yield was modeled at a 12% note rate. We're currently average 15 and a quarter. So we have plenty of room to compress. We expect that compression to happen over time, but uh, we think we've got plenty of runway to still go. 
And we hope our investors are not here for the yield, but hope they're here to diversify their own personal uh, portfolio and real estate debt market into an asset class that is more resilient to a real estate downturn or market uh, shift in, in, the, in the public markets. Okay. Yeah, Rob, I'm glad to hear you say that. Uh, I've never looked at that in such great depth analysis, but that's great to hear because I'm on the same page uh, as far as the length, but I look at it at a different way. I look at it at the federal government level, what's going on in, in Congress. And we follow this very closely because it is probably the most asked question I think we get from investors is, you know, what happens when federal legalization occurs? What's it going to like, look like? When is it going to happen? Um, I've always been of the impression that it's going to take much longer than a lot of other um, people might think. And I think even, especially with uh, Chuck Schumer's uh, bill that he's uh, talking about, we haven't seen it yet, of course, uh, I think that's even going to delay things uh, more. I think the Safe Banking Act had a shot this year, but I think, uh, as uh, Chuck Schumer has said, he does not want safe banking on the floor for a vote until his bill gets a full vote. So that's going to put everything off until next year. I think the Schumer bill has a very tough uphill climb. Um, we've already seen two, maybe five Democrats that uh, will that are very hesitant to vote for full legalization, let alone the 10 Republican votes he would need. So I'm not seeing anything meaningful, certainly this near year, probably not next year. And of course, if we do get something next year, we don't know what it's going to look like. I think it'll be more of a state's rights because what I'm hearing on the Hill is what the delay on the Schumer bill is, uh, their staff guys just figured out that, gee, if they deschedule cannabis, that's going to bring the FDA into play. And what does that mean? And they seems like they haven't really thought that through. Uh, so it's a it's a very complicated issue if you just deschedule cannabis, how it's going to be treated. So short answer is, I think we have a great runway. I think it's two to five years before there's any significant bank or institutional capital coming in uh, to compete with us. So, so I, I have, I have to agree with almost every, everything Paul said, I think he hit it on the dot, but I'll, I'll just bring up a different perspective. Um, what is Schumer thinking about? New York needs the tax revenue. New York is in desperate need of the tax revenue. California gets $2 billion of tax revenue. New York's got tons of issues. If you don't think New York's got tons of issues, look at their infrastructure, drive on a road to New York city. Uh, this is the senator from New York. They have to uphold states' rights, even if in the, even in the two to five year time frame, because he wants the cultivators in his state. You're not nobody's going to cultivate in New York if you can go cross border. They're going to all cultivate in California. Why? The climate's so much better. They want the testing to come. They want the regulation. They want the dispensary. But they have it in their budget that they're going to get all the tax revenue. So I think I don't know what tree he's barking up or what. He's obviously not representing the people in New York. I don't know who he's trying to represent by this bill. What we should do, what they should do for for the good for the good people in the state of New York and many other states is they should control their own destiny. They should have states' rights. They should legalize states' rights ultimately. And I, but I agree with Paul. Nothing's unfortunately going to happen this year. I think Safe Act will compress yields a little bit for us. And I say that it will also help our borrowing costs. But these poor cannabis providers are paying ridiculous amounts of money to deposit their money. There's not there's too much cash. We need Visa and Mastercard to increase demand for our customers. Mm -hmm. So I'm all for the States Act passing and I hope it does. Yeah, I, I, so without repeating all of that, because I agree with all of it, um, I'm a little bit of a cynic when it comes to Washington acting quickly on just about anything. And so I'll take the over on federal legislation any day of the week and twice on Sunday. Um, I, I would focus on two points. One, for the safe banking, when it does pass, if it does, when it does pass, I think it's a good thing. I think it's a great thing for the industry. I think it creates increase in sales because they can accept credit cards. I think it improves margin. So it makes all of our clients, makes the MSOs better credit, more profitable. And that's just good for all of us here on the panel. Um, I think, though, in the safe banking, though, what people don't necessarily focus on is that there is a rulemaking period that the bill provides. It's a six-month rulemaking period for federal uh, regulators. Listen, I, and I've been around banking for 30 years. There are very few times I've seen federal regulators do anything together in a six month period. In fact, we're still seeing some regulations come out from Dodd Frank from federal regulators. So again, there I would take the over. And again, having been in banks for a big part of my career, banks won't move until the rules are set. 
And so just because safe banking passes doesn't mean there will be this onslaught of banks that will suddenly show up. And by the way, when they do ultimately show up, they like to do business with companies that have a demonstrated track record of earnings and profitability and cash flow. Um, and not all banks will be comfortable lending to cannabis just the way not all banks are comfortable with spirits or tobacco, right? So that's yet another issue. Um, so I agree. I think there's a really long runway. And then the last thing I'd add to this is there was a bipartisan cannabis legislation a few weeks ago to provide more funding for research. And I think what you'll find is I wouldn't be surprised later this year and into next year to hear senators um, saying, I just approved research funding. So let's give that time. And I think that support buys politicians the air cover to push this off, to wait for the research to actually bear some fruit. And then I guess I said one more, but my last thought is, you know, for the operators, it's a little bit of be careful of what you wish for, because immediately when this goes federally legal, um, the FDA, in my opinion, will become very involved in the business. And I think that the high regulation that the FDA brings in is going to be a bit of a wet blanket for a period of time on the industry because it will limit innovation and I think it will limit form factors. Um, but it's a big unknown out there. If, if I could just add one little spin last to this is that the, the political um, winds that are behind this is on decriminalization, not legalization. And those are two terms that are conflated into our industry. Decriminalization is for individuals, legalization is for companies. And the any bill forward right now, the political support is on the decriminalization. And that is not going to help this industry where we want to go. And so we just need targeted bills. I'd like to see what Len mentioned. I'd like to see the credit cards be able to use so we could get off cash basis in the dispensaries. And I'd also like to see 280E. Uh, if you could just make that go with the state's uh, law, the state's uh, rules up right there, those are two really easy targeted things that we could significantly enhance the uh, all, all everybody across the board. And we don't try to do this broad bill. Each time Congress tries to get involved, they keep adding more and more stuff and you lose more and more support. So I don't see getting 10 uh, senators get past this, the filibuster in the Senate. Thank you. That was all really good input. I've been listening to tracks in the conference all day today and um, really uh, thought that the whole uh, concept of medical research sort of was in the background when and I think in many ways it should be more in, in the foreground. Um, I'd like you to talk about um, the risks um, that you see as being the most um, prevalent in the industry um, or, or is it or as it relates to your business, most people, when they start talking about risk, start talking about state regulations. Um, who wants to start there? Um, I'll, I'll, go ahead. I'll jump, I'll jump in. Um, you know, when I think about risk for our business, uh, there's a credit element to a big, very big credit element to our business. And so we're always focused on the credit risk. And so when we think about risks, we think about what could possibly impair our tenants from being able to pay their rent and continue to earn the margins that they've had. Um, so when I think about that, uh, I actually worry a little bit about the consolidation. I think consolidation is healthy and it's good, but integrating companies is, is an art. And, and it takes a lot of really hard work in order to make the integration work. And so we very much are watching a lot of the M&A that's happening and um, focusing on our people executing well. Uh, are they taking their eye off the ball? Are margins starting to slip? Are they going to be able to maintain the types of margin growth that they've had and the types of margins they enjoy today? Or will they become unfocused and maybe not even achieve some of the, uh, some of the goals of that integration? And then it's the additional scale up. I think that uh, the industry went through a period of hyper growth back in 18 and 19. And I think that uh, during 2020, to some extent, the industry had to catch up to itself from an earnings and cash flow perspective um, because of the, over, I don't want to say overbuilding, but the aggressive build out of the platforms. And so we want to make sure as we're seeing states come online, such as a New York and a New Jersey and does Connecticut, maybe Pennsylvania, what happens in Ohio, Virginia, New Mexico, all of these states that are coming on um, are people managing that growth and that grab for growth um, in a responsible way. I'm not saying that we're, that we think there's an issue out there, but to me, that'll be something we're keeping a close eye on. Yeah, you know, I, I, I would agree like any other landlord, you know, your biggest concern is tenants not paying the rent. 
And, you know, I think we've been really fortunate uh, thus far. We've only had one incident where an operator uh, went into receivership. And very quickly, once the receivership was resolved, we were able to retenant that facility in Los Angeles. And that's something very unique, I think, about this industry that uh, people, I think, like to understand is that we think there's such a demand for these licenses, especially in limited licenses states where we're, most of our assets are, that if there is a vacancy uh, in, a, in an asset, the demand for that license, therefore the demand for the real estate is so great that uh, we think we're going to put another tenant in there real quick. And I'm, I'm sure that's uh, how the rest of the rest of the folks feel too. It's uh, it's a good position to be in. Yeah, from a from a company perspective, it's really interesting, and we're secured by the the, the cash flows first, as I said, the licenses second, and the real estate third. I think even though we're a mortgage REIT, uh, and we get we get the first liens on the company and the real estate. But the, when you really think about it, it's about the cash flows, whether the fixed charge coverage ratios, the net debt to EBITDA, or or the net free cash flow covenants that we have. Those are your governors. But the amazing thing I find about the loans that we make, and we have a great we have a great cultivator in Pennsylvania, the license is worth more than our loan. Just the license, just the bare license, not the 250,000 square foot grow facility that we supported. Uh, the C1 facility in, in, in Ohio, I buy that C1 license tomorrow for $20 million, and that's greater than the value of my loan. The Florida license that we backed that got bought by Cresco, again, $40 million license, and we had $12 million outstanding. So, it, 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 the license value in the limited license states is, is so great, it's often in excess of our loan amount. And of course, we're secured by the cash flows and the real estate as well as gravy. But we really pay attention to the state by state dynamics, what licenses trade for, whether they're transferable and how to secure them. Um, Merrill, for us, the, 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 the concern for us is this is still an emerging market to us and values can be quickly uh, inflated as people emerge into a new state that just became available. And so as, as, as markets stabilize over time um, and the, the rates, sales comp uh, rates uh, start to stabilize and compress, we're concerned about the market moving along. Um, and so we're, we're only originating transactions for 18 months. We don't feel comfortable getting much farther out than that um, to make sure that as new uh, cities next to our city might come out with a better tax rate that might compress it over time. We just don't think that could happen with the comment period that would be required for that and then designing the, the zone and, and the entitlements and the build outs within our 18 month period term. The other thing that we concern just as well that's a broader perspective is if it was federally legalized, the interstate commerce clause and how that might affect us um, in, in bringing in uh, lower cost uh, CapEx and OpEx operators into higher cost states. And I actually brought that to one of our larger operators um, and they said that we actually welcome it because 80% of the cannabis of the higher grade is made in California and it always has been and it will go across the rest of, this, of, this, of the country. And if we can operate and success in California, we can crush anybody. I'm like, oh, that's totally opposite of what I thought, but uh, that was an interesting take. So those are some of the things that, that we are concerned about and how we're offsetting for the risk. But um, I think that we've all got ways of de-risking and mitigating that risk in these emerging markets. Yes, um, I would agree with that. It's a, um, it's a very young industry, but it's, it, it's, it's very dynamic. Um, it's certainly attracting a lot of equity capital and that's your backstop at the end of the day when you're a lender. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Merrill, that was fantastic. Gentlemen, <laughs> Merrill, fantastic panel. Uh, I'm honestly sad to cut the discussion off, <laughs> to be quite frank with you. Uh, but we've learned a lot. You have uh, a huge conversation going in the chat about what you're talking about. Uh, so... Uh, thank you all very much for starting that conversation here uh, on our stream. Uh, and I will say, Meryl, you were correct. It was California. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's awesome. awesome. Thank you all so much. Thanks, really appreciate you all being here. We will thank see you all soon. Thank you, Meryl. Tannenbaum, <laughs> AFD Gamma, Paul Smithers, IIPR, Rob Seacrest, Polaris, and Anthony Coniglio. I hope I said that right. You got it. Capital. <laughs> mm. All right, y'all. We'll see you Thanks, soon. Thanks. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank Thank you, Meryl. Fantastic. All right, y'all. That is it. As I throw my microphone off my table, apparently I am done with this. <laughs> that was... <laughs>
<laughs> I'm never going to live that one down either for my team. Uh, I hope you all can still hear me. Thank you again. We do have a winner from Benzinga Pro. Lifetime subscription giveaway for the day. Pulling it up now. It is Corey. Corey. I'm sorry. Chris Berry. Chris Berry. You are the winner of our lifetime subscription Benzinga Pro giveaway. Email events at Benzinga.com if you want any of these prizes today. We are giving them all away again tomorrow. Please come back. Participate in our Slido polls. If you participate, you are submitted to win these prizes. Uh, it's a ton of great information. I'm biased as heck being an employee for Benzinga, uh, but I use Benzinga tools daily. My portfolio has grown uh, massively because of it. Uh, so uh, I am, a, t I am a, a test case for you there. Uh, I do want to thank the uh, Benzinga team, Nicole, producer Aaron. If you watch shows daily, you know producer Aaron. Uh, Nicole is our fearless leader. Sarah backstage as well. Everybody on track one, all of our uh, partnerships and sales teams here at Benzinga. Uh, everybody put a lot of work into this event, and we're only halfway through. Uh, we will be back tomorrow with Kim Rivers, 9 a.m. sharp from True Leave. Uh, we are halfway through. I'm so excited. We do have one more video. If you are an operator uh, in the space, a service provider to the space, ancillary to the space, or an investor in any of those companies, uh, we have an upcoming video that I think you will enjoy uh, and another activation from Benzinga to help the cannabis industry move forward uh, and create better networking. So with that, y'all, I'm going to sign off. That's it for me today. Happy Thursday. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow for Friday uh, with a ton more content, just like you saw today. Uh, thank you, everybody. Sarah Ewalt, uh, <laughs> Donkey Salty Dabs, everybody in our Connects platform. Uh, my name is Elliot Lane. You can follow me on Twitter. You can reach out to me via email, Elliot Lane at Benzinga.com. Love hearing feedback. Love hearing from you all. Thanks again. Aaron, play us off, my friend. Are you wasting time and money looking for great partners in the cannabis industry? In our experience, almost all dispensary and grow business owners are wasting money because they can't find cannabis-ready service providers. All of these problems, unique to the cannabis industry and its providers, are a thing of the past with the Benzinga Cannabis Alliance a national alliance of cannabis business owners and service providers. The Benzinga Cannabis Alliance has everything you need as a business owner. Stop paying high prices for the products and services you need with our savings program and find cannabis business-ready partners in payment processing, commercial insurance, business lending, HVAC, compliance software and services, and more. Whether you're a national brand or a Main Street dispensary, an enormous grow farm, or a mom-and-pop business, call 877-440-9464 or visit BenzingaCannabis.com today. We can't wait for you to join.